Part One of Travels in Lancashire. The Romans in Lancashire by Francis A. Bruton, from Memorials of Old Lancashire, edited by Henry Fishwick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romans in Lancashire by F. A. Bruton, M. A. Footnote. I wish to take this opportunity of expressing my thanks to Dr. Haverfield, Professor of Ancient History in the University of Oxford, who has kindly read this article in proof, and made some suggestions which I have gladly adopted. F. A. B. End of footnote. When we study the Roman remains discovered in any one county, we are dealing with a division of land which, for our purpose, is accidental and arbitrary. We do so not because it is scientific, but because it is convenient. To this rule laid down by Dr. Haverfield, Lancashire forms no exception, and yet perhaps owing to its geographical position and features, Lancashire, so far as the Roman occupation is concerned, may lend itself a little more readily to separate treatment than some other counties. If we include for the moment part of the plain of Cheshire, we have an area the southern boundary of which may coincide approximately with the limits of the Roman conquest before the advance northward which took place in the seventh and eighth decades of the first century of our era. Chester was, of course, occupied about A.D. 50, while to the southwest the same boundary faced at no great distance the turbulent tribes of North Wales. The long strip of low-lying land which covers a great part of southern and western Lancashire access to which from the south is obtained through the wide gap which occurs between the high grounds of the Pennines and the hills of North Wales, affords an opportunity for an easier line of approach to the north on the west than could be obtained by crossing the highlands of Yorkshire, an opportunity which was not lost sight of by the Romans, and has been utilised in later times by those who constructed some of the main lines of railway in this direction. East of this great coast plain, mostly of the Triassic formation, so deeply indented by estuaries that one is reminded of the words of Tacitus, the sea does not merely flow and ebb within the limits of the shore, but penetrates and winds far inland. The high grounds of the Pennines rise abruptly, and these uplands are pushed into the county, as it were, in two well-defined masses. First the hills that lie between the Roch and the Ribble, exposing the coal measures and secondly the more isolated mass enclosed between the middle reach of the ribble and the lower waters of the loon the limestone hills of the forest of boland these high grounds against which the winds from the atlantic discharge so much of their moisture are drained by three rivers whose main streams run in almost parallel lines in a south-westerly direction and whose wide mouths we may yet learn are referred to by tacitus where he tells us that Agricola would himself explore the estuaries and forests. On each of the three rivers referred to, the Romans established a fort. It is necessary to bear in mind also that the physical aspect of the district was widely different then from what it is now. Of no part of Britain can the graphic touches of Tacitus, and words of the same tenor by modern writers, be more true than of the district we are now considering. Quote, it was a land of uncleared forests, with a climate as yet not mitigated by the organised labours of mankind. The fallen timber obstructed the streams, the rivers were squandered in the reedy morasses, and only the downs and the hilltops rose above the perpetual tracts of wood. End quote. Quote, the bottoms of the valleys were for the most part marshes, and the low-lying region of the Lancashire and Cheshire Plain was covered with forest and marshes so impenetrable that even as late as the Bronze Age it was rarely traversed. This, continues Professor Boyd Dawkins, from whom this second quotation is borrowed, is proved by the rarity of the remains of this age in the Lancashire and Cheshire Plain, as well as in the great low-lying tracts of clayland on the east of the Pennines. Quote, the work of reclaiming the wilderness began in the days of Agricola, the Romans felled the woods along the line of their military roads. They embanked the rivers and threw causeways across the morasses. End quote. 
and in one of his most graphic passages tacitus represents the complaint of the natives that quote, their very bodies and hands were worn out in draining the fens and extending the clearings in the forests end quote. reference has already been made to the fact that the low ground of lancashire was utilised by the romans as a route to the north without even touching upon the vexed question of the exact lie of the roman roads and itineraries in the district it is interesting to notice how in lancashire as in other parts of the country the directions of the railway trunk lines of the present day follow to a certain extent the lines of the main roman routes just as a number of roman highways radiated from london in directions not far removed from the lines of the great railway systems of to-day so there is fair evidence that three roman roads crossed lancashire along lines approximately followed since by railway engineers one coming from chester through manchester for york another taking its line from manchester through blackburn and sweeping round the forest of bowland to kirby lonsdale and a third passing through warrington wigan and lancaster to the same point where there was direct communication with carlisle in the same way some of the principal roman stations coincide with what have since become great centres of population such are manchester wigan and lancaster while just outside the southern border the romans certainly had a settlement of some kind at warrington there are two exceptions the little country town of ribchester some five miles northwest of blackburn occupies the site of what was one of the largest roman forts in england which has yielded one of the most interesting relics of the roman occupation found in the country again on the northern border of the county the little village of overborough near kirby lonsdale marks the position of what was evidently a roman station of some importance if we add to these five a possible station of minor importance on the banks of the ribble at waltonley dale we have named all the roman sites at present known within the limits of the county and the mere enumeration of these is sufficient to show that the district could possess at that time no individual importance with the coincidence of position of roman sites with modern settlements however the resemblance ceases there could be no stronger contrast than that between the lancashire of to-day and the district as it was in the first four centuries of our era what is now the busy and populous centre of a great industry was then a quite unimportant fragment of one of the outlying provinces of the empire interesting only perhaps as affording a route to the north and by its more or less indented coastline offering a means of communication by sea it did not even perhaps yield the mineral products which led the romans to set value upon particular districts of the country to increase the contrast the roman occupation of the district was essentially military roman britain as has been pointed out quote, fell practically though not officially into two well-marked divisions which coincide roughly with the lowlands which were won in the first years of the conquest and the hills which were conquered later end quote. the southern counties and the midlands were overcome in a few years and with a few definite exceptions there probably was not a fort or fortress throughout the south of our island after the first century the land north of a line drawn from york through derby to chester though nominally conquered by a d eighty was not subdued in fact till later and even when the subjugation was complete the principal elements of the occupation partook of a military character hence all the roman stations in lancashire fall into the class of forts and such settlements as sprung up in the immediate vicinity of forts practically all the inscriptions found point to a military occupation pure and simple the reason is not far to seek lancashire as already mentioned was crossed by one of the main routes to the north in common with yorkshire it was peopled by a tribe described by tacitus as perhaps the most populous in the province but which was one of the latest to be subdued and gave more trouble to its conquerors perhaps than any other the uplands which hemmed in lancashire on the north and east were the home of the brigantes they occupied indeed the whole of what is now yorkshire and lancashire as well as the counties immediately to the north of them 
it was only after much fighting that this fierce tribe was first though not finally subdued by cerealis the only information we possess on the subject consists of a few meagre allusions in the agricola of tacitus and we are so far equally ignorant of the particular lines along which agricola himself made his advance northwards later this uncertainty is one of the things that gives interest to work on the roman occupation of lancashire was lancashire a base for the operations of cerealis did agricola move northwards by this route these are questions which only the results of excavations can answer and the answers may yet be forthcoming but the subjugation was by no means final and the fact that the brigantes revolted in the reign of pius and that the derbyshire forts were necessary in the early part of the third century shows that even so late as this the occupation of lancashire must have been other than civil the story of the roman occupation of the district is still wrapped in doubts we cannot with certainty write even the roman name of more than one or two of the five or six stations located we cannot say when or by whom one of these was founded apparently only of a few are there still left any substantial remains and these are difficult to examine scattered up and down the county in local museums are a few scanty relics of the occupation and these are likely to be increased to a certain extent as the result of excavations which may yet have something more definite to tell us when the question is asked what can we say about roman lancashire beyond what was said more than twenty years ago by thompson watkin the answer is that one excavations carried out during the last ten years on roman sites in the county have thrown some definite light upon the subject two excavations conducted on similar sites in other parts of britain and on the continent enable us to deduce much by analogy where direct evidence is wanting and three in dealing with the problem watkin perhaps lost sight of the distinction between civil and military occupation footnote if this remark appears to be a criticism of watkin's work i should like to say that no one recognizes more fully than i do the debt which all students of the roman occupation of lancashire owe to the labours of that painstaking and indefatigable antiquary End footnote. the occupation as has already been said was military all the roman stations in lancashire of which we have any knowledge were forts such forts as the romans built not to form the headquarters of a legion but to guard roads and frontiers and hold in check the turbulent tribes of the hill country this being so a proper understanding of the scanty roman remains found in the county will be facilitated if we turn aside for a moment to consider briefly what modern research has to tell us of the construction of these forts and the life of the roman soldiers who garrisoned them we may then review in detail as far as space allows the traces the romans have actually left within the limits of our county the castellum or small fort of the romans was constructed on certain main principles which the excavation of something like a hundred examples in britain and elsewhere has shown to be fairly uniform in fact nothing strikes the excavator of the present day more than the uniformity in general plan and the similarity in the objects found at one fort after another the size of these forts varied and specific reasons can be assigned for the variation from two to three up to six to eight and in one exceptional case in northern britain fifteen acres in plan they invariably show in their outline an oblong or a square with the corners rounded off entered by at least four gates symmetrically placed the construction of the rampart differs in different periods earlier forts apparently showing defences of earth later ones of stone fortunately the complete excavation of two of these forts in britain enables us to speak with some certainty as to the general principles on which the interior was laid out a broad street connecting two of the gates was generally flanked on one side by official buildings such as a headquarters building in the centre a commandant's residence granaries and other offices while the space on the other side of the principal street 
was occupied mainly by long blocks of what were clearly the barracks of the soldiers. By the courtesy of Professor Bosenket of the University of Liverpool, we are able to show the most complete plan yet obtained of one of these forts. It is the plan of the Roman fort of Borcovicium, on the wall of Hadrian in Northumberland, which was excavated by Professor Bosenket in 1898. It is specially suited to our purpose, as in size and other features, it bears some resemblance to several forts in Lancashire, whose remains are more slight, and already in these Lancashire forts some details have been made out as to the headquarters buildings, the buttress structures generally distinguished as storehouses, and the long barrack-like buildings which occupy other and less central positions in the fort. Before we refer to these, it will be interesting to ask how far modern research has enabled us to reconstruct the life of the Roman soldier in these forts. The rapidly accumulating collections of relics unearthed from similar sites in this country and abroad are yearly adding to our knowledge in this respect. Notably the excavation of forts like those at the Saalberg and Funtz in Germany and at Newstead near Melrose in our own island have thrown a flood of light on this question. As the relics of the Roman occupation of Lancashire come gradually to light, it is nearly always possible to find parallels to them among the collections taken from forts more fully excavated. There is an almost total absence of those things that make for luxury and comfort, and which are found in the towns and villas scattered over the southern part of Britain. Mosaic pavements, for example, are quite unknown. On the other hand, excavation is gradually bringing to light nearly everything which pertains to garrison life leather clothing studded with metal metal armour helmets swords spears and shields are represented practically complete sets of tools for husbandry and various handicrafts scythes rakes hoes sickles carpenters and smiths tools all these are turned up in good preservation as are also such things as locks and keys lamps bells amulets and articles of personal ornament. The wheels and linchpins of carts or chariots, occasionally quite perfect. The bridle bits and harness trappings of the horses are also in evidence, and with a striking uniformity, if allowance is made for different periods, the familiar appliances for the cooking and preparation of food. As the better classes of ware varied at different periods, the best pottery, especially as it is generally well preserved, forms a convenient criterion for dating the occupation of a site. At several of the Lancashire sites, for example, some fragments are found which may indicate an occupation as early as the first century. It would be easy to extend this list, but enough has been said to show how far it is possible now to complete the picture of the life of these forts. If details are missing at one fort, they can be supplied from another, Thus, if we find, as we do, deep wells at Ribchester, at other sites the wooden buckets and other appliances have come to light, so that we can complete the picture. To take another example, certain bronze ornaments dug up in the Manchester fort were not properly understood till similar ones were found in Germany, with leather straps in position passing through them, leaving little doubt that in both cases they form part of the harness trappings of the horses. Nor are even social and religious elements wanting in the records which time has left us of the life of the Roman soldiers that garrisoned the forts in Lancashire. The dedications still legible upon stone altars, the inscriptions, sometimes of quite a pathetic nature, found on tombstones, relics that tell of the worship of Mithras, a religious cult that actually stood as a rival to Christianity in those times, statuettes that may have been household gods, beads and amulets. All these help us as we try to conjure up a picture of the life of the men who, under the stereotype discipline of the Roman army, held the forts in Lancashire in the first few centuries of our era against a native tribe whose valour was noticed by more than one of the Roman poets. With these preliminary considerations before us, we may now proceed to examine more in detail what is still preserved to us of the Roman occupation of Lancashire. In doing so we have to deal, as has been said, with five stations, 
viz those at manchester wigan ribchester lancaster and overborough to name them in their geographical sequence and it will be as convenient to take them in that order as in any other the roman names of these stations are at present more or less a matter of conjecture in the second or perhaps the early part of the third century of our era an imperial road book was compiled giving details of a number of routes in the form of a list of the stations that lay upon them two of these routes crossed lancashire one the second running from the extreme north of england to richborough in kent and passing between york and chester a station marked as mamusium which it is generally assumed stands for the roman fort at manchester another the tenth concerning which we can only say with any certainty that it passed southwards through lancashire has these stations upon it and in this order Gallacum, Remetenacum, Cochium, Mancunium, and the general opinion is that these may correspond to the stations in Lancashire already referred to, as situated at Overborough, Ribchester, Wigan, and Manchester, respectively. The only names of which we are certain, however, are the Bremetenacum for Ribchester, and something like Mamusium or Mancunium for Manchester for the latter name varies so much in the different copies of the itinerary that only the finding of an actual inscription can set the matter at rest with this station we may reasonably commence our detailed examination of the roman remains in the county Quote, not very much can be said to be known of roman manchester and perhaps there is not much more to find the very greatness of the modern city has stamped out the vestiges of its birth and childhood End quote we cannot yet write the roman name of the fort which a cohort of frisians built near the junction of the little river medlock with the river irwell which now takes its tortuous way through the heart of the modern city but just where the railways of manchester are most tangled it is possible to trace with a degree of accuracy which will satisfy even the archaeologist the outlines of the stronghold and under one of the railway arches the arch numbered ninety five of the manchester south junction and altrincham railway there still stands visible above the ground a strip of the stone rampart that surrounded the fort the existing fragment being part of the eastern wall the trenches cut for a railway viaduct in eighteen ninety eight brought to light portions of the northern wall and excavations made in nineteen o seven with the express purpose of locating the western boundary of the fort were rewarded by the finding of about forty feet of the wall on that side a record as late as eighteen fifty fixes the position of the rampart on the south so that it is now possible to complete the outline and to say that the fort at manchester stood on a rising ground near the confluence of the two streams just mentioned and that it covered an area of almost exactly five acres it was thus one of the larger of the early forts in britain it was surrounded by a solid stone rampart of which the fragment that remains still stands seven feet high above its foundations and is seven feet thick this is not the kind of rampart that would probably be built earlier than the second century and we may perhaps say with some degree of certainty that the fort of which remains still exist was not built before that period the existence of a foss outside the rampart has not been detected and we cannot fix the position of any one of the gateways for those who would like to trace the outlines of the roman fort among the streets and yards of the modern city the following itinerary may be recommended turn along castle street which opens out of deansgate immediately opposite knock mill station and follow its windings till it crosses the rochdale canal and leads into the open space still known and marked as castlefield if the pedestrian will cross this space and halt for a moment at the junction of the railway arches numbered seven and eight he will probably be standing on the site of the southwestern corner of the fort though much lower than the original level the southern wall part of which was visible in eighteen fifty ran from this point in a line crossing the canal some forty or fifty feet beyond the little lock and by crossing the bridge again and following the towpath for a little distance it must be possible to approach very near to the position of the southern gate 
this is perhaps the best spot from which to obtain a general idea of the lie of the roman station the rochdale canal here cuts right through the rock on which the fort was built exposing one of the finest sections of new red sandstone to be seen in manchester on the opposite side of the canal to the right just where the arch of the iron bridge which spans the river commences nothing but a brick wall prevents us from seeing a strip nearly twenty feet long of the actual rampart built by men of the same cohort as those who constructed the walls of the roman fort at melandra standing here on the towpath therefore and looking in a north-easterly direction we may imagine ourselves at the southern gate surveying the area of the fort the northern wall of the castellum is best approached by turning out of deansgate along bridgewater street and passing down collier street to the point where it is crossed by the cheshire lanes viaduct if we stand just opposite the coal shed on our right outside the gates of the timber yard we shall be immediately over the foundations of the northern rampart which was actually seen here in nineteen o seven when the viaduct was in course of construction several pieces of this northern wall were visible as late as eighteen fifty the line of it may be followed in imagination as far as duke's place where it is lost in the warehouse of messrs cookson the southern part of which there is reason to suppose was built off the roman wall in the big yard to the south of duke place now in the occupation of messrs beatty and co a strip of the western rampart was exposed in nineteen o seven and in this yard at the same time an attempt was made to trace the line of the buildings of the north-western centre of the fort the attempt was only partially successful owing perhaps to the perishable nature of the local sandstone but the fact was demonstrated that the lie of the streets of the fort here was parallel to the direction of duke street the careful excavation of the area for several months however unearthed a number of interesting relics of the occupation including objects of stone metal and glass and a great variety of pottery a beautiful silver signet ring a drawing of which is given and which is dated by mr r a smith of the british museum as about three hundred a d a number of brooches and other ornaments of bronze all dating probably from the second or third century and an ad's head of iron in perfect preservation were among the interesting finds the pottery proved to be attributable to the second or third century but the coins of which nearly a score were found ranged from the first to early in the fourth century the foundations of the western rampart were examined in most minute detail the wall was built upon a compact bed of small boulders laid in clean clay and resting upon a substratum of the same material a few of the dressed stones were found lying outside the foundations but the rest had long ago been removed this small area in the north-western corner is the only portion of the roman fort at manchester that has been systematically excavated of the remainder of the interior we know practically nothing nine lines of railway carried on two stone viaducts and one waterway at present run diagonally right across the area of the fort that has given its name to the city a great part of this area is now occupied by the timber yard of messrs southern and nephew whose lurries are perhaps loaded on the very spot once sacred to the worship of the emperor and the other rites which were ordinarily performed in the headquarters building of a roman garrison part of this area was cut away to a great depth nearly a century ago probably in excavating for gravel in the course of these and other excavations a number of relics came to light which have since been preserved at the lancashire residence of the earl of ellesmere while others are more widely scattered of many of these we have only the record for the objects themselves are lost unfortunately the epigraphical evidence tells us very little from centurial stones we learn that part at any rate of the stone rampart was constructed by the first cohort of frisian infantry the same cohort assisted in the construction of the fort at melandra some twelve miles distant for the rest an altar dedicated to fortune the preserver by an officer of the sixth legion which had its quarters at york probably commemorates some important event as does also a second altar set up by an officer of the vexillatio 
of Raiti and Norisi. But what these events were we shall probably never know. Tile stamps reading C, I, 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 B, R cannot even be interpreted with certainty. The smaller finds, however, show great variety and are easily paralleled by similar objects found on other Roman sites in Britain and abroad. They comprise a collection of pottery, including several complete vessels, a number of brooches and cloak fasteners, ranging in date from the 2nd to the 4th century, other objects of bronze, one brooch enamelled in colours, a phalera or soldier's breast ornament, portions of locks and keys, a bronze flagon, an iron axe head, the blue glass beads so common on Roman sites, a bust made of lead, and a bulla of gold. One of the most perfect of the relics is a little statuette of Jupiter. One tile stamp of the 20th legion finds a place in the collection. A great quantity of Roman pottery has been found outside the area of the Roman fort, notably on the site of the new police station in Bridgewater Street and at Knott Mill Station. The collection has been made by carefully watching the excavations made for building during the last twelve years, a piece of work voluntarily undertaken by Mr. Charles Roeder, whose name will always be connected with the history of Roman Manchester. A very large hoard of coins also came to light at Knott Mill. The occurrence of these remains outside the fort points to the existence of a settlement such as often sprung up round a military post in Roman times. A great number of Roman coins have been found in Manchester, covering nearly the whole period of the Roman occupation of our island. There is a gap in the frequency of coins between 180 and 260 AD, as on some other Romano-British sites. And the number of coins of the Constantine epoch, the first half of the 4th century, is very large. It must be remembered, of course, that these coins have come to light, not as the result of systematic work upon the site, but from chance excavations made mainly for building purposes. This is, in outline, the extent of the information we possess about the Roman occupation of Manchester, and we must wait for further details, which the removal of old buildings may yet bring to light in abundance. Here, at the junction of two streams, stood a fort of some strength and importance, garrisoned, we may assume, by about a thousand men, and marking the point where two great Roman highways crossed one another. The road that joined the great legionary fortresses at Chester and York, and the road coming south from Carlisle by way of Lancaster, Ribchester and Wigan. If we now move one stage northwards on this latter road, we shall find the traces of the Roman occupation much more slight. Practically all we can say at present about the Roman station which it is generally assumed occupied part of the site of the present town of Wigan, is that it may have been the cochium of the Antonine itinerary, but the details of the station have yet to be made out. A few coins, including a gold coin of Vitellius, the cornice of a Roman altar, and a small collection of pottery, comprise practically all the relics of which we have any record. Far different is the case with the next station that claims our attention, not only are the Roman remains already found at Ribchester of the first importance, but there is little room for doubt that the place may yet yield much that is of value for students of the period, though the fact that a large part of the fort lies under the churchyard sets a limit to the possibilities of excavation on the site. We are here dealing with a fort which, as has already been said, may have been one of the largest in England, covering approximately six acres. But the contrast between the present condition of the place and that of the two sites we have just been considering is striking. Leaving behind us the busy town of Blackburn and pushing a few miles farther in a northwesterly direction, we presently drop into the broad green valley of the Ribble, whose waters under ordinary circumstances hardly suggest the force which it occasionally gathers in times of heavy rain. This stream has eaten away or buried beneath itself a large portion of the site once occupied by the Romans. What still remains lies in great part under the old church and the churchyard that surrounds it, but much has been done in recent years to bring to light those portions which are not out of reach, and much may yet be done. The Roman fort at Ribchester, 
which may have covered as much as five and a half or six acres, and was surrounded by a stone rampart and a fosse, lay in a bend of the Ribble, some ten miles above the point where that river opens out into an estuary. The buildings were of worked stone, and the architectural fragments that have so far come to light are rather striking. Of these structures, there have been traced part of the headquarters building, and a portion of the buttressed building, which is generally assumed to have been the granary. In this building was found a great quantity of charred corn, and the discovery recently of the remains of the supports of the raised floor, common in such structures, only confirms the conjecture that we have here one of the storehouses for grain, which reminds us of the graphic details given by Tacitus as to the tribute levied from the native population by their conquerors. In the Agricola, he speaks of the Britons as being, quote, compelled to endure the farce of waiting by the closed granary, and of purchasing corn unnecessarily, and raising it to a fictitious price, End quote. The meaning apparently being that if they had no corn, they had first to buy the corn at an exorbitant price, and then pay it as tribute, the corn never leaving the granary at all. Agricola not only removed this abuse, but also put a stop to the practice of compelling those Britons, who had a winter camp close to them, to carry their tribute by, quote, difficult by-roads, to remote and inaccessible parts of the country. The object of this practice being apparently to compel the Britons to pay a heavy money tribute in lieu of corn. As we pass through the little town of Ribchester today, we see in front of one of the inns, and forming part of its porch, four Roman Doric columns, which are said to have been found in the riverbed opposite the church. Winding round to the rectory, we find there, and in the grounds of an adjacent residence and in the churchyard, the bases of a number of much larger columns. Quite recently, portions of columns were raised from one of the Roman wells, no less than three of which have been found upon the site in the course of a single year. And with the columns were two very large capitals, whose dimensions alone say much for the massiveness of the edifice they adorned, whatever that may have been. The remains of nearly twenty columns have now been recovered. Some of the bases are in situ at the headquarters building. The inscriptions and relics which the site has yielded are of equal interest. Two wall stones record the share borne by the 20th legion, and by a century of the 10th cohort, presumably of that legion, respectively in the construction of the fort. There are records of no less than nine altars, one of which, now preserved with the other Ribchester relics in the library of St. John's College, Cambridge, tells us that a troop of Sarmatian cavalry was stationed at Ribchester. The date of this may be the first half of the third century. The inscriptions on two tombstones give similar evidence. Another altar was set up by an officer of a wing of Astorian cavalry. Three of the altars are dedicated to Mars. One other inscription must be mentioned, though we have no further evidence as to the subject of it. It records the restoration of a ruined temple in the third century of our era. Of great interest are the monumental stones. These were found at a spot about a quarter of a mile from Ribchester, along the river bank. The finest is preserved in a case in the Blackburn Museum and a woodcut of it is here reproduced. It is said to be the second of the same pattern found at Ribchester. Similar monumental stones have been found on several other Roman sites in Britain. The work is rude, but there is life in the figures. A horseman is represented, riding over a prostrate foe, into whom he strikes his spear. The dress of the rider as well as the bridle and trappings of the horse are shown in some detail. The horseman carries a shield on his left arm, and wears a short sword at his side. The prostrate figure holds an oval shield. The inscription on another tombstone gives us an interesting glimpse into the family life of the Roman cavalry officer stationed at Ribchester. In this earth, runs the inscription, is held the last of Aelia Matrona. She lived twenty-eight years, two months, and eight days. And Marcus Julius Maximus, her son, he lived six years, three months, and twenty days, and Campania Dubitata, her mother, she lived fifty years. Julius Maximus, 
a singularis consularis of the wing of sarmatian cavalry the husband placed this monument to an incomparable wife to a son most dutiful to his father and to a mother-in-law very dear the real treasures yielded by the ribchester site however are among the smaller relics in eighteen eighty four there was found outside the north gateway of the fort a gold brooch in perfect preservation it weighs three hundred and seventy three grains is harp shaped and measures two inches by one across the bow the loop at the end an illustration is given is for a clasp which was attached to a fibula of the same kind after old celtic usage the loop and collar are a purely british development this fibula it is conjectured by mr a j evans belongs to the later age of the antonines that is to the second half of the second century a d it is now preserved in the blackburn museum where permission to see it may be obtained from the curator in seventeen ninety six a bronze helmet was found in the river bank opposite the rectory gates nine feet below the surface by a boy at play this helmet which has for many years occupied a case of its own in the central saloon of the british museum is one of the most beautiful relics of the roman occupation ever found in britain it consists of a mask and visor which fit together exactly and were fastened by rings and studs some of which remain above the locks of hair which fringe the temples rises a diadem representing a bastioned wall surmounted by figures the skull part of the helmet is decorated with six mounted soldiers and eleven on foot all armed and in fighting attitudes these decorated visor helmets are rare a few have been found on the continent and two or three have turned up recently at newstead near melrose we have no precise knowledge as to their use but from a passage in arian it is conjectured that they were worn at the military exercises of the cavalry the roman coins found at ribchester number nearly two hundred there are five of gold and about a dozen of silver they range from fifty to three hundred and eighty a d the greater number occurring between fifty and one hundred and fifty and between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty we have no authentic information as to the time at which the fort was erected though some of the pottery recently found is classed as first century nor can we date the period at which it was abandoned the coins indicate that this could not well have been earlier than towards the end of the fourth century it is generally agreed that there is good evidence that the place was destroyed by fire the ruins are mingled with soot and charcoal and the granary shows traces of severe burning ribchester is the only roman station in lancashire the ancient name of which can be written with any degree of certainty one of the altars referred to above the wing of sarmatian cavalry is designated bremerton and this at once suggests that ribchester is the station bremerton Acum, on the tenth iter of antonine it is not too clear how the roman highway proceeded beyond ribchester immediately to the north is the straight edge of longridge fell an outlier of the uplands which rise to a height of over one thousand eight hundred feet between the ribble and the loon and include what is known as the forest of bowland it is generally assumed that one road passing north from wigan crossed the ribble at waltonley dale some seven miles lower down the river and then made for lancaster the main route to the north from ribchester however perhaps struck more directly north sweeping round the eastern side of the high fells for overborough near kirby lonsdale the most northerly of the roman stations known in lancashire it remains therefore to consider the roman forts at lancaster and at overborough and we will take lancaster first it is curious considering the importance of the remains found at lancaster that the outlines of the station have been so obliterated by passing through some cottages at the foot of the hill on which the castle stands and climbing a steep garden the visitor may still see a fragment of wall which tradition asserts was part of the rampart of the roman station this is the wherry wall familiar to all who inquire into the antiquities of the place whether it is roman or pre-roman it is perhaps not now possible to say nor is it possible to determine what was the outline of the station which it is always assumed 
stood on the summit of the hill and to the name of which we have no clue whatsoever there are traditions of a double stone rampart which recent excavations are said to have confirmed but it is difficult to obtain authentic records successive buildings through the centuries have obliterated the traces of the roman occupation we can only turn to the relics which are of interest taking the inscribed stones first a slab was found in eighteen twelve bearing an inscription which indicates that the soldiers of a wing of cavalry known as the sebusian rebuilt a bath and restored a ruined basilica in the year two hundred and twenty two a d the other inscriptions are on altars which have been found rather in the immediate vicinity of lancaster than at the station itself the finds of pottery have yielded a great number of potter's marks and some of the specimens may point to as early as the first century the coins found at lancaster cover the whole period of the roman occupation of britain it is striking that though so little trace remains in lancaster of the roman station the immediate vicinity has proved productive it has already been mentioned that the lancaster altars were found at some little distance from the town at quermore a short distance to the north-east a pottery and tile factory was discovered and here the stamp of the wing of sebusian cavalry turned up once more so recently as the spring of nineteen hundred and eight a farmer digging in a field found roman pottery and excavation on the spot disclosed the remains of a large kiln in the neighbourhood of lancaster also there have been found more milestones than in any other part of the county the roman milestone it need hardly be said did not always serve to mark distances it sometimes bore merely the name of the reigning emperor and the practice was sometimes followed of inverting a milestone on the death of an emperor and reinscribing it with the name of his successor the most interesting was found three or four miles from lancaster in an east north easterly direction the very direction in which lies the pottery kiln referred to it is seven feet high marks a distance of three miles and bears the name of hadrian the other two seem to date from the middle of the third century one marks a distance of three miles the other bears only the dedication to the emperor the roman name of lancaster is at present unknown an inscription may of course at any time enlighten us on the subject and under these circumstances it will be better to leave undiscussed several solutions of the difficulty that have been suggested lancaster may not as we have said have lain on the direct route north from ribchester towards carlisle a more direct route may have swept round to the east of the high ground of Bowland Forest, for the Roman station at Overborough, which lies near the northern boundary of the county, just south of Kirkby Lonsdale. It may perhaps safely be asserted that a Roman fort stood at Overborough, and if so, the most likely name of the station, taking the evidence of the itineraries, and there is no other evidence, would be Gallicum. Of this station, however, very little is known the earlier antiquaries for example leland and camden mention important finds but these cannot now be located apparently the area of the station is at present included in the grounds of a mansion and cannot be explored two altars a sepulchral stone and a gold bulla are the principal relics of which any record has been kept north of overborough the roman road perhaps divided one route seems to strike due north for Carlisle by way of Sedberg, Tebay, and Kirkby Thor. A second, whose course is less certain, may have swept round to the north-west, passing Kendal and reaching Windermere. In any case, we pass at this point outside the county we have been considering, and need not follow the line of the Roman advance further. Our examination in some detail of the traces the Romans have left in Lancashire has only confirmed the view that was stated at the outset to the effect that the district in the first centuries of our era possessed no special or individual importance as a portion of the roman empire or of roman britain it was merely a chance fragment of an outlying province as such however it was typical of the military organization of the romans the advance in our knowledge of the subject as has been shown is due to a better historical understanding of the meaning of remains 
and to systematic excavation of the sites themselves and it is along this line mainly that we can look for enlightenment in the future there is indeed one line of research from which we may hope for fruitful results the comparative study of the pottery found at roman stations for the rest the spade may not only reveal much that is yet unknown regarding the sites we have hitherto been considering but may open up new sites hitherto undreamt of as we try to see the lancashire of the first four centuries of our era a number of questions arise to which we would fain have some answer one wonders how the first news of the roman invasion was received by the fierce tribe that then dwelt in the basins of the mersey the ribble and the loon and on the western slopes of the pennines how many of the sites of which we have been speaking were chosen by agricola at a time when as his biographer tells us garrisons and forts were established with a skill and diligence which no newly acquired part of britain had before been treated how far was it true of lancashire that as has been said quote, the people of the north knew only hunting and pasturing and were always ready for feud and rapine end quote while the south developed itself to a moderate prosperity by cattle rearing agriculture and the export of corn to the rhinelands to what extent were recruits drawn from our county to swell the ranks of the british troops that were reckoned as the flower of the army in the more distant parts of the empire how far did the proximity of lancashire to a great legionary fortress and the fact that it was being crossed by two main roman routes bring it under that romanizing influence which it is generally assumed was confined to the southern half of britain and hardly touched the districts where the hold on the population was mainly military and to what extent did lancashire when that hold was finally relaxed quote, not because britain gave up rome but because rome gave up britain end quote, fall back more than other and more fully romanized districts into its original condition to some of these questions the answers can never be forthcoming on all of them the records whether epigraphical literary or archaeological are so far silent for the solution of those to which answers are still possible we can look to one source only systematic excavation end of part one part two of travels in lancashire Polly Albion, the seven and twentieth song by michael drayton from the complete works now first collected with introductions and notes by richard hooper volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the argument the circuit of this shire expressed Irwell and ribble then contest the muse next to the mosses flies and to fair wire herself applies the fishy loon then doth she bring the praise of lancashire to sing the isle of man maintains her plea then falling eastward from that sea on rugged furness and his fells of which this canto lastly tells scarce could the labouring muse salute this lively shire but straight such shouts arose from every moss and mere and rivers rushing down with such unusual noise upon their pebbly shoals seemed to express their joys that mersey in her course which happily confines brave cheshire from this tract two county palatines as ravished with the news along to Liverpool ran that all the shores which lie to the vergivian resounded with the shouts so that from creek to creek so loud the echoes cried that they were heard to shriek to furness rigid front whereas the rocky pile of fudra is at hand to guard the outlaid isle of walney and those gross and foggy fells awoke thence flying to the east with their reverberance shook the clouds from pendle's head which as the people say prognosticates to them a happy halcyon day rebounds on blackstone edge and thereby falling fills fair mersey making in from the derby and hills 
but whilst the active muse thus nimbly goes about of this large tract to lay the true dimensions out the neat lancastrian nymphs for beauty that excel that for the hornpipe round do bear away the bell some that about the banks of Irwell make abode with some that have their seat by ribble's silver road in great contention fell that mighty difference grew which of these floods deserved to have the sovereign due so that all future spleen and quarrels to prevent that likely was to rise about their long descent before the neighbouring nymphs their right they mean to plead and first thus for herself the lovely Irwell said ye lasses quoth this flood have long and blindly erred that ribble before me so falsely have preferred that am a native born and my descent do bring from ancient gentry here when ribble from her spring an alien known to be and from the mountains rude of yorkshire getting strength here boldly dares intrude upon my proper earth and through her mighty fall is not ashamed herself of lancashire to call whereas of all the nymphs that carefully attend my mistress mers's state there's none that doth transcend my greatness with her grace which doth me so prefer that all is due to me which doth belong to her for though from blackstone edge the torm come tripping down and from that long ridged rock her father's high renown of mersey thinks from me the place alone to win with my attending brooks yet when i once come in i out of countenance quite do put the nymph for note as from my fountain i towards mightier mersey float first roch a dainty rill from rochdale her dear dame who honoured with the half of her stern mother's name grows proud yet glad herself into my banks to get which spodden from her spring a pretty rivulet as her attendant brings when irk adds to my store and medlock to their much by lending somewhat more at manchester do meet all kneeling to my state where brave i show myself then with a prouder gait towards mersey making on great chap moss at my fall lies full of turf and marl her unctuous mineral and blocks as black as pitch with boring augers found there at the general flood supposed to be drowned thus chief of mersey's train away with her i run when in a prosperous course she watereth warrington and her fair silver load in Liverpool down doth lay a road none more renowned in the vergivian sea ye lusty lasses then in lancashire that dwell for beauty that are said to bear away the bell your country's hornpipe ye so mincingly that tread as ye the egg pie love and apple cherry red in all your mirthful songs and merry meetings tell that erwell every way doth ribble far excel her well-disposed speech had erwell scarcely done but swift report therewith immediately doth run to the vergivian shores among the mosses deep where alt a neighbouring nymph for very joy doth weep that simon's wood from whence the flood assumes her spring excited with the same was loudly heard to ring and over all the moors with shrill re-echoing sounds the drooping fogs to drive from those gross watery grounds where those that toil for turf with peating spades do find fish living in that earth contrary to their kind which but the pontus and heraclea likewise shows the like in their like earth that with like moisture flows and that such fish as these had not been likewise found within far firmer earth the paphlagonian ground a wonder of this isle this well might have been thought but ribble that this while for her advantage wrought of what she had to say doth well herself advise and to brave erwell's speech thus boldly she replies with that whereby the most thou think'st me to disgrace that i an alien am not rightly of this place my greatest glory is and lancashire therefore to nature for my birth beholding is the more that yorkshire which all shires for largeness doth exceed a kingdom to be called that well deserves indeed and not a fountain hath that from her womb doth flow within her spacious self but that she can bestow to lancaster yet lends me ribble from her store 
which adds to my renown and makes her bounty more from penny ghent's proud foot as from my source i slide that mountain my proud sire in height of all his pride takes pleasure in my course as in his first born flood an ingleborough hill of that olympian brood with pendle of the north the highest hills that be do wistly me behold and are beheld of me these mountains make me proud to gaze on me that stand so long ridge once arrived on the lancastrian land salutes me and with smiles me to his soil invites so have i many a flood that forward me excites as hodder that from home attends me from my spring then calder coming down from blackstone edge doth bring me easily on my way to preston the great town wherewith my banks are blessed whereat my going down clear darwin on along to me the sea doth drive and in my spacious fall no sooner i arrive but sabbock to the north from longridge making way to this my greatness adds when in my ample bay swart doulas coming in from wigan with her aids short tord and darlow small two little country maids in these low watery lands and moory mosses bred do see me safely laid in mighty neptune's bed and cutting in my course even through the very heart of this renowned shire so equally it part as nature should have said lo thus i meant to do this flood divides this shire thus equally in two ye maids the hornpipe then so mincingly that tread as ye the egg pie love and apple cherry red in all your mirthful songs and merry meetings tell that ribble every way your erwell doth excel here ended she again when merton's moss and mere with ribble's sole reply so much revived were that all the shores resound the river's good success and wondrous joy there was all over anderness which straight conveyed the news into the upper land where pendle penny ghent and ingleborough stand like giants and the rest do proudly overlook or atlas like as though they only undertook to underprop high heaven or the wide welkin dared who in their ribbles praise be sure no speeches spared that the loud sounds from them down to the forests fell to bowland brave in state and wiresdale which as well as any sylvan nymphs their beauteous sights may boast whose echoes sent the same all round about the coast that there was not a nymph to jollity inclined or of the woody brood or of the watery kind but at their fingers ends they ribble song could say and perfectly the note upon the bagpipe play that wire when once she knew how well these floods had sped when their reports abroad in every place was spread it vexed her very heart their eminence to see their equal at the least who thought herself to be determines at last to neptune's court to go before his ample state with humbleness to show the wrongs she hath sustained by her proud sister's spite and offering them no wrong to do her greatness right arising but a rill at first from wiresdale's lap yet still receiving strength from her full mother's pap as down to seaward she her serious course doth ply takes calder coming in to bear her company from wolfcrag's cliffy foot a hill to her at hand by that fair forest known within her verge to stand so boland from her breast sends brock her to attend as she a forest is so likewise doth she send her child on wiresdale's flood the dainty wire to wait with her assisting rills when wire is once replete she in her crooked course to seaward softly slides where pellin's mighty moss and merton's on her sides their boggy breasts outlay and skipton down doth crawl to entertain this wire attained to her fall when whilst each wandering flood seems settled to admire first erwell ribble and last of all this wire that mighty wagers would have willingly been laid but that these matters were with much discretion stayed some broils about these brooks had surely been begun when coker a coy nymph that clearly seems to shun all popular applause who from her crystal head in wiresdale near where wire is by her fountain fed 
that by their natural birth they seem indeed to twin yet for her sister's pride she careth not a pin of none and being helped she likewise helpeth none but to the irish sea goes gently down alone of any undisturbed till coming to her sound endangered by the sands with many a lofty bound she leaps against the tides and cries to crystal lung the flood that names the town from whence the shire begun her title first to take and loudly tells the flood that if a little while she thus but trifling stood these petty brooks would be before her still preferred which the long wandering lun with good advisement heard as she comes ambling on from westmoreland where first arising from her head amongst the mountains nursed by many a pretty spring that hourly getting strength arriving in her course in lancashire at length to lonsdale shows herself and lovingly doth play with her dear daughter dale which her frim cheek doth lay to her clear mother's breast as mincingly she traces and oft embracing her she oft again embraces and on her darling smiles with every little gale when lack the most loved child of this delicious dale and wemming on the way presents their either's spring next them she henborn hath and roban which do bring their bounties in one bank their mistress to prefer that she with great estate may come to lancaster of her which takes the name which likewise to the shire the sovereign title lends and eminency where to give to this her town what rightly doth belong of this most famous shire our loon thus frames her song first that most precious thing and pleasing most to man who from him made of earth immediately began is she self woman which the goodliest of this isle this country hath brought forth that much doth grace my style why should these ancients else which so much knowing were when they blazons gave to every several shire fair women as mine own have title due to me besides in all this isle there no such cattle be for largeness horn and hair as these of lancashire so that from every part of england far and near men haunt her marts for store as from her race to breed and for the third wherein she doth all shires exceed by those great race of hounds the deepest mouthed of all the other of this kind which we our hunters call which from their bellowing throats upon a scent so raw that you would surely think that the firm earth they tore with their wide yawning chaps or rent the clouds in sunder as though by their loud cry they meant to mock the thunder besides her natives have been anciently esteemed for bowmen near our best and ever have been deemed so loyal that the guard of our preceding kings of them did most consist but yet amongst all these things even almost ever since the english crown was set upon the lawful head of our plantagenet in honour next the first our dukedom was allowed and always with the greatest revenues was endowed and after when it happed france conquering edward's blood divided in itself here for the garland stood the right lancastrian line it from york's issue bare the red rose our brave badge which in their helmets wear in many a bloody field at many a doubtful fight against the house of york which bear for theirs the white and for myself there's not the tithe nor the why nor any of those nymphs that to the south would lie for sam and me excels and for this name of loon that i am christened by the britons it begun which fulness doth in ports of waters still increase to neptune loating low when crystal loon doth cease and conda coming in conducts her by the hand till lastly she salute the point of sunderland and leaves our dainty loon to amphitrite's care so blithe and bonny now the lads and lasses are that ever as anon the backpipe up doth blow cast in a gallant round about the hearth they go and at each pause they kiss was never seen such rule in any place but here at bonfire or at yule and every village smokes at wakes with lusty cheer then hey they cry for loon and hey for lancashire 
that one high hill was heard to tell it to his brother that instantly again to tell it to some other from hill again to vale from vale to hill it went the highlands they again it to the lower scent the mud exhausted meres had mosses deep among with the report thereof each road and harbour rung the sea nymphs with their song so great a coil do keep they ceased not to resound it over all the deep and acted it each day before the isle of man who like an empress sits in the vergivian by her that hath the calf long walney and the pile as handmaids to attend on her their sovereign isle to whom so many though the hebrides do show acknowledge that to her they due subjection owe with corn and cattle stored and what for hers is good that we nor island need not scorn her neighbourhood her midst with mountains set of which from scarfell height a clear and perfect eye the weather being bright be neptune's visage ne'er so terrible and stern the scotch the irish shores and the english may discern and what an empire can the same this island brings her pedigrees to show her right successive kings her chronicles and can as easily rehearse and with all foreign parts to have had free commerce her municipal laws and customs very old belonging to her state which strongly she doth hold this island with the song of loon is taken so as she hath special cause before all other who for her bituminous turf squared from her mossy ground and trees far under earth by daily digging found as for the store of oats which her black glebe doth bear in every one of these resembling lancashire to her she'll stoutly stick as to her nearest kin and cries this day is ours brave lancashire doth win but yet this isle of man more seems not to rejoice for lancashire's good look nor with a louder voice to sound it to the shores than furnace whose stern face with mountains set like warts which nature as a grace bestowed upon this tract whose brows do look so as stern that when the nymphs of sea did first her front discern amazedly they fled to amphitrite's bower her grim aspect to see which seemed to them so sour as it maligned the rule which mighty neptune bear whose fells to that grim god most stern and dreadful are with hills whose hanging brows with rocks about abound whose weighty feet stand fixed in that black beachy ground whereas those scattered trees which naturally partake the fatness of the soil in many a slimy lake their roots so deeply soaked send from their stocky bough a soft and sappy gum from which those tree geese grow called barnacles by us which like a jelly first to the beholder seem then by the fluxure nursed still great and greater thrive until you well may see them turn to perfect fowls when dropping from the tree into the meary pond which under them doth lie wax ripe and taking wing away in flocks do fly which well our ancients did among our wonders place besides by her strong sight she doth receive this grace before her neighbouring tracts which furnace well may vaunt that when the saxons here their forces first did plant and from the inner land the ancient britons drave to their distressed estate it no less succour gave than the trans severed hills which their old stock yet stores which now we call the welsh or the connubian shores what country let she see those soils within her seat but she in little hath what it can show in great as first without herself at sea to make her strong yet howsoe'er exposed doth still to her belong and face her furthest point from that rough neptune's rage the isle of walney lies whose longitude doth swage his fury when his waves on furnace seem to war whose crooked back is armed with many a rugged scar against his boisterous shocks which this defensive isle of walney still assail that she doth scorn the while which to a sister hath the pile of fuldraset and fulney at her back a pretty insulet which all their forces bend their furnace safe to keep but to his inner earth divert we from the deep where those two mighty meres outstretched in length do wander 
the lesser thurston named the famouser winanda so bounded with her rocks as nature would descry by her how these great seas mediterranean lie to seaward then she hath her sundry sands again as that of duddon first then levin lastly ken of three bright naiades named as duddon on the west that cumberland cuts off from this shire doth invest those sands with her proud style when levin from the fells besides her natural source with the abundance swells which those two mighty meres upon her either side contribute by recourse that out of very pride she leaves her ancient name and foss herself doth call till coming to the sands even almost at her fall on them her ancient style she liberally bestows upon the east from these clear ken her beauty shows from kendall coming in which she doth please to grace first with her famous type then lastly in her race her name upon those sands doth liberally bequeath whereas the muse awhile may sit her down to breathe and after walk along towards yorkshire on her way on which she strongly hopes to get a noble day end of part two part three of travels in lancashire old time travel in lancashire by william harrison chapter three of memorials of old lancashire edited by h a fishwick this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org travel by railway though only of comparatively recent introduction has by this time become so universal and has so thoroughly ingrained itself into the habits of englishmen that it is only by an effort of the imagination that most people can contemplate an inland journey of any length by road it is true that within the last few years bicycles and motor-cars have done something to revive the memory of the later coaching times when the common roads were alive with traffic of all kinds but those times were themselves brief and we need not go much further back to reach a period when stage-coaches were as great an innovation as the railways were to become later the local travel of this anterior period stretching back to early medieval times has an interest of its own it may not therefore be without profit if we endeavour to trace out the original main lines of communication in lancashire describe the state of the roads of the county from time to time and to set forth the modes conditions and incidents of travel so far as a knowledge of these things has come down to us in lancashire as in many other districts the great lines of travel were dictated from the beginning by the physical configuration of the land there are in the county three great rivers each flowing from the eastern hills to the western sea at the lowest point on each at which a bridge could be conveniently thrown across we find a town erected on the loon lancaster on the ribble preston on the mersey warrington through these towns it was inevitable that a great road to the south should run making a direct line instead of one following the irregularities of the coast and such we find to have been in fact the case along this direct line ran the roman road along it runs to-day the west coast railway to scotland and along it ran the chief lancashire road of the middle ages the earliest map we have showing anything of lancashire that of about a d thirteen hundred preserved in the bodleian library shows distinctly this road and this road alone stretching along on its way from london to carlisle among the earliest bridges too of which we have any record in the county are those of lancaster preston and warrington of all of which we hear in the thirteenth century not many other bridges do we hear of at this early period indeed the list is about exhausted when we have named also those at manchester and stockport on the great road to derbyshire and cowan bridge in the remote north-eastern corner of the county this last named by the way affords an early instance of a bridge supported by tolls this is explainable by its peculiar position on the great highway between yorkshire and westmoreland as it existed only for the traffic of these two counties 
it was only fair that the burden of keeping it up should not be thrown upon the county in which it happened to be situated the corporation of lancaster for some hundreds of years received the tolls and it is presumed kept the bridge in repair though the roads we have just named were the only great roads there were no doubt many other highways suitable for foot and horse parishes in the county were exceptionally large and there would of necessity be a way of some sort from each outlying part of a parish to the parish church there was for instance a way by which dwellers in rossendale could reach their parish church at clitheroe twelve miles distant but for the reason that it was very foul painful and hillless they succeeded ultimately in obtaining a parish church of their own the establishment of the religious houses provided other centres to which roads would of necessity converge indeed the roads to and from the monasteries must have been tolerably lively there would have been a stream of arriving and departing visitors frequent visits would have to be paid to the mother house where such existed or the daughter cells and granges or the estates scattered up and down the country which had been acquired by gift or purchase and whence would be regularly brought some part of the produce some of the monasteries certainly furness and probably wally carried on a considerable trade by supplying wool to the flemish and florentine merchants whom it reached from the east coast ports of boston or lynn to such distant and out-of-the-way houses as furness and cartmel approached over extensive sands the maintenance of communications was of capital importance from an early period the prior of cartmel had thrown upon him the duty of maintaining a guide to assist travellers across the fords the series of sands in and beyond morecambe bay made formidable obstacles in the way of travel to furness or into cumberland the seven miles from hest bank to kent's bank known as the lancaster sands involved the crossing of the channels of the rivers keir and kent and there according to the old distich kent and keir have parted many a man and his mare then after a few miles of terra firma past cartmel came the levin sands not so long but even more dangerous as the ford was always shifting the priory of conishead on the further side had the duty of supplying a guide over these sands and on chapel island midway in the channel they performed services for the attendance of those crossing these sands safely crossed the abbey of furness was easily reached but travellers into cumberland had still another crossing that of the duddon sands very early in history do we find recorded instances of loss of life during the crossing of these sands in twelve sixty nine sir michael de furness was drowned on levin sands while crossing to aldingham after dining at the priory of cartmel again in the reign of edward the second sixteen lives were lost at one time and six or more at another besides these crossings there were well-defined passages across the estuary of the ribble below preston and across the mersey at hale by which travellers from the northern parts of lancashire made their way to chester these were the more notable obstacles to travel more ordinary were the numerous places where the rivers in their higher stages had to be crossed for never can one go far without being confronted by a flowing stream and bridges were then few how frequent these crossing places were is indicated by the numerous place names of which ford is a component part where the rivers were too deep for fording we find ferries were established at an early period in the twelfth century ferries across the mersey were in existence at warrington and between witness and runcorn the right of ferry from liverpool to birkenhead was the property of the lord of liverpool and one in the opposite direction was granted by the king to the prior and convent of birkenhead in thirteen thirty one again we see the interest of the religious houses in keeping up their communications on the ribble ferries existed from very early times at salmsbury elston balderstone and osbaldeston thus did travellers in medieval days overcome the obstacles which rivers placed in their way the roads themselves probably presented little difficulty carriages of course were few and travel was chiefly on foot or horseback the roads in those times seemed to have been tolerably good along them travelled the prince and the peasant 
the knight with his retainers the judges on their circuit the bishops on their visitations the abbot and the prior on their way from one religious house to another the merchant with cavalcades carrying his goods the pilgrim intent on visiting the shrines at durham york pontefract or chester or the holy well in north wales all these classes were interested in the maintenance of good roads and they probably secured such as were at any rate good enough for their purpose we hear a few complaints in those times and travel seems to have been tolerably fast but towards the end of the fifteenth century there came a change the break-up of the feudal system the decline of tillage and the scarcity of agricultural labour caused the roads to get into disrepair here as elsewhere and then came the reformation to accentuate the change with the monasteries dissolved and their scattered estates sold abbots and priors no longer journeyed pilgrimages came to an end estates became concentrated and not scattered fewer people being interested in the good condition of the roads neglect and decay naturally followed in the latter part of the sixteenth century the roads became worse and the cost of carriage increased and in the following century matters in this respect became worse and worse in the meantime however the number of bridges seems to have been increasing in the maps of saxton and speed at the end of the sixteenth century we find twenty-nine shown and the probability is that there were some few others each hundred in the county maintained its own bridges except three which were the affair of the whole county viz those at lancaster walton ribblebridge and crossford on the mersey near manchester the number of bridges in salford hundred mentioned in the manchester constable's accounts from sixteen fourteen onwards is considerable we frequently read of special lays or rates being levied for the repair of these bridges and of the county bridges in one case that of darcy lever bridge the lay was for re-edifying and was objected to and seems to have aroused something like passive resistance for the constables made a charge for writing the names of all the inhabitants that refused to pay and afterwards for a precept to distrain for the amounts due from them bridge building became necessary owing to the fords being cut up by the increasing traffic the necessity is forcibly expressed in a quarter sessions order in sixteen thirty seven in regard to fennisford across the calder near Wally. its preamble sets forth that the river is very often especially at the winter season so great that there is no passage for man or horse and many attempting at such times to pass have been drowned and almost daily some persons are there put in danger of their lives and have their loads and carriages drowned and lost and that the said ford is of late years so worn and grown so rocky that in short time it is thought will become altogether impassable being almost impossible to be amended by the charge and labour of man voluntary contributions had been made in aid of a bridge and the court made an order levying a tax of two fifteenths on the hundred of blackburn towards building a stone bridge additional bridges were no doubt a necessity on account of the rapidly increasing trade of the county the act of parliament of thirty three henry the eighth as to sanctuary sets forth that many strangers from ireland and elsewhere resorted to manchester with linen yarn wools and other necessary wares for making of cloths and others resorted to the town with a great number of cottons to be sold to the inhabitants for dressing and freezing again in sixteen forty one we are told that the men of manchester bought linen yarn from the irish in great quantity and weaving it returned the same again into ireland to sell they also bought cotton wool in london that came first from cyprus and smyrna and at home worked it and perfected it into fustians dimities and other such stuffs and then returned it to london all this of course meant a considerable traffic for the roads again in the house and farm accounts of the shuttleworths of smithells and gawthorpe which have been published by the chetham society we are able to see how considerable an extent the keeping up of a single country house contributed to road traffic we find numerous entries showing how articles are fetched from various lancashire towns as well as from halifax york and chester 
and occasionally from london and from the great annual fair at stourbridge near cambridge now and then a physician is fetched on horseback from chester a servant is sent to wrexham for hops halting for the night at warrington or frodsham and once a messenger goes to formby on the coast with three horses to bring two barrels of herrings during the civil wars of the seventeenth century the bridges no doubt suffered through military operations thus the milne bridge at manchester and two other bridges near to it were taken down early in the war by command of the officers for the parliament for the safety of the garrison which bridge lying for a long time after so broken down as aforesaid the inhabitants of the parts adjacent to manchester that formerly had passage over the said bridge to the church and market at manchester were debarred of the same to their great loss and prejudice so much we learn from an order of the committee for sequestrations made in sixteen forty nine under which the high sheriff was repaid twenty two pound dispersed by him in repairing the bridges and later on in sixteen seventy an act of parliament empowered the justices of lancashire and cheshire during the next ten years to build new bridges and repair and rebuild such as were demolished in the late war in the marchings and countermarchings during the war we naturally find the bridges and river passages watched and guarded and when possible made use of thus we find the parliamentary commander erecting a strong sconce or fort upon the marsh near preston to command the fords over the ribble this did not however prevent the royalist forces from marching over ribble water at hesketh banks into the fylde and afterwards over wyawater soon after they returned crossing the ribble at wharton and finding they durst not abide in the county marched over liverpool water at hale ford into cheshire the mersey is not at the present time fordable at all at hale where the river is of considerable width but we find the ford used again and again during the war prince rupert fresh from his victory at bolton marched his forces across and according to a contemporary report took his prisoners along with him when it was too deep almost for horses to go they must wade over either in their clothes or putting them off carry them upon their necks it was supposed they intended to drown them and this was remarkable there was an old man a prisoner conceiting their intention to be so hard-hearted and cruel towards them encouraged his fellows exhorting them to be of good cheer and fear not though they think to drown us yet they must not god is stronger than the devil now the prisoners had special care one of another keeping close together to support one another if they were weak and in danger in the water so that through god's power they all got through with less danger than the horsemen after the defeat at marston moor rupert again made for hale ford on his way to chester on this occasion he entered the county at hornby and as he is not mentioned to have passed through lancaster or preston it is likely that he came down the ribble valley avoiding the towns another royalist force had a narrow escape at the crossing of the ribble estuary trying to avoid the enemy they arrived at freckleton at a time when the tide did not allow of their crossing the parliamentary commander sir john meldrum was however delayed and arrived in time to see them marching over ribble water when it was very deep some of them being westmoreland and cumberland men afterwards tried to steal back to prevent which the filed countrymen guarded the passage night and day when the tide was forth and some it is recorded got good prizes by it when the scots under the duke of hamilton invaded england in sixteen forty eight they came south by kirkby longsdale hornby and the loon valley which is to be noted as the route shown in the bodleian map of circa thirteen hundred and not by shap fells and kendall as shown in later road books they made for preston cromwell meanwhile advancing in hot haste from yorkshire by skipton and gisborne and over the old hodder bridge the picturesque ruins of which remain to this day here a council of war was held and next day darwin's stream with blood of scots imbrued testified to the soundness of its decisions and the effectiveness with which they were carried out the pursuit to wigan was wrote cromwell 
over twelve miles of such ground as I never rode in all my life, the day being very wet. It was continued along the old road by Winnick to Warrington Bridge, where the Scots surrendered, terms being given them, considering, says Cromwell, the strength of the pass, and that I could not go over the river within ten miles of Warrington with the army. The same road from the north was followed by the Pretender's army in 1715, as far as Preston, and again in 1745, when the young Pretender got beyond that town, but made for Manchester instead of Warrington. To retard his advance, the bridges at Warrington, Crossford and Barton were partially destroyed, and on arrival at Manchester we find his officers repairing Crossford Bridge, and looking up guides for the fords at Barlow and Cheadle. The great highway between South Lancashire and Yorkshire went over Blackstone Edge, a lofty moorland which seems to have had many terrors, especially for South Country folk. A traveller in 1639 who had set out from Halifax says, I rode over such ways as are past comparison or amending, for when I went down the lofty mountain called Blackstone Edge, I thought myself with my boy and horses had been in the land of Breakneck, it was so steep and tedious. Yet I recovered twelve miles to Rochdale, and then I found smooth way to Manchester. The natives, of course, thought little of it. For half a century earlier, we find the Smithall's servants making frequent journeys to Halifax without remark. Ralph Thorsby, the Leeds antiquary, on a June day in 1682, seems to have enjoyed it, for he says, upon the height of the Blackstone Edge we left Yorkshire, and had a pleasant prospect of Lancashire. He was then twenty-four years of age. Sixteen years afterwards, in early February, he expressed a different view. He says, I took a journey into Lancashire, but found no prospect of business answering to the trouble and hazard in, in passing Blackstone Edge, where we had a sore storm upon the height of it, when it was fair sunshine on both sides but we found the snow so drifted that in some of the lanes it was as high as man and horse, in other places so thin spread that it seemed barely to cover the ice, so that upon the slanting side of the hill my horse in a moment's time lost all his feet and fell upon my left leg. Celia Fiennes, the daughter of the parliamentary colonel Nathaniel Fiennes, who has left an interesting diary, published some years ago, in describing her journey from Elland in Yorkshire, about 1697, says, Then I came to Blackstone Edge, noted all over England for dismal high precipices, and steep in the ascent and descent on either end. It's a very moorish ground all about, and even just at the top, though so high that you travel on a causey, which is very troublesome, as it's a moist ground, so as is usual on those high hills. Again the writer, whether it be Defoe or not, of the tour through the whole island of Great Britain, first published in 1724, gives a fearsome account of his journey in the month of August, when he encountered both snow and thunder. He speaks of the consternation of himself and his companions, of the frightful precipice on one hand, and uneven ground on the other, and of the unanimous decision to return to Rochdale, when one of the servants pointed out what he called a plain way, but which they pronounced a very frightful one, narrow and deep, with a hollow precipice on the right. Mountaineers of our day will smile at the timidity of these southerners, but will remember that the modern delight in mountain walks is a recent growth, which two centuries ago would have been incomprehensible. Then too, as now, appreciation or the lack of it depended very much on the prevailing climatic conditions. We have already seen how differently Thorsby regarded Blackstone Edge on two different occasions, and at a later period we find John Wesley writing at one time of his clambering over the horrid mountains between Rochdale and Todmorden, and at another of a delightful ride through the mountains between Colne and Todmorden. Allusion was made just now to travelling on a causey. The causey, or causeway, was a narrow way two to four feet in width, paved with round pebbles, intended for horsemen and pedestrians only. It was guarded by posts at a proper distance to keep carts off it, the open part of the road being generally impassable in the winter from mire and deep ruts. 
this system seems to have been peculiar to lancashire for defoe when approaching wigan says we are now in a country where the roads are paved with small pebbles so that we both walk and ride upon this pavement which is generally about a yard and a half broad but the middle road where carriages are obliged to go is very bad it can easily be understood that the meeting of traffic on such a road would put a strain on the good nature of whichever party had to give way to the other now and then attempts at reform were made in sixteen eighty eight at the quarter sessions held at ormskirk it was ordered that all the king's highways in each parish of the hundred of west derby should forthwith be put in perfect and good repair that they may be so wide so smoothed from little hills little rocks hollows and slods that all coaches carts and carriages may safely in all places going by the coursey meet and pass each other and that all courses be made of the full breadth of one yard and a quarter of round stones and not of flags all overseers of the highways were required to see this order duly and fully executed whether or not they actually did so is extremely problematical nine or ten years later some of these highways were travelled by celia fines already mentioned she had been crossing the sands of dee from harden and then the peninsula of wirral till she found herself on the banks of the mersey she says this i ferried over and was an hour and a half in the passage it's of great breadth and up low water is so deep and salt as the sea almost though it does not cast so green a hue on the water as the sea but else the waves toss and the rocks grate all around it and is as dangerous as the sea it's a sort of hoy that i ferried over and my horses the boats would have held one hundred people she does not allude to a circumstance mentioned by a writer some thir some thirty or forty years later viz that when people land on the liverpool side they are carried through the water a little way on the shoulders of men who wade knee-deep in the mud to take them out of the boats leaving liverpool she takes to the west derby highways thence to prescott seven very long miles but pretty good way mostly lanes thence to wigan seven miles more mostly in lanes and some hollow ways and some pretty deep stony way so forced as upon the high causey but some of the way was good which i went pretty fast and yet by reason of the tediousness for miles for length i was five hours going that fourteen miles i could have gone thirty miles about london in the time then she went next day to preston of which she wrote preston is reckoned but twelve miles from wigan but they exceed in length by far those that i thought long the day before from liverpool it is true to avoid the many meres and marshy places it was a great compass i took and passed down and up very steep hills and this way was good gravel way but passing by many very large arches that were only single but as large as two great gateways and the water i went through that ran under them was so shallow i inquired the meaning and was informed that on great rains these brooks could be swelled to so great a height that unless those arches were so high no passing while it were so they are but narrow bridges for foot or horse and at such floods they are forced in many places to boat it until they come to those arches on the great bridges which are across these great rivers i passed by at least half a dozen of those single high arches besides several great stone bridges of four or six arches which are very high also over their greatest rivers i was about four hours going those twelve miles and could have gone twenty in the time in most countries nay by the people of these parts this twelve is as long and as much time taken up in going it as to go from thence to lancaster which is twenty miles and i can confirm this by my own experience for i went to gascoigne garstang which is ten miles and half way to lancaster in two hours thence to lancaster town ten miles more which i easily reached in two hours and a half or three hours i passed through abundance of villages almost at the end of every mile mostly along lanes being an enclosed country her next allusion shows that in one respect at least lancashire was ahead of the rest of the country 
they have one good thing in most parts of this principality or county palatine it's rather called that at all crossways there are posts with hands pointing to each road with the names of the great town or market town that it leads to which does make up for the length of the miles that strangers may not lose their road and have it to go back again this comes as a reminder to us that finger posts have not existed from time immemorial the act of parliament which required them to be set up was only passed in sixteen ninety seven and this journey though not precisely dated must have been very soon afterwards in seventeen hundred and four we find bishop nicholson travelling over this same road in the opposite direction he rode on an october day from kendal by levens and lancaster to garstang twenty-six miles in the day garstang to preston he describes as ten short miles but preston to chorley six miles as long in riding as the other ten this was an alternative road to wigan a letter written by sir thomas lowther in seventeen thirty gives a vivid picture of the inconvenience and danger of travelling by this road at that period he is giving directions to his steward as to the escort of a party to london by coach of course a private coach he writes i would have john dean to go all the way from holker to london a little before the coach to observe if there be any dangerous places and then to walk by the coach for fear of an overturn and there is always men in preston or walton hired to go each side of the coach through the bad ways in lancashire any readers who are intimately acquainted with the distances by road between the lancashire towns which have been named may have noticed that the figures given in the accounts quoted are not strictly correct they were what were known as computed distances a customary standard which everybody knew was inaccurate but conformed to none the less ogilby in his survey of the roads published in sixteen seventy five although he gave measured miles was constrained to give side by side with them the computed distances thus the twelve miles from wigan to preston which celia finds found so long and which even by computation should be fourteen he makes to be sixteen miles four furlongs and a writer of seventeen sixty three speaks of the computed distances as being nothing better than the effect of wild and random imagination as six such miles are seven or eight in one place in another nine or ten in the whole journey from london to carlisle ogilby makes the vulgar computation two hundred and thirty five miles and the dimensuration three hundred and one miles two furlongs the difference being so much as sixty six and a quarter miles in the notes of a journey from oxford to edinburgh in seventeen thirty seven by dr holmes president of st john's college and mr john quatermain both measured and computed miles are given they laid on successive nights at warrington preston lancaster and kendal the computed travel of the three days being twenty twenty and sixteen miles respectively and the measured twenty-five twenty-two and twenty even the latter seemed to err on the side of scantiness well might celia fines complain of long miles john wesley was so constant a traveller in all parts of the kingdom that his journal could not fail to give us some insight into the conditions of travel during the long period which it covers in the first place one is struck by the great distances which he accomplishes in the day and often on successive days even in lancashire thus he records without comment a ride from chipping near preston to ambleside in april seventeen forty seven and five years later from chipping to whitehaven in two days in seventeen fifty nine he rode from lower darwin to a few miles beyond kendal his journeys were of course mostly on horseback and travelling thus he would be able to avail himself of roads which might not have been fit for wheeled vehicles from no mention being made of preston on the way and from his routes to the north taking in ribchester and chipping it seems likely that he used the old roman road which ran northwestwardly from manchester over Affside moor to lancaster a road which went out of use as a through route soon after his time and which from the absence of wheeled traffic may have been more convenient for horsemen sometimes he is persuaded to get into a chaise but he does not seem at home in it and it is on these occasions that he records accidents 
in july seventeen sixty nine he had ridden from chester to manchester he writes as we were pretty well tired our friends there insisted on my going on in a chaise so in the morning saturday twenty ninth we set out when we were on the brow of the hill above rippenden suddenly the saddle horse fell with the driver under him and both lay without motion the shaft horse then boggled and turned short towards the edge of the precipice but presently the driver and horse rose up unhurt and we went on safe to leeds again in seventeen sixty two he set out from liverpool for wigan but before we came to ashton i was glad to use my own feet and leave the poor horses to drag the shares as they could four years later however he records with some apparent pride a journey commencing at colne i set out early and the next afternoon reached whitehaven and my shares horses were no worse for travelling a hundred and ten miles in two days it is noticeable that he spent the time on horseback in reading again and again he mentions having read certain books on the way it was after a long journey ending at manchester that he made this remark near thirty years ago i was thinking how is it that no horse ever stumbles while i am reading history poetry and philosophy i commonly read on horseback having other employments at other times no account can possibly be given but this because then i throw the reins on his neck i then set myself to observe and i aver that in riding above a hundred thousand miles i scarce ever remember any horse except two that would fall head over heels anyway to fall or make a considerable stumble while i rode with a slack rein occasionally though not very often he records a bad road thus in seventeen eighty one on his way from bolton to blackburn he was desired to take cab on his way but such a road sure no carriage ever went before i was glad to quit it and use my own feet in seventeen eighty eight he found a succession of bad roads in a season it is true of continuous rain from bolton he went on through miserable roads to blackburn the next day he becomes sarcastic through equally good roads we got on to paddyham from hence we went in the afternoon through still more wonderful roads to haslingdon they were sufficient to lame any horses and shake any carriage in pieces n b i will never attempt to travel these roads again till they are effectually mended next day he writes we hobbled on to bury through roads equally deplorable wesley's account of his crossing of the morecambe sands is interesting as a revelation at once of the impediments put in the way of travellers and of his own indomitable character the character of the man of business who refuses to be impeded and chafes at every delay it is in may seventeen fifty nine he has travelled from bolton preaching on the way at lower darwin reaching lancaster he is informed it is too late to cross the sands but he is resolved to make the trial he passes the seven mile sand without difficulty and reaches flookborough about sunset next morning he sets out early and crosses the leven and dudden sands without either guide or difficulty at bootle he is informed he cannot pass at ravenglass before one or two o'clock whereas as he afterwards finds he might have passed immediately about eleven o'clock he is directed to a ford which they say he may cross at noon when he comes they tell him he cannot cross so he sits still till about one o'clock and then finds he could have crossed at noon however he reached whitehaven before night he adds but i have taken my leave of the sand road i believe it is ten measured miles shorter than the other but there are four sands to pass so far from each other that it is scarce possible to pass them all in a day especially as you have all the way to do with a generation of liars who detain all strangers as long as they can either for their own gain or their neighbours i can advise no stranger to go this way he may go round by kendall and keswick often in less time always with less expense and far less trial of his patience wesley seems to have adhered to his determination for his subsequent journeys to whitehaven were by way of ambleside another divine bishop nicholson who crossed these sands many years previously viz in july sixteen eighty four has left a much more laconic record over the three sands to bootle 
from Lancaster, a long Sabbath day's journey. This is all that his diary records, and it speaks of an uneventful passage, the chief thing noticeable being the length. On the whole we may come to the conclusion that the Lancashire roads down to this period were not unsuitable for travelling on horseback, and that such travelling was tolerably fast, nor were they unsuited to the cavalcades of pack-horses by which goods were carried from place to place, the leader carrying a bell to notify their approach to other travellers as yet unseen. On the bridle roads which these cavalcades would chiefly affect, carriages would be unknown, and it would only be when their course lay along a carriage road that there would be any serious trouble. Then they might be compelled to leave the causey on meeting a cavalcade travelling in the opposite direction, and, in the then state of the carriageway, we can imagine the floundering of a loaded animal before it got free from the mud, and back again on the firm causey. It was really the growth of wheeled traffic which had such a deplorable effect on the great roads. And once out of repair, the system then in vogue of throwing the cost of their repair upon the locality militated against anything effectual being done, for a sparsely populated country parish was not likely to be eager to spend money in keeping in order its portion of a main road used chiefly for the benefit of the large towns on either side. The duty, indeed, was often quite beyond its power. The remedy which was devised, the system of turnpikes, was an attempt to throw the burden of repair on the shoulders of those who actually used the road, by charging toll, collected from them at the turnpikes or toll-bars, which were set up at intervals along the road. To authorise this, an Act of Parliament was necessary, and as at the beginning it was thought that the system would only be temporary, no general act was passed, but application was made for a special act for each road for a limited term of years, usually twenty-one. The expiration of the term usually found the trustees unable to pay off the loans they had contracted on security of the tolls, and so a further act was obtained prolonging the term, and this was repeated until, in our own time, the turnpikes came to an end, after an existence of nearly two centuries. The system had made some headway in the South and Midlands before it reached Lancashire, and the author of the tour through the whole island of Great Britain is enthusiastic about the effect the turnpikes had already had upon trade, the cost of carriage of goods being abated, notwithstanding that the carriers had to bear the toll. More weight could be brought with the same number of horses, and that with less fatigue and all kinds of travellers found increased safety and ease. The first road in Lancashire to be turnpiked was that from Sherbrooke Hill near Buxton and Chapel and Frith to Manchester, and of it only the last six miles from Stockport lay within the county. It is described in the Act passed in 1724 as the nearest road from London to Manchester. Next came, in 1725, an act applying to the road from Liverpool to Prescott, and in the following year two acts, one relating to the roads from Wigan to Preston, and the other to that from Warrington to Wigan. The roads leading eastwards from Manchester, through Ashton and Oldham respectively, were dealt with in 1732 and 1735, and in the latter year an act was also passed for repairing and widening the road from the town of Rochdale, leading over a certain craggy mountain called Blackstone Edge, and from thence to the towns of Halifax and Eland. In 1745, an act dealt with the road from Prescott to St. Helens, and in 1749, another with that from Ardwick Green to Wilmslow in Cheshire. Thus down to the middle of the 18th century, the system had been applied in Lancashire only to a very limited extent, practically only to that section of the highway to the north which lay between Warrington and Preston, and to certain short lengths in the neighbourhood of Liverpool and Manchester. And even here it could hardly be called a success, for it was precisely to that section of the northern highway that Arthur Young in 1771 devoted his choicest epithets. He writes, I know not in the whole range of language terms sufficiently expressive to describe this infernal road. To look on a map and perceive that it is a principal one, not only to some towns, but even whole counties, one would naturally conclude it to be at least decent. But let me most seriously caution all travellers 
who may accidentally purpose to travel this terrible country to avoid it as they would the devil for a thousand to one but they break their necks or their limbs by overthrows or breaking down they will here meet with ruts which i actually measured four feet deep and floating with mud only from a wet summer what therefore must it be after a winter the only mending it receives is the tumbling in some loose stones which serve no other purpose but jolting a carriage in the most intolerable manner these are not merely opinions but facts for i actually passed three carts broken down in these eighteen miles of execrable memory so much of the road from preston to wigan onwards to warrington was not much better he writes this is a paved road and most infamously bad any person would imagine the people of the county had made it with a view to immediate destruction for the breadth is only sufficient for one carriage consequently it is cut at once into ruts and you will easily conceive what a breakdown dislocating road ruts cut through a pavement must be the pretence of wanting materials is but a mere pretence for i remarked several quarries of rock sufficient to make miles of excellent road if they will pave the breadth ought to be such as to admit several carriages abreast as the inevitable consequence must be the immediate cutting up tolls had better be doubled and even quadrupled than suffer such a nuisance to remain if this was the state of the main highways what of the country roads at the time here and there we get a glimpse of their condition at lee we hear of the vilest roads a foot deep in mud with ruts and holes in which a sheep might be hidden the cart between droylston and manchester had to be drawn by four horses lengthwise occasionally one wheel was driven along the ditch this being preferable to the highway from possessing a firmer bottom sometimes while passing through the ruts the cart wheels sunk up to the axle trees and the bottom of the cart heard i e grated on the pathway between the clayton folks used to repair their length now and then by filling the ruts with brushwood and then pulling the sides on the top of it with the beginning of the second half of the eighteenth century there was a greatly increased activity in extending the turnpike system all at once and in all directions we find acts obtained for applying the system to considerable lengths of road from preston northwards to the westmoreland border from lancaster eastwards to richmond and south eastwardly to keithley from manchester to crossford bridge from salford to warrington bolton wigan and duxbury from prescott to warrington and st helens to ashton in makerfield all these roads were the subjects of acts obtained in the first three years of the half century and with the roads previously turnpiked they completed a series of communications within the area lying between manchester liverpool and preston during the next few years the system was applied in the north-eastern part of the county between preston blackburn clitheroe burnley and colm also to rochdale and bury then to the road through ulverston and other roads in the north and then year by year to various sections chiefly in the industrial districts in the south-eastern part of the county the preamble of the act is usually to the effect that the road in question is an important one and that by reason of the nature of the soil and the many and heavy carriages passing through the same the road is become so exceedingly deep and ruinous that in the winter season and frequently in summer it is very difficult and dangerous to pass through the same with wagons carts and other wheel carriages and travellers cannot pass without danger and loss of time sometimes the preamble goes on to allege some special local reason for instance the acts for the crosford bridge and manchester road in seventeen fifty one adds that some part of the road lying next to crossford bridge is many times overflowed with water and unpassable whereby the post is delayed and several persons in attempting to pass through the same have lost their lives the extension of the system in the south-eastern part of the county was necessitated by the spread in the valleys of that district of cotton mills weaving sheds bleach works and dye works for these industries easier means of transit for their productions and for the raw materials coal and other articles they required were a vital necessity the old method of carriage by pack horses was no longer sufficient and carts and wagons required better roads than those hitherto in use if these roads could be provided 
it was worth the while of the traders to pay the tolls necessary for keeping them up and for paying the interest on the initial expense in the making of these east lancashire roads john metcalfe the celebrated blind jack of knaresborough took a leading part as a contractor he undertook a considerable mileage and despite his blindness carried out what he had undertaken in a satisfactory manner concurrently with this turnpiking or making of new roads resort was at this time more frequently made in regard to the unturnpiked roads to the old common law method of enforcing repair that of indicting the inhabitants at quarter sessions numerous convictions were obtained the inhabitants being fined a fixed sum which was raised by rates paid to the prosecutor and by him applied to the repair of the highway only sections of roads could be dealt with in this way as the whole road was seldom in one parish and each parish had to be dealt with by a separate indictment on the whole however by one means or another an appreciable improvement was effected as the old acts expired and came up again for renewal the opportunity was taken to make additional improvements the roads were in many places widened straightened or diverted here a bend was cut off and there a steep gradient was eased bridges too were widened and improved and some additional ones were built superseding dangerous fords in seventeen fifty an act was obtained for the building of a bridge over the ribble at penwortham inasmuch as the fords are by reason of the great freshes and tides which have of late years happened therein so much worn and become so deep and founderous that his majesty's subjects even at low water especially in the winter season cannot pass the same on horseback or with carts and carriages without imminent danger ribchester bridge was rebuilt in seventeen sixty nine and a new bridge on the north road near preston was completed in seventeen eighty two superseding the old ribble bridge which querdon nearly one hundred years before had described as one of the stateliest stone bridges in the north of england similarly the handsome and substantial stone bridge at lancaster consisting of five elliptical arches of a total length of five hundred and forty nine feet built at a cost of fourteen thousand by the county was completed in seventeen eighty eight and superseded the ancient bridge which has since fallen into ruin and so little by little the way was being prepared or rather for here the usual metaphorical expression becomes absolutely literal the ways were being prepared for a new method of travel which was to have its day and then cease to be not until these various improvements had been carried out was it possible for the system of stage-coaches to become fully established it is true that a coach of sorts ran from preston to london as early as sixteen sixty three but it does not seem to have been continued a traveller by it wrote that his journey was in no way pleasant and had so indisposed him that he was resolved never to ride up again in the coach the first coach from manchester to london was not until seventeen fifty four when it was announced that the flying coach would actually barring accidents arrive in london in four days and a half after leaving manchester four years later the flying machine was advertised to go from london to liverpool in three days in seventeen seventy three the manchester warrington and liverpool stage-coach set out from the spread eagle in salford in summer on monday wednesday and friday in every week and returned thither on tuesday thursday and saturday but it is beyond our present purpose to describe the growth and decline of stage-coaching in lancashire its growth marks the end of the period we set out to review and brings in an era wherein the leisurely travel of the individual gives place to the ordered movement of the group and a man begins to submit to the tyranny of the time-table a tyranny increasingly felt as the railways developed the charm of self-regulated motion travel at one's own sweet will has been rediscovered by some of us in these later days through the agency of the bicycle and the motor-car but this is not for the majority and in any case the conditions are now wholly changed the past cannot be reconstituted and therefore it is that for us to-day there remains some interest of an archaic kind in the means and methods of old-time travel 
End of part three. Part four of Travels in Lancashire. A description of the county of Lancaster by Daniel Defoe. Part one. From a tour through the island of Great Britain, divided into circuits or journeys. Volume three. Letter four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I entered Lancashire at the remotest western point of that county, having been at Chester upon a particular occasion, and from thence ferried over from the Chestrian Chersonesus, as I have already called it, to Liverpool. This town stands on the eastern banks of the River Mersey. Its situation is low, extending along the shore in oval form. On the north side of the town, the country is a perfect flat for many miles. It is surrounded on the east side by higher lands, gradually rising from the town to about the distance of a mile, forming on the whole a situation extremely pleasant and commodious for trade. Few places enjoy a more healthy climate or happy temperature of heat and cold than Liverpool. It is screened from the severe easterly winds in the winter by the range of high lands on that side and the refreshing sea breezes from the west frequently allay the excessive heats of summer. Snow, which falls here but rarely, seldom lies long, nor indeed anywhere upon the sea coast. Frost is not so intense here as in the inland countries. In the hot and sultry months, it seldom happens that the atmosphere is perfectly calm, the sea affording that perpetual current of air, which is a circumstance of such great importance to the healthfulness of large and populous cities. It must be confessed that the air in general is moister than in more elevated situations, and this humidity of the atmosphere often occasions thick fogs and dry weather in the winter season but it is very serviceable in spring and summer, by affording a degree of moisture proper for vegetation to this sandy soil, which would otherwise quickly suffer by drought. The sea air renders the town so wholesome, that though it is exceeding populous and closely built, epidemical disorders seldom appear, and when they do, are of short duration. The soil in and near Liverpool is dry and sandy for two miles round, the north shore consists of barren sands for an extent of twenty miles, but between the town and Kirkdale is a fine vale which has a rich marl under the surface and affords excellent pasturage. This track of ground was formerly common arable land, but has been many years enclosed. The soil in the neighbourhood of this town is particularly favourable to the growth of potatoes, an article highly useful to the poor, acceptable to the rich, and profitable to the industrious farmer. The cultivation of this excellent root has of late been so much attended to in this county that the husbandman often depends more upon a good crop of potatoes than of wheat or any other grain. The river Mersey, which may more properly be considered as an arm of the sea, is subject to the variations of the tide. In spring tides the water rises about thirty feet, and in neap tides about fifteen feet. The breadth of the river at high water from Seacombe Point to the opposite shore is 1,200 yards. From the Pitch House to Burkitt Point is 1,500 yards. Almost all kinds of fish are here in great plenty. Footnote. See a table of fish taken and sold at Liverpool, with the prices etc. fixed, in Enfield's essay towards the history of Liverpool, page 7. In November 1565 there were in Liverpool only 138 householders and cottages who then employed no more than 11 barks and a boat. The whole bulk amounting to but 223 tons and navigated by 75 seamen. Wallasey had only two barks and a boat carrying but 36 tons and 14 seamen in the whole. About the same time a rate was levied upon the inhabitants by which it appears that only seven streets were inhabited. Towards the close of Queen Elizabeth's reign, Henry, Earl of Derby, going to visit his Isle of Man, 
and waiting some time for a passage at his house in liverpool called the tower the corporation erected and adorned a sumptuous stall or seat for his reception at church where he several times honoured them with his presence the town of liverpool was in sixteen forty four as well as in former periods much indebted to the family of the moors at bank hall particularly for many improvements in its buildings both public and private its ancient charity school was chiefly built and supported by that family and some of the streets derive their name from them the great increase of this town from the beginning of the present century to this time may be in part inferred from the numerous acts of parliament which have been granted for building churches for making convenient docks for their shipping for enlarging and repairing roads etc from these acts we see the speedy progress of population and trade in this flourishing town which has been such as to render it necessary within the space of sixty years to make three spacious docks and to build three large churches the first observation which a stranger makes upon his arrival in liverpool is generally perhaps that the streets are much too narrow either for convenience ornament or health and it must be owned that in the ancient parts of the town little attention has been paid to regularity or elegance and that in general the buildings are so crowded that the inhabitants are much more indebted for their health to nature than to art the number of streets lanes alleys etc is about two hundred and thirty a design has been formed and is now executing of erecting several new streets at the south end of the town under the name of new liverpool but how far the scheme will be accomplished is at present uncertain in seventeen seventy three a survey of the state of population was made in liverpool when the number of families then resident appeared to be eight thousand and two and of inhabitants thirty four thousand four hundred and seven the inhabitants of liverpool live more closely crowded together than in most other towns in northampton the proportion of inhabitants in a house is four and three quarters in birmingham according to an enumeration taken in seventeen seventy it is five and one ninth and in liverpool five and four fifths it is probable there is no place in great britain except london and edinburgh which contains so many inhabitants in so small a compass its whole area including all the docks yards and warehouses is not so large as that of birmingham or manchester yet it has a greater number of inhabitants than either of them the comparative state of liverpool with respect to some other towns whose inhabitants have been numbered or accurately computed may be seen in the following list london six hundred and fifty one thousand five hundred and eighty paris four hundred and eighty thousand berlin one hundred and thirty four thousand amsterdam two hundred thousand liverpool thirty four thousand four hundred and seven birmingham thirty thousand eight hundred and four norwich twenty four thousand five hundred leeds sixteen thousand three hundred and eighty shrewsbury eight thousand one hundred and forty one manchester footnote an enumeration of the number of inhabitants in the town of manchester is now carrying on and it is supposed will prove to be larger than has been late supposed liverpool is one of the wonders of britain because of its prodigious increase of trade and buildings within the compass of a very few years rivalling bristol in the trade to virginia and the english colonies in america they trade also round the whole island send ships to norway to hamburg to the baltic as also to holland and flanders so that they are almost become like the londoners universal merchants the trade of liverpool consists not only in merchandising and correspondences beyond seas but as they import almost all kinds of foreign goods they have consequently a great inland trade and a great correspondence with ireland and scotland for consumption of their goods exactly as it is with bristol and they really divide the trade with bristol upon very remarkable equalities bristol lies upon the irish sea so does liverpool bristol trades chiefly to the south and west parts of ireland from dublin in the east to galway west liverpool has all the trade of the east shore and the north from the harbour of dublin to londonderry 
Bristol has the trade of South Wales, Liverpool great part of that of North Wales. Bristol has the south-west counties of England, and some north of it, as high as Bridgenorth, and perhaps to Shrewsbury. Liverpool has all the northern counties, and a large consumption of goods in Cheshire and Staffordshire are supplied from thence. Though this town chiefly subsists by foreign commerce, and therefore cannot be expected to furnish many materials on the head of manufactures, yet it discovers its spirit of industry and its improving state, in this way as well as many others. English porcelain, in imitation of foreign china, has long been manufactured in this town, and formerly not without success. But of late this branch has been much upon the decline, partly because the Liverpool artists have not kept pace in their improvements with some others in the same way, but chiefly because the Staffordshire ware has had, and still continues to have, so general a demand, as almost to supersede the use of other English porcelain. The several branches of the watch manufactory, and that of fine files, have long been carried on in this town and neighbourhood. A stocking manufactory has within a few years been established, which employs many hands. Two glass houses, the salt works, copperous works, iron works, etc., also employ many hands in their several branches. Sugar baking and refining is a business which, ever since the increase of foreign commerce, has been carried on in this place. There are at present eight sugar houses in which about six thousand hogsheads of sugar are annually refined. Public breweries are exceedingly numerous in Liverpool. The whole number is thirty-six, of which thirty-three are for home consumption and three for exportation. It is commented that nearly fifty thousand hogsheads of ale are brewed in their public breweries annually, of which upwards of forty-seven thousand are for home consumption. There are, in or near the town of Liverpool, twenty-seven windmills, of which sixteen are for grinding corn, one for grinding colours, etc., one for rasping and grinding dyer's wood, and one for raising water at the salt works. To supply the shipping, etc., there are in different parts of the town fifteen roperies. Besides these, there are a variety of mechanical trades carried on in this, as in other large towns. In Liverpool are six churches and nine dissenting meeting houses. Of the churches, the oldest is that of St. Nicholas, commonly called the Old Church. The time when it was built is uncertain. From its Gothic structure, it must, however, be of considerable antiquity. Near it formerly stood a statue of St. Nicholas, to which sailors used to present an offering on their going out to sea. This church affords little matter of curiosity, either to the antiquary or architect. Among the charitable buildings in this town is the Blue Coat Hospital, which made its appearance in the year 1709, where two hundred children are clothed and educated. Here is likewise a public infirmary, first formed and hitherto conducted on the most liberal principles. The exchange is conveniently situated, but there is no point of view from which it may be seen to advantage. It is a handsome edifice, built of stone with two fronts, each of which consists of an elegant range of Corinthian columns, supporting a pediment and supported by a well-proportioned basement. Between the capitals are placed a basso relievo, heads and emblems of commerce. On the pediment of the grand front is a piece of sculpture well executed, which exhibits commerce committing her treasures to the care of Neptune. The custom house is conveniently situated at the east end of the old dock, and is a neat brick building, ornamented at the angles and windows with stone. A small flight of steps in the front leads to an open lobber or piazza, above which is the low room, or chief place for transacting the business of the customs with the other officers. Behind the building is a spacious yard with proper warehouses, except that for India goods, which is complained of as too small for the purpose. There are five public docks, three of which are so constructed with floodgates as to enclose a sufficient depth of water to keep the ships afloat in all times of the tide. 
the other two are called dry docks because the water is not confined in them by floodgates the great advantage of these docks can only be seen by comparing the ease and convenience with which business is done at liverpool with the labour hazard and delay which attend the lading and unlading of goods at london bristol and other great ports which have no such receptacles the boastful length and beauty of yarmouth quay and that of seville in spain are not indeed to be seen at liverpool but the latter gains much more by having no part of its quays very remote from the centre of the town and by affording such an extent of ground on all sides for the reception of goods than the former by their perspective views the theatre royal in williamson square is a large and handsome building elegantly finished both on the outside and within the pediment of the front is enriched with a well-executed piece of sculpture exhibiting the king's arms the house is large and commodious its ornamental architecture and furniture is elegant the stage is spacious and the whole is well constructed for hearing this theatre which was opened in june seventeen seventy two cost nearly six thousand pound and was built by the subscription of thirty gentlemen who received from the managers for their respective shares five per cent and a ticket entitling the bearer to attend every night of performance in any part of the house among the public places the terrace at the south end of town called st james's walk deserves to be particularly mentioned it is upon an agreeable elevation which commands an extensive and noble prospect including the town the river the cheshire land the welsh mountains and the sea it is of a considerable length and much improved by art behind this eminence is a stone quarry which plentifully supplies the town for every purpose of building here labour has exposed to view one continued face of stone three hundred and eighty yards long and in many parts sixteen yards deep the entrance to this quarry is by a subterraneous passage supported by arches and the whole has a pleasing and romantic effect there is found here a good chalybeate water which appears upon trial to be little inferior to many of the spas. Liverpool is a corporate town, governed by a mayor and aldermen, and sends two members to Parliament. The freemen of this town are also free of Bristol and of Waterford and Wexford in Ireland. Here are markets on Wednesdays and Saturdays, which are plentifully supplied and well regulated. Its fairs are held on July 25th and November 11th its streets are tolerably lighted with lamps during the winter season and in general well paved and kept as clean considering the populousness of the place as can be expected i shall conclude this account of liverpool footnote the reader who wishes to be informed of more particulars respecting liverpool than the limits of this work will permit us to give here is recommended to peruse mr enfield's essay mentioned in a preceding note i shall conclude this account of liverpool with observing that the country about it including the southern part of lancashire formerly constituted part of the kingdom of the brigantes according to richard de sirencester a monk of westminster in the time of the heptarchy the country about liverpool was a part of the kingdom of northumberland the river mersey being in the saxon times the boundary of the kingdom of mercia from hence the mersey opening into the irish sea we could see the great and famous road of hoyle lake remarkable for the shipping or rather rendezvous of the army and fleet under king william for the conquest of ireland anno sixteen eighty nine for here the men of war rode as our ships do in the downs till the transports come to them from chester and this town going east we passed by highfield the magnificent house of james kenyon esq and leaving fairfield the residence of john turlington esq on the right we rode through prescott a good market town and came to warrington which is situated upon the river mersey over which is a large stone bridge originally built by the first earl of derby after his marriage with the countess of richmond mother of henry the seventh in order that the king might pass that rapid river with ease in a visit he made to Knowsley, 
where he was received in a stately stone building erected for that purpose. The entrance into Warrington is unpromising. The streets long, narrow, ill-built, and crowded with carts and passengers, but further on they are airy and of good width. They afford a striking mixture of mean buildings and handsome houses, as is the case with most trading towns that experience a sudden rise. Not that this place wants antiquity, for Leland speaks of it as having a better market than Manchester upwards of two hundred years ago. This town contains two churches with a dissenting and a Romish chapel, besides meeting-houses for Quakers, Anabaptists and Methodists. To these buildings may be added a large academy just built for the improvement of youth and preparing them for trade and merchandise. Besides this, there is a charity school where 26 boys are clothed in blue, and their education, with apprentice fees, paid for by a fund left by one Waterson, who got a large fortune by showing for pence a dancing horse. Likewise, an eminent free school, where many boys from London and even the West India plantations are sent for education. The River Mersey runs close by the side of this town, and parts Cheshire from Lancashire in its course to Liverpool, where it enters the sea. Here are caught great quantities of fine salmon and smelts, uncommonly large, which in the spring are sent to London every day by the stages. By means of the Bridgewater New Canal, this river is made navigable up to Manchester, to and from which place much merchandise is carried in barges of about sixty tons burden. On its banks are paper mills, gunpowder mills, and slitting mills. In the town of Warrington and villages around it, sailcloth for the Royal Navy is made to a considerable amount, in which, and other coarse linens, it is computed that the warehousemen of this town employ 12,000 persons. Thread and silk laces are wove in this town, and there are copper works, sugar houses, and glass houses, which furnish the industrious with the means of living comfortably. Pins are here made, and malt, remarkable for furnishing the country around with good ale. Two fairs for all sorts of cattle, woollen manufactures, etc., are annually held, the one beginning on the 18th of July, and the other on St. Andrew's Day. The chief market is on Wednesday, and abounds with corn, cheese, and potatoes, which are here sold in great quantities for exportation. Thomas Patton, Esquire, the proprietor of the copper works, has built at the end of the town in an elegant taste, a stately dwelling house, the foundation of which is made with the dross of copper. Not far from this town is a place called Ravenhill, where John Mackay, Esquire, has large coal works and a plate glass manufactory, employing about 400 men, and it is said that his glass equals what is brought from France. From Warrington we went to view the Bridgewater Navigation of Latchdale, which township is remarkable for the richness of its soil, on which clover and the finest grasses naturally spring. The children there weave bone lace, their mothers spin thread for sailcloths, and their fathers weave it. A new and very elegant church has been just finished here by Mr. Leland, the architect, which has induced many of the dissenters to return to the service of the church. Near Warrington is also a village called Winwick, the rectory of which is in the gift of the Earl of Derby, and yields about £2,500 per annum to the possessor, now the Honourable and Reverend Mr. John Stanley, great-uncle to the Earl of Derby, who is likewise rector of Bury, worth £900. From hence on the road to Manchester, we passed the great bog or waste called Chat Moss, the first of the kind that we saw in England for many of the south parts hither. It extends on the left side of the road ten miles east and west, and they told us it was, in some places, seven or eight miles from north to south. There are many of these mosses in this county. Take this for a description of all the rest. The surface at a distance looks black and dirty, and is indeed frightful to think of, for in some parts it will bear neither horse nor man, unless in an exceeding dry season, and then so as not to be travelled over with safety. The surface seems to be a collection of the small roots of innumerable vegetables matted together, interwoven so thick, as well the larger roots as the smaller fibres, 
that he makes a substance hard enough to cut out into turf or peat, which in some places the people pile up in the sun and dry for their fuel. Under the moss, several large oak, birch and fir trees are found, from whence it is conjectured that here were formerly large woods, which after falling sunk by degrees in the earth. Near this moss are the seats of Charles Pole, Esquire, and four miles further, near to the town of Burton, you have a view of Worsley Hall, the residence of the Duke of Bridgewater. End of part four. Part five of Travels in Lancashire. A description of the county of Lancaster by Daniel Defoe. Part two. From a tour through the island of Great Britain, divided into circuits or journeys. Volume three. Letter four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From hence we came to Manchester, a large and rich trading town superior to most cities for elegance of buildings. It is covered by the ordinary judicatures of a manor, courts leet, and courts baron, but the greatness of the place makes it requisite that the justices should always be sitting in rotation for the regulating disputes and the punishing offenders. On this side and on the north the town is bounded by the high rocky banks of the Irwell and Irk. The former is the principal stream, and receives the latter at the north-west angle of the town. But the mass of buildings extends to the lower ground, lying on the western side of the Irwell, and forming a distinct township, is called Salford, and though it has a separate jurisdiction, and is even the head of the hundred, it is merely a suburb to the town, and stands as the little Southwark of Manchester. Both are connected together by a very firm but ancient stone bridge over the Irwell, which is built exceeding high, because this river, though not great, yet coming from the mountainous part of the country, swells sometimes so suddenly that in one night's time, they told me, the waters would frequently rise four or five yards, and the next day fall as hastily as they rose. The town of Manchester is very ancient. Here was a station in the time of the Romans, which is mentioned by Antoninus, and called Mancunium, the Roman camp was in a field which is now near a mile from the central parts of the town, and is called Castlefield. The rampart is pretty entire all round, and the ditches appear more imperfectly without. The area of the camp is four or five acres, and is called Mancastle, and the site is naturally very defensible, having a high steep bank of the Medlock on the south, and a steeper bank on the west. Many curiosities have been found here a Roman ring of gold, a Saxo-Danish ring of the same metal, having runic and Danish characters inscribed thereon, now in the British Museum, and several Roman coins and inscriptions. The town boasts of four extraordinary foundations, a college, an hospital, a free school, and a library, all well supported. The college was founded by Thomas Lawar, Lord Lawar, who being but the cadet of the family, was bred a scholar, took orders, and became rector of the parish, which he enjoyed many years. But by the decease of his elder brother without heirs, succeeding to his honours and estate, he converted the rectory into a college in 1421. It was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and the two patron saints of France and England, St. Denis and St. George. This foundation, escaping the general ruin under Henry the Eighth was dissolved in 1547, in the first year of King Edward VI. After this it was refounded by Queen Mary, and then anew by Queen Elizabeth, anno 1578, by the name of Christ Church in Manchester. And last of all, it was again refounded by King Charles I, anno 1636, consisting then of one warden, four fellows, two chaplains, four singing men, and four choristers he incorporating them, as they were by Queen Elizabeth, by the name of the Wardens and Fellows of Christ College in Manchester, the statutes for the same being drawn up by the Archbishop Lord. The visitor of the Collegiate Church is the Bishop of Chester, and His Majesty King George I, having made Dr. Peplow Bishop of Chester, 
who at the same time was warden of the church, the visitatorial power and the wardenship being incompatible, an act passed, anno 1729, empowering his majesty to be the visitor, whensoever the warden of Manchester happened to be the Bishop of Chester. The hospital was founded by Humphrey Chetham, Esquire, and incorporated by King Charles II, designed by the said bountiful benefactor for the maintenance of forty poor boys out of the town and parish of Manchester, and some other neighbouring parishes. But it is enlarged since to the number of sixty by the governors of the hospital who have improved the revenues of it. The said founder also erected a very fine and spacious library, which is furnished with a competent stock of choice and valuable books, and daily increasing with the income of a hundred and sixteen pound per annum, settled to buy books for ever, and to afford a competent salary for a library keeper. There is also a large school for the hospital boys, where they are daily instructed and taught to read and write. The most extensive and important branch of the Manchester manufactures is the cotton trade. This is made up into a variety of articles, and has been greatly improved of late by the imitation of the silk manufactories, of Genoa in cotton, and by the invention of velvarettes. Besides the cotton manufactures, the town deals in cheques, the second great article of its commerce, and in small wares, as they are called, which consists of filletings, garterings, tapes, laces, etc., and compose the third great article. The small wares have been lately improved by some inventions adopted from the Dutch, as looms that work twenty-four laces at a time, and several much later, which are kept great secrets by the proprietors, and a silk manufactory has been lately erected, which promises to rival Spitalfields. Vast quantities of these goods are exported abroad to Portugal, Spain and the West Indies. In consequence of this trade, the town has gradually become very large and very populous. Here, as at Liverpool, the town extended in a surprising manner. Neither York, Chester, Gloucester nor Norwich itself can come up to it. And for lesser cities, two or three put together would not equal it, such as Peterborough, Carlisle and Lichfield. A new church dedicated to St Anne was built in a style truly elegant about the year 1723 by voluntary subscription. The choir is alcove fashion, and the pillars painted lapis lazuli colour, and several handsome streets were erected in the neighbourhood of it. But such was the increase of buildings and inhabitants employed in trade and commerce at Manchester, that in a very few years it became much more populous than when the last act was made so that the said two churches could not contain the inhabitants of the said town, professing the doctrine of the Church of England. It was thought necessary, therefore, that one other church should be erected in some convenient place within the said town. Accordingly, a neat church was built in 1754, dedicated to the Virgin Mary. But even these were not sufficient. A new chapel was erected at the other end of town, dedicated to St. Paul in 1765, and another, called St. John's, was built in 1770. From this little account alone we may judge of the increase of the town. In this gay place are people of different religious opinions, Moravians and Methodists, to which may be added a fragment of Roman Catholics, which have just strung up afresh, and assisted by the late Duke of Norfolk, have built themselves a place of worship. The non-jurors have likewise built what they call the primitive church, though it is but a small one. The new-built houses, which are generally constructed, not by undertakers for sale, but by gentlemen for their own use, are built in a place remarkably good, and are superior to most buildings out of London. The town receives great advantages from the Duke of Bridgewater's canal, on which are brought hither timber, corn, lime, stone, coals, and other heavy articles from Liverpool and different parts of Cheshire. By this means trade is carried on at a small expense, the roads saved, and fewer horses kept. The Leeds navigation also extends to Liverpool, and is very advantageous to this town. There are few towns in the kingdom that have such ample and such various sums bequeathed to the poor as Manchester, and the charity, generosity and public spirit of the present inhabitants is very great. Eleven miles from Manchester, north-west, lies Bolton. 
it is and has been long esteemed the great staple of fustians all the branches of the cotton manufactory are carried on here and most of the improvements made in that article originate from this place by an accurate survey taken in 1773 this town was found to contain near 6,000 inhabitants which have considerably increased since that time machines for carding and spinning cotton were first used here and now much facilitate the general manufacture of that article here the old earl of derby was beheaded october fifteenth sixteen fifty one proclaiming king charles the second before we leave these parts it is necessary to subjoin an account of the duke of bridgewater's navigation of such great importance to this county and to england in general with a word or two relative to subsequent attempts to carry on inland navigations in seventeen fifty eight and seventeen fifty nine his grace obtained an act for enabling him to cut a navigable canal from worsley to salford near manchester second to carry the same to or near Holland ferry in the county of lancaster this work was pursuant thereto begun and a navigable canal was made from worsley mill to the public highway leading from manchester to warrington but it being then discovered that the navigation would be more beneficial both to his grace and the public if carried over the river irwell near barton bridge to manchester his grace procured a second act of parliament to vary the course of his canal accordingly and to extend a side branch to longford bridge in stretford the making a navigable canal over the river irwell and filling up the hollow or low ground on the north side of this river were esteemed a very arduous undertaking and by most persons who viewed the chasm thought to be impracticable but his grace being well supplied with materials from his own estate completed this which was looked upon as the most difficult part of his undertaking upon a farther survey and taking levels the duke found it practicable to extend his navigation from longford bridge by dunham to fall into the river mersey at or near a place called the hempstones below bank quay and so as to bring vessels into his canal at the lowest neap tides and having obtained a third act for that purpose undertook it at his own expense without any addition or increase to the two shillings and sixpence per ton given his grace by the former acts great opposition was made by the proprietors of the old navigation on the irwell and mersey but without success and the following account of this great and salutary work was published in seventeen sixty five at worsley mill seven computed miles from manchester is the duke of bridgewater's tunnel a subterraneous navigation that leads to the coal mines the first entrance for one thousand yards is six feet and a half wide seven feet and a half high including the water which is three feet four inches deep it is already continued five hundred yards further ten feet wide the same height in a direct line and will be extended at least a mile and a half more the boats employed therein are forty seven feet long and four feet and a half wide including the gunwales they draw when loaded two feet six or seven inches and carry from seven to eight tons there is a rail on each side by which the boats are pulled along by the hand and being linked together are brought out of the tunnel from six to twenty at a time a boy of seventeen has worked twenty-one which are seven tons each the lowest burthen make a hundred and forty-seven tons they are from thence drawn by mules or horses to manchester and other places generally four or six in a gang there is also a mill that by a small overshot stream turns a wheel eight yards diameter and by that power three pair of stones to grind corn and an apparatus complete to make mortar also portable cranes of an uncommon construction to draw stone out of the quarry with callipers near the same place is found a stratum of the quality of lime which being mixed with clay and formed into bricks is burnt and a very useful mortar is made of it at stretford three miles off is the caisson forty yards long by thirty-two also open bottom boats their use is to discharge their burthens of earth and thereby raise the ground where the level requires it these are always employed in the caissons as the ground they pass over lies above sixteen or eighteen feet below the surface of the canal 
they carry about sixteen or eighteen tons which is with great ease dropped in an instant where wanted at cornbroke three miles further is a circular weir to raise the water of the canal to its proper height the overplus flows over the extreme sides into a well in the nave of the circle and by a subterraneous tunnel is conveyed to its usual channel also a machine to wash the slack worked by water on the side of castlefield is a large wharf and a larger one intended to be in the centre of this field formerly a roman camp there is a large and beautiful weir composed of six segments of a circle the whole circumference of three hundred and sixty six yards which acts by the river medlock in the same manner as that at cornbroke to supply the canal there is a large tunnel in castlefield under the hill in which is a bucket wheel thirty feet circumference and four feet four inches wide to draw up the coals brought in boxes fixed in the boats and contain about eight hundred each and when discharged are landed where the way to manchester is so level that a good horse may easily draw one ton to any part of that town i shall subjoin a still more entertaining account in a letter to a lady of this stupendous undertaking this waits on you with an account of the duke of bridgewater's magnificent work near manchester which is perhaps the greatest artificial curiosity in the world crowds of people from all parts resort to it and persons of high rank express their admiration of it this is a new canal and i know not what to call it besides constructed as it should seem to convey coals out of a mine to manchester and other places but is capable of being applied to more considerable purposes this stupendous work was begun at a place called worsley mill about seven miles from manchester where at the foot of a large mountain the duke has cut a basin capable of holding all his boats and a great body of water which serves as a reservoir or head to his navigation and in order to draw the coals out of the mine which runs through the hill to an amazing extent his grace has cut a subterraneous passage big enough for long flat-bottomed boats to go up to the work and has so preserved the level that a part of the water which drives a mill near the mouth of the passage runs in and stands to the depth of about five feet this passage also serves to drain the coal mines of that water which would otherwise obstruct the work and is to be carried on three miles or more underground having obtained a ticket to see this curiosity which is done by sending your name to a new house which the duke has lately built for his residence at about half a mile distance you enter with lighted candles the subterraneous passage in a boat made for bringing out the coals of this form and dimension fifty feet long four and a half broad two feet three inches deep when you first enter the passage and again when you come among the colliers your heart will be apt to fail you for it seems so much like leaving this world for the regions of darkness that i could think of nothing but those descriptions of the infernal shades which the poets have drawn for ulysses aeneas and your old friend telemachus there is more civility however in this region than homer virgil and fenelon have discovered in theirs for should your spirit sink the company are ever ready to aid you with a glass of wine even charon himself will offer you a cup on the occasion through this passage you proceed towing the boat on each hand by a rail to the extent of one thousand yards that is near three quarters of a mile before you come to the coal works then the passage divides and one branch continues on in a straight line among the coal works three hundred yards further while another turns off and proceeds three hundred yards to the left and each of them may be extended further or other passages to be conveyed from them to any other part as the mines may run and the necessity require hence you will perceive that those who go up both passages travel near three miles underground before they return the passages in those parts where there were coals or loose earth are arched over with brick in others the arch is cut out of the rock at certain distances there are in niches on the side of the arch funnels or openings through the rock to the top of the hill which is in some places near thirty-seven yards perpendicular in order to preserve a free circulation of fresh air 
as well as to prevent those damps and exhalations that are often so destructive in works of this kind, and to let down men to work in case any accident should happen to the passage. Near the entrance of the passage, and again further on, there are gates to close up the arch, and prevent the admission of too much air in tempestuous and windy weather. At the entrance the arch is about six feet wide and about five feet high from the surface of the water, but as you come further in it is wider, and in some places opens so that the boats that are going to and fro can pass each other, and when you come to the pits the arch is ten feet wide. The coals are brought from the pits to this passage or canal in little low wagons that hold near a ton each, and as the work is on the descent are easily pushed by a man on a railed way to a stage over the canal, and then shot into one of the boats already mentioned, each of which holds about eight tons. They then, by means of the rails, are drawn out by one man to a basin at the mouth of the passage, where four, five, or six of them are linked together, and drawn by one horse or two mules by the side of the canal to Manchester or other places where the canal is conveyed. There are also on the canal other broad boats that hold about fifty tons, which are likewise drawn by one horse. Of the small boats there are about fifty employed in the work, and of the large ones a considerable number. Before we quit the coal mines to speak of the open canal and its conveyance, we must take some notice of a mill near the mouth of the passage, and which, through an overshot mill, is so well contrived as to work three pair of grinding stones for corn, a dressing or bolting mill, and a machine for sifting sand and compounding mortar for the buildings. The mortar is made by a large stone which is laid horizontally, and turned by a cogwheel underneath it, and this stone, on which the mortar is laid, turns in its course two other stones that are placed upon it obliquely, and by their weight and friction work the mortar underneath, which is tempered and taken off by a man employed for that purpose. The bolting mill is also worthy notice. It is made of wire of different degrees of fineness, and at one and the same time discharges the finest flour, the middling sort, and the coarse flour, as well as the pollard and the bran, and without turning round, the work being effected by brushes of hog's bristles within the wire. From the basin we have been speaking of, the canal takes its course to Manchester, which is nine miles by water, though but seven by land, the other two miles being lost in seeking a level for the water. The canal is broad enough for the barges to pass, or go abreast, and on one side of it there is a good road made for the passage of the people concerned in the work, and for the horses and mules that draw the boats and barges. To perfect this canal without impeding the public roads or injuring the people in the country, the Duke has in many places built bridges to cross the water, and, where the earth was raised to preserve a level, arches under it, all of which are built chiefly of stone, and are both elegant and durable. At convenient distances there are, by the sides of the canal, receptacles for the superfluous water, and at the bottom of the canal machines constructed on very simple principles, and placed at proper distances to stop and preserve the water, in case any part of the bank should happen to break down. We turned east and came to Bury, a small market town on the River Roch, which is the utmost bound of the cotton manufacture, which flourishes so well at Manchester, etc. And here the woollen manufacture, called half-thicks, friezes and shags, begins, which employs this and all the villages about it. From thence we went to Rochdale, a larger and more populous town than Bury, and of great traffic arising from the manufactory of bays and the other articles worked up at Bury. It lies in a deep and dark bottom, under the hills called Blackstone Edge, which having mentioned at my entrance this way into Yorkshire, I must now go back again to the sea coast, for I took my course that way up to Preston and Lancaster in this journey, having travelled thus far from Liverpool in my former journey to Halifax, etc., but must first observe that there are on this eastern side of the county, northward of Rochdale, the towns of Haslington, Burnley and Colme, where there is a weekly market for shalloons, which lie just under the mountains. And likewise Blackburn, where white cotton is chiefly manufactured for the calico printers, 
and Clitheroe, a little west of them, all which being merely market towns, I shall say no more of them, other than that Clitheroe stands upon the Ribble, is of some note, and sends two members to Parliament, and that at Colne and Burnley have been discovered a great many Roman coins. I take Wigan first, in my way back to the sea coast. It lies on the high post road to Lancaster. This town has a good market and is noted for its manufacture in checks, the cotton manufactory, and likewise for pit coal and iron work. It is twenty measured miles from Manchester. We are now in a country where the roads are paved with small pebbles, for we both walk and ride upon this pavement. The town returns two members to Parliament. It is neat and well built. Between Wigan and Bolton, particularly on the estate of Sir Roger Bradshaw, Bart, is found great plenty of what they call cannel or candle coal, which is superior to what is found in any other part of the globe. By putting a lighted candle to them, they are presently in a flame, and yet hold fire as long as any coals whatever, and burn more or less as they are placed in the grate, flat or edgewise. They are smooth and sleek, when the pieces part from one another, and will polish like alabaster. A lady may take them up in a cambric handkerchief, and they will not soil it, though they are as black as the deepest jet. Footnote. We are told that the Queen was presented with a toilette table, composed of hexagonal pieces of this coal, each piece set in, and the whole bordered with silver, and made a very elegant appearance. They make many curious toys of them, as snuff-boxes, nutmeg-boxes, candlesticks, salts, etc. On the same road, a little south, stands Newton, which had once a market, now disused, though it returns two members to Parliament. It is noted for a charity school founded in 1707 by one Hornby, a yeoman of the place, but more for two great fairs for horned cattle which are brought out of Scotland and the northern parts of England and sold here to the drovers who supply London and the eastern counties. On the second days of these fairs are sold horses, etc. From hence we pass to Ormskirk West, towards the sea coast. It is a market town that has a good inland trade, yet is in a less flourishing condition than any of the rest. We saw nothing remarkable at Ormskirk, but the monuments of some of the ancient family of the Stanleys before they were ennobled. Not far from this town is Latham House, to which belongs a large estate and a fine park. It is noted for having been gallantly defended in the civil wars by Lady Charlotte, Countess of Derby, who held it to the last extremity against the Parliament forces, which could never reduce her to capitulate but kept the place gloriously till she was relieved by Prince Rupert. It was, however, ruined in a second siege, and sold by the family to the late Sir Thomas Bootle, who built a magnificent house there, which is now in the possession of Richard Wilbraham Bootle, Esquire. Formby, a village, lies near the seaside in the marshy grounds where they dig turf, that serves both for fire and candle, these marshy grounds extend a great way north, beyond Eccleston, and almost up to Preston. On the edge of it eastward is Martin Mere, which has been very large, but much of it is now drained. Eccleston is a small town, where nothing remarkable is to be seen, nor at Chorley, a town which lies a little northeast of it. Preston stands next, a corporate mere town, having three weekly markets, well supplied and frequented. It is a large, fine town, situated on the Ribble. It is pretty full of people, but not like Liverpool or Manchester, for now we come beyond the trading part of the county. Footnote. The spectator has long since pointed out the knowledge to be collected from signs. It is impossible not to remark the propriety of the reigning ones of this county. The triple legs and the eagle and child denote the great possessions of the Stanleys in these parts. The bull, the just preeminence of its cattle over other counties, and the royal oak, its distinguished loyalty to its sovereign. I am amazed they do not add the graces, for nowhere can be seen a more numerous race of beauties among that order, who want every advantage to set off their native charms. Footnote. 
Penance Tour in Scotland. It received its first charter from King Henry the Second, but though there is no manufacture except that of linen, the town being honoured with the Court of Chancery and the Officers of Justice for the County Palatine of Lancaster, is full of gentlemen, attorneys, proctors and notaries, the process of law being here of a different nature from that in other places, by reason that it is a duchy and county palatine, and has particular privileges of its own. It sends two members to Parliament. The people are gay here, though not perhaps the richer for that, but it has on this account obtained the name of Proud Preston. Any walks, a little from the town, command one of the most delectable scenes in England. No lover of nature can survey it without transport. The Pretender, in 1745, received the greatest emotions on this enchanting spot. The decisive blow that was given here to the rebellion in 1715 is too well known to be mentioned in this place. The great street is filled with good houses and is very broad. The houses in general are very well built. To this town the gentry resort in winter for many miles around, and here are, during that season, assemblies, balls, etc., in the same manner as at Chester. Not far from Preston is Ribblechester, commonly called Ribchester, supposed to be the Rigodunum of the ancients, a town which, in its flourishing state, was said to have been the richest in Christendom. So many pieces of antiquity have been dug up in its neighbourhood, that it was most probably a place of great importance among the ancient Romans. Between the Ribble and a little river some miles south of Lancashire, the land elbows out in the form of a semicircle into the sea, and this tract they call the File Lands, in which is a small market town called Kirkham, only remarkable for a good free school which has three masters. Poulton is another market town in the same tract, very convenient in its situation for trade, being near the mouth of the river Wyre and the Irish Sea. Here the shore is fine for bathing in the salt water, and very little inferior to Scarborough. From the beach may be seen the Isle of Man. It is frequented by company from distant parts for bathing in the sea, and is a small village three miles north of Lancaster. End of part five. Part six of Travels in Lancashire A description of the County of Lancaster by Daniel Defoe Part three From a Tour through the Island of Great Britain Divided into Circuits or Journeys Volume three Letter four This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. We followed the post-road and passed through Garstang, which stands upon it, about midway between Preston and Lancaster, and is of no other note than having a market, and so leaving Wiresdale Forest on our right, we arrived at Lancaster, the county town, built of stone, and lies on the side of a hill. The castle built by Edward the Third forms one great object, the church another, and far beyond is an arm of the sea, and the lofty mountains of Furness and Cumberland. The town, though not regular, is well built, and contains numbers of very handsome houses. Every stranger must admire the front of Mr. Noble's, faced with stone, naturally figured with views, rivers and mountains. The inhabitants are fortunate in having some very ingenious cabinet makers settled here, who fabricate excellent and neat goods at remarkably cheap rates, which they export to London and the plantations. Mr. Gillow's warehouse of these manufactures merits a visit. It is a town of much commerce, and has fine quays on the River Loon, which brings up ships of 250 tons burthen close to the place. Forty or fifty ships trade from hence directly to Guinea and the West Indies, others to Norway. Besides the cabinet goods, some sailcloth is manufactured here, and great numbers of candles are exported to the West Indies. Much wheat and barley is imported. The Custom House is a small but elegant building, with a portico supported by four ionic pillars, with a beautiful plain pediment. 
Each pillar is fifteen feet and a half high, and consists of a single stone. There is a double flight of steps, and a rustic surbase, and coins, a work that does much credit to Mr. Gillow, the architect. The castle is very entire, has a magnificent front consisting of two angular towers, and a gateway between, and within is a great square tower. The courts of justice are held here, and here are kept the prisoners of the county, in a safe but airy confinement. The church is seated on an eminence near the castle, and commands an extensive and pleasing view. The shambles of this town must not be omitted. They are built in the form of a street at the public expense. Every butcher has his shop, and his name painted over the door. Lancaster was incorporated by King John, and was burnt by the Scots, in a sudden inroad in the year 1322, in the reign of King Edward II. It is governed by a mayor, etc., to whom Edward III granted the privilege, that pleas and sessions in the county should be held nowhere but at Lancaster. It is the Longovicum of the Romans, who had a station here. On the steepest side of the hill below the church hangs a piece of Roman wall, called Wherry Wall, derived, as Camden thinks, from the British word Kerweird, a green city, from the verdure of the hills. Lancaster sends two members to Parliament. We next visited a cavern about five miles from hence, near the road to Kirby Lonsdale, called Donald Millhole, a curiosity, I think, inferior to none of the kind in Derbyshire, which I have also seen. It is on the middle of a large common, and we were led to it by a brook, near as big as the New River, which, after turning a corn mill just at the entrance of the cave, runs in at its mouth by several beautiful cascades, continuing its course two miles under a large mountain, and at last makes its appearance again near Carnford, a village in the road to Kendal. The entrance of this subterraneous channel has something most pleasingly horrible in it. From the mill at the top you descend for about ten yards perpendicular, by means of chinks in the rock and shrubs or trees. The road is then almost parallel to the horizon, leading to the right, a little winding, until you have some hundreds of yards thick of rocks and mineral above you. In this manner we proceeded, sometimes through vaults so capacious we could not see either roof or sides, and sometimes on all four, from its narrowness, still following the brook which entertained us with a sort of harmony well suiting the place, for the different height of its falls were as so many keys of music, which all being conveyed to us by the amazing echo, greatly added to the majestic horror which surrounded us. In our return we were more particular in our observations. The lakes, formed by the brook in the hollow parts of the caverns, realised the fabulous sticks, and the murmuring falls from one rock to another broke the rays of our candles, so as to form the most romantic vibrations and appearances upon the variegated roof. The sides, too, are not less remarkable for fine colouring. The damps, the creeping vegetables, and the seams in the marble and limestone parts of the rocks make as many tints as are seen in the rainbow, and are covered with a perpetual varnish from the just weeping springs that trickle from the roof. The curious in grottoes, cascades, etc., might here obtain a just taste of nature. When we arrived at the mouth, and once more hailed all cheering daylight, I could not but admire the uncouth manner in which nature has thrown together those huge rocks which compose the arch over the entrance. But as if conscious of its rudeness, she has clothed it with trees and shrubs of the most various and beautiful verdure, which bend downwards and with their leaves cover all the rugged parts of the rock. Not far from Lancaster at the foot of an high hill called Wharton Crag, on the top of which was formerly a beacon, stands an agreeable little obscure town named Wharton, upon the side of a lake, where is a good grammar school, with accommodations and a library for the benefit of the masters, which together with an hospital for six poor men, was founded and endowed by Dr. Hutton, then Bishop of Durham, in 1594, who was afterwards translated to York, which certainly must have been then a sea of very great value, to have induced him to quit Durham for it notwithstanding its being an archbishopric, and the title of grace annexed to its prelate. Here is also a very neat-built church. 
higher up north towards the extremity of the county next westmoreland is hornby castle upon the river lon which is an excellent building the seat of the lords monteagle a branch of the stanleys and since of the parkers one of whom marrying into that family had in king james the first time the same title conferred upon him and it was this nobleman who discovered the powder plot this is now in the possession of mr charteris heir to the late colonel charteris who left his estate to his second grandson the castle is built on the summit of the hill and the ground falls away so suddenly on every side that there is not the least flat about the building this part of the county seemed very strange and dismal to us nothing but mountains in view and stone walls for hedges oatcakes for bread or clapped bread as it is called after coming from the south side which is so rich and fertile that it is noted for showing the largest breed of cows and oxen in the kingdom whose bulk as well as horns are of such a magnitude as is very astonishing besides their fine spotted deer which are said to be peculiar to that part of the county they burn turf in this part of the county which made us smell a town at a great distance here among the mountains our curiosity was frequently moved to inquire what high hill this was or that and we soon were saluted with that old verse in camden ingleborough pendle hill and penny ghent are the biggest hills between scotland and trent indeed they were all in my judgment of a stupendous height but in a country all mountainous and full of high hills it was not easy for a traveller to judge which was the highest as these hills were lofty so they had an aspect of terror here were no rich pleasant valleys between them as among the alps no coal pits as in the hills about halifax but all barren and wild and of no use either to man or beast but what renders these hills the more horrible is that when great rains fall in the winter the water brings down such quantities of large pebbles as to fill the lower grounds with them where they lie in the hollow places many feet deep of ingleborough hill we shall subjoin the following account from a late traveller in those parts ingleborough is in the west riding of yorkshire the westerly and northerly part of it lies in the parish of bentham the easterly in the parish of horton in ribbledale the southerly in the parish of clapham it is a mountain singularly eminent whether you regard its height or the immense base upon which it stands it is near twenty miles in circumference and has clapham a church town to the south ingleton to the west chapel in the dale to the north and selside a small hamlet to the east from each of which places the rise in some parts is even and gradual in others rugged and perpendicular in this mountain rise considerable streams which at length fall into the irish sea the land round the bottom is fine fruitful pasture interspersed with many acres of limestone rocks as you ascend the mountain the land is more barren and under the surface is peat moss in many places two or three yards deep which the country people cut up and dry for burning instead of coal as the mountain rises it becomes more rugged and perpendicular and is at length so steep that it cannot be ascended without great difficulty and in some places not at all in many parts there are fine quarries of slate which the neighbouring inhabitants use to cover their houses there are also many loose stones but none of lime yet near the base none but limestones are to be found the loose stones near the summits the people call greet stone the foot of the mountain abounds with fine springs on every side and on the west there is a very remarkable one near the summit the top is very level but so dry and barren that it affords little grass the rock being but barely covered with earth it is said to be about a mile in circumference and several persons now living say that they have seen races upon it upon that part of the top facing lancaster and the irish sea there are still to be seen the dimensions of an house and the remains of what the country people call a beacon which served in old time as old people tell us to alarm the country upon the approach of an enemy a person being always kept there upon watch in the time of war who was to give notice in the night by fire to other watchmen placed upon other mountains within view of which there are many particularly wernside wofall camfell penny ghent and pennell hill 
there are likewise discoverable a great many other mountains in westmoreland and cumberland besides the town of lancaster from which it is distant about twenty miles the west and north sides are most steep and rocky there is one part to the south where you may ascend on horseback but whether the work of nature or art i cannot say a part of the mountain juts out to the northeast near a mile but somewhat below the summit this part is called park fell another part juts out in the same manner near a mile towards the east and is called simon fell there is likewise another part towards the south called little ingleborough the summits of all which are much lower than the top of the mountain itself the springs towards the east all come together and fall into one of the holes called allen pot and after passing under the earth about a mile they burst out again and flow into the river ribble whose head or spring is but a little further up the valley west of hornby castle is a considerable tract of ground which is part of this county and runs north parallel with the west side of westmoreland and on the east of cumberland on the south it runs out in a promontory into the sea and is called furness the approach to it from lancaster has always been considered as dangerous but it is less so now than formerly the sands being more solid and in company with the guides few accidents happen from the lancaster shore at hurst bank to cartmel shore the sands are nine miles over the river ken has its channel on these sands and a guide on horseback is always waiting to conduct travellers over at the stated hours footnote west's antiquities of furness quarto seventeen seventy four it contains besides villages four market towns cartmel dalton ulverston and hawkshead cartmel is a small town with most irregular streets lying in a vale surrounded by high hills the church is large and in the form of a cross the steeple is most singular the tower being a square within a square the upper part set diagonally within the lower the inside of the church is handsome and spacious the centre supported by four large and fine clustered pillars the west part more modern than the rest and the pillars octagonal the choir is beautiful surrounded with stalls whose tops and pillars are finely carved with foliage and with the instruments of the passion above dalton is likewise a small town the castle is ancient and in it are kept the records and prisoners for debt in the liberty of furness ulverston is seated near the waterside and is approachable at high water by vessels of a hundred and fifty tons it has a trade in iron ore pig and bar iron limestone oats and barley and much beans which last are sent to liverpool for the food of the poor enslaved negroes in the guinea trade numbers of cattle are sold out of the neighbourhood but the commerce in general declines at present there are not above sixty vessels belonging to the place formerly about a hundred and fifty mostly let out to freight but both master and sailors go now to liverpool for employ quantities of potatoes are raised here and such is the increase that four hundred and fifty bushels have been got from a single acre of ground furnaces abound in the neighbourhood of this place where various sorts of implements of husbandry are made from hence we travelled along a narrow glen on excellent roads amidst thick coppices or brushwood of various sorts of trees many of them planted particularly for the use of the furnaces they consist chiefly of birch and hazel not many years ago ships loaded with nuts were exported from hence the woods are great ornaments to the country for they creep high up the hills the owners cut them down in equal portions in the rotation of sixteen years and raise regular revenues out of them and often superior to the rent of their land for freeholders of fifteen pound or twenty pound per annum are known to make constantly sixty pound a year from their woods the furnaces for these last sixty years have brought a great deal of wealth into this country from hence we reached the small town of hawkshead which is seated in a fertile bottom but contains nothing remarkable this county is very mountainous and full of lakes or meres the largest is windermere which makes the most northern bound of this tract of ground and of this shire it is famous for producing the char fish which as a dainty is potted and sent far and near by way of present i shall conclude this account of furness with the description of windermere 
as I find it among the observations of a modern traveller. Footnote. Hutchinson's excursions to the lakes in Westmoreland and Cumberland. The owner of the White Lion Inn at Bowness has a boat on the lake with which we were accommodated. This lake is very different from those of Cumberland, being in length about twelve computed miles, and not a mile in width in the broadest part. The hills seen around the lake, except those above Ambleside, are humble, the margin of the water is irregular and indented, and everywhere composed of cultivated lands, woods and pastures, which descend with an easy fall down to the lake, forming a multitude of bays and promontories, and giving it the appearance of a large river. In the narrowest parts, not unlike the Thames below Richmond, on that part where Furness Fell forms the shore, the scene is more rude and romantic. The western side of this lake is in Lancashire, the eastern in Westmoreland. As we sailed down from Bowness, we had two views which comprehended all the beauties of the lake. We rested upon the oars in a situation where, looking down the lake, we took in the prospect, the greatest extent of water. The shore was indented by woody promontories, which shot into the lake on each side to a considerable distance. To the right were the hills of Furness Fell, which are the highest that arise immediately from the water, consisting chiefly of rocks, which, though not rugged and deformed, have their peculiar beauty, being scattered over with trees and shrubs, each growing separate and distant. The brow of this rock overlooks a pretty peninsula on which the ferry-boat house stands, concealing its white front in a grove of sycamores. Whilst we were looking on it, the boat was upon its way, with several horse-passengers, which greatly graced the scene. To the left, a small island, of a circular form, lay covered with a thicket of ash and birch-wood, beyond which the hills that arose from the lake in gentle ascents to the right were covered with rich herbage and irregular groves. On the left side of the lake, enclosures of meadow sweeping gently away from the water lay bounded by a vast tract of woods, and overtopped with hills of moorish ground and heath. The most distant heights which formed the background were fringed with groves, over which they lifted their brown eminences in various shapes. Upwards on the lake we looked on a large island of about thirty acres of meagre pasture ground in an irregular oblong figure. Here and there some misshapen oak trees bend their crooked branches on the sandy brinks, and one little grove of sycamores shelters a cottage. The few natural beauties of this island are wounded and distorted by some ugly rows of firs set in right lines, and by the works now carrying on by Mr. English, the proprietor, who is laying out gardens on a square plan, building fruit walls, and preparing to erect a mansion-house. The want of taste is a misfortune too often attending the architect. The romantic sight of this place on so noble a lake and surrounded with such scenes requires the finest imagination and most finished judgment to design the plan of an edifice and pleasure-grounds. But instead of that, to see a Dutch burgomaster's palace arise, and a cabbage garth extend its bosom to the east, squared and cut out at right angles, is so offensive to the traveller's eye that he turns away in disgust. I would overlook this misshapen object whilst I view the lake upwards with its environs, the beautiful crags of Furness Fell, over which trees are dispersed in an agreeable wildness, form the front ground on the left, and by their projection cover the hills which are further advanced towards the head of the lake, which makes a curve bearing from the eye. Three small woody islands of a fine circular figure, swelling to a crown in their centres, arise from out the lake, and with the deep verdure of their trees give an agreeable taint to the azure hue the water received from reflection of the serene sky above. Over an expanse of water, in length six miles and near a mile in breadth, shining and bright as a mirror, we viewed the agreeable variety of the adjacent country. To the right, woodlands and meadows, in many little peninsulas and promontories, descended with easy slopes to the brink of the lake, where Bowness Church and its cottages arose above the trees, beyond which laid the seat of Fletcher Fleming Esquire, situate on the brink of the lake, and covered on every side with rich woodland. Further were cots and villages dispersed on the rising ground. In front stood Ambleside, 
and at the opening of the deep vale of Rydale, the house of Sir Michael Fleming, shielded on either hand by a wing of hanging forests, climbing up the steeps of the mountains. The nearest background to the right is composed of an eminence called Orest Head, rising gradually to a point and cultivated to its crown, which sweet mount is contrasted by the vicinage of the crags of Biscuit Ho, which overtop the extensive woodlands of Mr. Fleming. Then Troutbeck Parks arrive, where the hills begin to increase in magnitude and form the range of mountains which are extended to Keswick, diversified with pasturage, dells and cliffs, looking over which Langdon Pikes, three mountains rising in perfect cones, extend their heads, surmounted only by the rocky and barren brow of Kirsten Fell, whose cliffs overlook the whole. The Lake of Windermere differs very much from those of Ullswater and Keswick. Here almost every object in view on the whole lake confesses cultivation. The islands are numerous, but small and woody, and rather bear a resemblance to the artificial circles raised on gentlemen's ponds for their swans. The great island is little better than a bank of sand, and is now under the despoiling hand of a deformer. The innumerable promontories are composed of fine meadow ground and ranges of trees. The hills, except Furness Fell and those above Ambleside, are tame, and on every hand a vast expanse of woodland is stretched upon the view. The paintings of Poussin describe the nobleness of Ullswater. The works of Salvatore Rosa express the romantic and rocky scenes of Keswick, and the tender and elegant touches of Claude Lorraine and Smith pencil forth the rich variety of Windermere. The greatest depth of Windermere, we were told, was not more than forty fathom. The water abounds in pike, trout, char, eels and perch. The lake, whilst we visited it, was covered with the boats of fishing parties, it being customary for the country people, after their hay harvest, to make their days of jubilee in that diversion. Between Hornby Castle and Kirby Lonsdale, at a small distance from the public road, stands Overborough, the seat of Robert Fenwick, Esquire, which was a famous station of Antoninus, called Bremerton Acum. The military way is still to be traced from Ribchester, the Rigodunum, or Cochium, of the ancients, to Bremerton Acum, or Overborough. The house is built of stone, and has a regular handsome front to the road from London. The park is enclosed with a stone wall, and there are some noble plantations made by the possessor, which are in as flourishing a condition as any in the kingdom. Lancashire, as hath been said, is a county palatine, and its principal town gave title of duke to a branch of the royal family. Until the two roses, the white and the red, were united by the marriage of Henry the Seventh of the Lancaster line, with Elizabeth, heiress of the House of York, these two branches, by their different pretensions to the crown, gave occasion to the wars and confusions which for many years made England a scene of blood and desolation. Three successive princes, Henry the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth, were of the Lancaster line, and the latter lost his crown and his life, as did the princely son to Edward the Fourth of the House of York, whose two sons being murdered by their uncle Richard the Third, and he himself killed at Bosworth Field, the Lancaster line was again restored in Henry the Seventh. There are not above seventy parishes in this extensive county. Consequently, many of them are very large, insomuch that there are above a hundred and twenty chapels of ease, no less than sixteen of which are in one parish. End of part six. Part seven of Travels in Lancashire. Mount Pleasant, a descriptive poem by William Roscoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The following poem was written some years ago, at a very early period of my life, without the least intention of publication. It is not, however, by way of an apology that this circumstance is mentioned, the author being fully convinced that an excuse for obtruding a new publication on the world is always superfluous, a good one being in no need of it, and an indifferent one receiving no addition to its value, from any circumstance that can be alleged in its favour. 
Liverpool, 16th of January, 1777. Mount Pleasant, an agreeable eminence near Liverpool, which commands the prospect described in the following poem. Freed from the cares that daily throng my breast, again beneath my native shades I rest. These shades, where lightly fled my youthful day, ere fancy bowed to reason's boasted sway. Untaught the toils of busier life to bear, the fool's impertinence, the proud man's sneer. Sick of the world, to these retreats I fly, devoid of art my early reed to try. To paint the prospects which around me rise, what time the cloudless sun descends the skies, each latent beauty of the landscape trace, fond of the charms that deck my native place. The shades of Grongar bloom, secure of fame, Edge Hill to Jago owes its lasting name. When winds of forests lovelier scenes decay, still shall they live in Pope's unrivalled lay. Led on by hope, an equal theme I choose, Oh, might the subject boast an equal muse! Then should her name the force of time defy, When sunk in ruin Liverpool shall lie. How numerous now her thronging buildings rise! What varied objects strike the wandering eyes! Where rise yon mass her crowded navies ride, And the broad rampire checks the beating tide! Along the speech her spacious streets extend, Her areas open and her spires ascend, in loud confusion mingled sounds arise, the docks re-echoing with the seamen's cries, the massy hammer sounding from afar, the bells slow tolling and the rattling car, and thundering oft the cannon's horrid roar, in lessening echoes dies along the shore. There, with the genuine glow of commerce fired, her anxious votaries plod the streets untired, each calm sequestered scene of life despise, and all those sweets the vacant hour supplies. When wearied study slacks her rigid rein, and scarce one loitering thought disturbs the brain, lost to those arts the happier few admire, the painter's pencil and the poet's lyre. The soft emotions, gentler bosoms move, the voice of friendship and the smiles of love, to all that soothes the painful hour of strife, to all that graces, all that sweetens life ah why ye sons of wealth with ceaseless toil add gold to gold and swell the shining pile your general course to happiness ye bend why then to gain the means neglect the end to purchase peace requires a scanty store oh spurn the grovelling wish that pants for more and thirst not with the same unconquered rage till nature whitens in the frost of age but rather on the present hour rely, and catch the happier moments ere they fly, and whilst the spring of life each bliss inspires, improve its gifts and feed the social fires. Let friendship soften, love her charms disclose, peace guard your hours and sweeten your repose. Yet not regardless how your joys endure, let watchful prudence make those joys secure far as the eye can trace the prospect round the splendid tracks of opulence are found yet scarce an hundred annual rounds have run since first the fabric of this power begun his noble waves inglorious mersey rolled nor felt those waves by labouring art controlled along his side a few small cots were spread his finny brood their humble tenants fed at opening dawn with fraudful nets supplied the paddling skiff would brave his spacious tide, ply round the shores, nor tempt the dangerous main, but seek ere night the friendly port again. Now, o'er the wandering world her name resounds, from northern climes to India's distant bounds, where airy shores the broad Atlantic laves, where'er the Baltic rolls his wintry waves, where'er the honoured flood extends his tide, that clasps Sicilia like a favoured bride, whose waves in ages past so oft have bore the storm of battle on the Punic shore, have washed the banks of Greece's learned bowers, and viewed at distance Rome's imperial towers. In every clime her prosperous fleets are known, she makes the wealth of every clime her own, 
greenland for her its bulky whale resigns and temperate gallia rears her generous vines midst warm iberia citron orchards blow and the ripe fruitage bends the labouring bough the occident a richer tribute yields far different produce swells their cultured fields hence the strong cordial that inflames the brain the honeyed sweetness of the juicy cane the vegetative fleece the asia dye and every product of a warmer sky there afric's swarthy sons their toils repeat beneath the fervours of the noontide heat torn from each joy that crowned their native soil no sweet reflections mitigate their toil from morn to eve by rigorous hands oppressed dull fly their hours of every hope unblessed till broke with labour helpless and forlorn from their weak grasp the lingering morsel torn the reed-built hovels friendly shade denied the jest of folly and the scorn of pride drooping beneath meridian suns they lie lift the faint head and bend the imploring eye till death in kindness from the tortured breast calls the free spirit to the realms of rest shame to mankind but shame to britons most who all the sweets of liberty can boast deaf to every human claim deny that bliss to others which themselves enjoy life's bitter draught with harsher bitter fill blast every joy and add to every ill the trembling limbs with galling iron bind nor loose the heavier bondage of the mind yet whence these horrors this inhuman rage that brands with blackest infamy the age is it our various interests disagree and britain sinks if afric's sons be free no hence a few superfluous stores we claim that tempt our avarice but increase our shame the sickly palate touch with more delight or swell the senseless riot of the night blessed were the days ere foreign climes were known our wants contracted and our wealth our own when health could crown and innocence endear the temperate meal that cost no eye a tear our drink the beverage of the crystal flood not madly purchased by a brother's blood ere the wide spreading ills of trade began or luxury trampled on the rights of man when commerce yet an infant raised her head twas mutual want her growing empire spread those mutual wants a distant realm supplied and like advantage every clime enjoyed distrustless then of every treacherous view an open welcome met the stranger crew and whilst the whitening fleet approached to land the wondering natives hailed them from the strand fearless to meet amidst the flow of soul the lurking dagger or the poisoned bowl now more destructive than a blighting storm a bloated monster commerce rears her form throws the meek olive from her daring hand grasps the red sword and whirls the flaming brand true to no faith by no restraints controlled by guilt made cautious and by avarice bold each feature reddens with the tinge of shame whilst patna's plain and buxar's fields i name how droops bengal beneath oppression's reign how groans arissa with the weight of slain to glut her rage what thousands here have bled what thrones are vacant and what princes dead in vain may war's relenting fury spare attendant famine follows in the rear and the poor natives but survive to know the lingering horrors of severer woe can this be she who promised once to bind in leagues of strictest amity mankind this fiend whose breath inflames the spark of strife and pays with trivial toys the price of life as some industrious man whose prudent mind to business is in earlier years inclined with ceaseless steps the road of wealth pursues bounds there his wish and centres all his views till satiate with success he quits the chase and sighs for happier hours of rest and peace feels avarice in his softening breast decay and nobler passions in their turns bear sway feels genuine taste by weeds obscured too long spring in the mind and boast a bloom more strong so rose the pride of mersey's spacious stream repose her scorn and riches all her aim 
till grown at length by long attention great the arts have chosen here their blessed retreat at their approach see gothic taste retire and true proportion raise the graceful spire mould the proud column swell the spacious dome to grecia's genius give the strength of rome the marble see with mimic nature warm spring into life and beam with every charm o'er the smooth canvas mingling colours flow the features open and the landscape glow reviving science opes her latent minds the judgment ripens and the thought refines and here <clears throat> with genius all his own new tracks explores and arts before unknown oh formed in every varied scene to please with manly sense endued and native ease with eloquence to still the listening throng fix every eye and silence every tongue save when attention overflows its bound and the still murmur of applause goes round the muses too their kindling influence bring wake the sweet lute and strike the sounding string and whilst they rove on mersey's favoured side smooth rolls the stream and prouder swells the tide tis theirs the chains of avarice to unbind pour softer manners on the tentive mind to bid the bosom gentler passions prove the friends of virtue and the friends of love here safely planted deep they strike the root and generous candour guards the infant shoot to tempt their stay and win their lasting smile the friends of genius raised yon spacious pile there whilst cold precepts ineffectual prove the great example never fails to move as differing feelings different scenes supply we drop in anguish or we swell with joy now soothed to love we own the softening flame now powerful horrors rush through all our frame the strong delusions lead the struggling will the nerveless captive of the poet's skill if frowning satire opens all her rage and drags the prosperous villain on the stage or if with nicer skill she aims the dart to wound the smaller foibles of the heart bids self-applause her favourite mirror quit and wakes in virtue's cause the powers of wit if on the stage the comic muse be seen with broader smile and more neglected mien through every part some useful lessons shine some latent moral lies in every line the varied scenes to one great purpose tend to raise the genius and the heart to mend sweep the light strings and louder swell the lyre far nobler themes a nobler song require the heaven-born virtues come a lovely train they prompt the verse be theirs the votive strain not those that seek in lonely shades to dwell the selfish inmates of the hermit's cell like his pale lamp a partial light supply unblessed to live and unregarded die but those designed to soothe the labouring breast protect the weak and give the weary rest assuage the rigours of corporeal pain supply the poor and loose the prisoner's chain and like the radiance of the solar ray on all around to pour impartial day known by the watery lustre of her eye her sorrowing smile and sympathising sigh see tender pity comes at her control drops the big tear and melts the stubborn soul so the rude rock by power divine impelled gushed forth in streams and cheered the thirsty field next charity by no proud pageants known nor crown nor sweeping train nor asia's own if chance remembrance wakes the generous deed no pride elates her and she claims no meed and timorous ever of the vulgar gaze she loves the action but disclaims the praise yet not of virtue's open cause afraid where public blessings ask her public aid she shines superior to the wretch's sneer and bold in conscious honour knows no fear hence rose yon pile where sickness finds relief where lenient care allays the weight of grief yon calm retreat yon spacious roof where hushed in calm repose the drooping widow half forgets her woes yon calm retreat where screened from every ill the helpless orphan's throbbing heart lies still and finds delighted in the peaceful dome 
a better parent and a happier home far to the right where mersey duteous pours to the broad main his tributary stores tinged with the radiance of the golden beam sparkle the quivering waves and midst the gleam in different hues as sweeps the changeful ray pacific fleets their guiltless pomp display fair to the fight they spread the floating sail catch the light breeze and skim before the gale till lessening gradual on the stretching view obscure they mingle in the distant blue where in soft tints the sky with ocean blends and on the weakened sight the long long prospect ends where wild tornadoes sweep along the sky and o'er the climate gleamy lightnings fly where poisonous groves exhale their noxious breath and crested serpents swell with secret death or where bleak hills perpetual snow sustain and the faint sun scarce liquidates the main for these dread climes their native shores they leave and dare the secret rock a maddening wave those native shores their eyes no more may view if big with horror angry fate pursue though now in grim repose the tempests steep soon may they howl along the shivering deep dash the proud vessel o'er the blackened brine crush the strong mast and break the friendly line till on the beach an hapless wreck she lies and human savages secure the prize stab the faint wretch if any such remain explore the bark and share the glittering gain but should kind heaven her course in safety keep calm the strong gale and still the boiling deep then midst the friendly port with joyful pride laden with western riches shall she ride and commerce smiling on the busy strand shall fondly hail her favourite sons to land yet lovelier scenes the varied prospect cheer where cestrious plains in long extent appear there shine the yellow fields with corn o'erspread there lifts britannia's oak its towering head swells the brown hill the sloping vales retire and o'er the woodland peeps the rural spire above the rest the cambrian mountains rise close the long view and mingle with the skies can gallia's vine-crowned hills with these compare though there the peasant breathes a milder air or can iberia's loveliest landscape show so rich a prospect or so bright a glow there suns all sultry parch the cracking soil the hardening meadow mocks the peasant's toil the spirits droop beneath the noontide blaze and all the roseate bloom of health decays but here she loves her choicest gifts to pour breathes in each gale and melts in every shower sheds joy and gladness o'er the temperate plain and crowns the cottage of the labouring swain midst the thronged vale as she imparts her smile care smooths her front and labour scorns his toil and love his dewy locks with roses bound trips o'er the lawn and meditates the wound at distance far from frowns tyrannic fled here sacred freedom rears her awful head queen of each liberal art oh may thy smile still bless britannia's ever grateful isle soon shall proud greece her envied name resign and future poets patriots heroes shine then shall the muse expand a stronger wing and other miltons strike the sounding string to future ages give the warrior's name whose breast expansive owned thy generous flame who at thy sacred shrine resigned his breath and sternly grasped thy lovely form in death far on the view at softened distance seen whilst rolls the stream its copious waves between there long deserted by the sable band a lonely abbey glooms upon the strand when once the towering arch in gothic state rose high and frowned recluse the iron grate but shook by time the lofty columns fall the wide roof drops and sinks the mouldering wall the hollow gale through every cavern flies and the dull owl repeats her midnight cries here superstition once assumed her reign religion sickened in her weighty chain and all obscured beneath the dreary gloom the social graces lost their lovely bloom 
no casual virtue marked the passing day whilst slept the monks the circling years away dead to those nobler passions whence proceed the liberal sentiment and generous deed that prompt to general good the selfish mind and wake the ardent wish to bless mankind the ills of life no longer claimed a care but every virtue centred in a prayer so stands some lake amidst the sheltering vale its waves unruffled by the rising gale on the green surge a poisonous insects found and putrid vapours spread black mists around while the clear rill gives sweetness as it flows to every flower that on its margin grows ah brand them not in one promiscuous throng thus candour would restrain the rigid song for some perhaps amidst the numerous crew a nobler motive to the mansion drew long travelled through the thorny paths of life long labouring to maintain the unequal strife to misery lent the little fortune gave the storm approaching and no friend to save or from each fond connection early torn abandoned hopeless destitute forlorn to every thought of earthly pleasure dead some sorrower here might rest his weary head and oft as kindred woes approached his ear bestow the secret tribute of a tear or from these varying scenes avert his eyes scorn every transient ill and gain the skies till o'er his path hope beamed her brightest ray and peace celestial strewed with flowers the way now sober evening wet with pearly dews slow o'er the mead the lingering gleam pursues a pleasing stillness through the air extends save when the murmur from the town ascends or when at intervals the red breast throat pours the clear warblings of his closing note which floating pensive on the breathing wind leaves soft impressions on the vacant mind o oh, still at evening's milder hour be mine to trace with raptured eye the dear decline catch the pure gale as from the main it springs salubrious freshness dropping from its wings then cares forgot and sorrow soothed to rest each ruder passion banished from the breast mild as the hour and cloudless as the skies the mind on strong opinions loves to rise and loosened from the dull restraints of day expansive gives the springs of thought to play bold active vigorous through the enfranchised soul the nobler train of fair ideas roll the ardent glow that wakes at friendship's name the thirst of science and the patriot's flame the generous fear the wounds the youthful breast to live inglorious and to die unblest a liberal scorn of every low desire of all that knaves pursue and fools admire o oh, fortune's stores of splendour's sickly blaze precarious bliss and unsubstantial praise now wrapped beneath the deepening gloom of night fades the grey prospect on the glimmering sight thus in the round of time's unchecked career day follows day and year succeeds to year and changeful ever as the circle flies as empires fall successive empires rise what now remains of tyre's imperial pride where float the fleets that crowned her constant tide that midst her echoing ports their sails unfurled braved the wide seas and searched each distant world not her broad base of glory could withstand the conquering force of time's destructive hand and though on fortune's swelling tide borne high no dangers threaten and no fears annoy the time may come o oh distant be the year when desolation spreads her empire here when trades uncertain triumph shall be o'er and the wave roll neglected on the shore returning verdure clothe the pathless plain and not one trace of former pride remain yet even then when all her splendour fled this mart of nations shall decline her head when dark oblivion fails this faint essay the short-lived offspring of a vernal day her name in time's perennial lists enrolled shall rank with those which commerce loved of old 
and teach mankind how vain the pride that springs from the short glory of terrestrial things footnotes to tempt their stay and win their lasting smile the friends of genius raised yon spacious pile the theatre royal erected by subscription hence rose yon pile where sickness finds relief where lenient care allays the weight of grief the public infirmary yon spacious roof where hushed in calm repose the drooping widow half forgets her woes the almshouses adjoining the infirmary yon calm retreat where screened from every ill the helpless orphan's throbbing heart lies still the blue coat hospital there long deserted by the sable band a lonely abbey glooms upon the strand the abbey or priory of birkenhead or burkett built on the opposite shore of the river mersey in the reign of henry the second end of part seven part eight of travels in lancashire liverpool by robert layton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Liverpool In Liverpool, the good old town, we miss the grand old relics of a reverend past. Cathedrals, shrines that pilgrims come to kiss, walls wrinkled by the blast. Some crypt or keep, historically dear, you find, go where you will, all England through. But what have we to venerate, all here ridiculously new? we have our castle street but castle none red cross street but its legend who can learn old hall street too we have the old hall gone tithe barn street but no barn huge warehouses for cotton rice and corn tea and tobacco log and other woods oils tallow hides that smell so foully foreign yea all things known as goods these we can show but nothing to restore the spirit of old times save here and there an ancient mansion with palatial door in some degenerate square then rise the merchant princes of old days their silken dames their skippers from the strand who brought their sea-born riches not always quite free from contraband and these their mansions to base uses come harbours for fallen fair ones drifting tars some manufactories of blacking some tobacco and cigars we have a church that one almost reveres st nicholas nodding by the riverside in old times hailed by ancient mariners that came up with the tide and there's st peter's too not quite so frail yet old enough for antiquated thoughts ah many a time i lean against the rail to hear its sweet cracked notes for when the sun has clomb the middle sky and wandered down the short hour after noon then to the heedless world that hurries by the clock bells clink a tune they give us home sweet home in plaintive key and in its turn breaks out the scolding wife to show that home however sweet it be is not yet free from strife but sometimes old lang syne comes clinking forth and surely every listening heart is charmed for what are even the sorrows of the earth when past they are transformed yet all is so ridiculously new except perhaps the river and the sky the waters and the immemorial blue for ever sailing by ay they are old but new as well as old for old and new are just the same sky dream one metal in a slightly different mould the same refiltered stream end of part eight part nine of travels in lancashire the mersey and the irwell by bessie rayner parks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mersey and the irwell 
suggested by a very curious and interesting model of the little town of liverpool as it existed in the earlier part of the last century a century since the mersey flowed unburdened to the sea in the blue air no smoky cloud hung over wood and lea where the old church with the fretted tower had a hamlet round its knee and all along the eastern way the sheep fed on the track the grass grew quietly all the day only the rooks were black and the peddler frightened the lambs at play with his knapsack on his back where blended irk and irwell streamed while britons pitched the tents where legionary helmets gleamed and norman bows were bent an ancient shrine was once esteemed where pilgrims daily went a century since the peddler still somewhat of this might know might see the weekly markets fill and the people ebb and flow beneath st mary's on the hill a hundred years ago since then a vast and filmy veil is o'er the landscape drawn through which the sunset's hues look pale and grey the roseate dawn and the fair face of hill and dale is apt to seem forlorn smoke rising from a thousand fires hides all that passed from view vainly the prophet's heart aspires it hides the future too and the england of our slow-paced sires is thought upon by few yet man lives not by bread alone how shall he live by gold the answer comes in a sudden moan of sickness hunger and cold and lo the seed of a new life sown in the ruins of the old the human heart which seemed so dead wakes with a sudden start to right and left we hear it said nay tis a noble heart and the angels whisper overhead there's a new shrine in the mart and though it be long since daisies grew where irk and irwell flow if human love springs up anew and angels come and go what matters it that the skies were blue a hundred years ago end of part nine part ten of travels in lancashire chapter twenty five of passages in the life of a radical by samuel bamford this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org morning of the sixteenth of august arrangements at middleton address by the author arrival of the rochdale people procession towards manchester events of the day the same forenoon we had a meeting in langley dingle a pleasant and retired spot where was a sheltered bank sloping towards the sun with plenty of bushes and dry grass and a rindle tumbling at our feet here while some were sitting some lying and some pacing to and fro we discussed and arranged our plans for the succeeding day all allowed that the occurrence at the white moss was an unfavourable one and i now more than ever impressed with the belief that we should meet with opposition of some sort proposed that a party of men with stout cudgels should be appointed to take care of the collars in order that at all events they might be preserved this was discussed at some length but the more confiding views of my neighbours together with mr hunt's admonition prevailing my suggestion was overruled and we shortly afterwards separated i may say that with myself the preservation of our colours under any circumstances was a point of honour worth any sacrifice fortunately more placid views than mine prevailed and if an aspect of entire confidence could have disarmed party feeling it would have been done the following morning but such is seldom the case and it was not so in the present instance as will soon appear by eight o'clock on the morning of monday the sixteenth of august eighteen nineteen the whole town of middleton might be said to be on the alert some to go to the meeting and others to see the procession the like of which for such a purpose had never before taken place in that neighbourhood first were selected twelve of the most comely and decent-looking youths who were placed in two rows of six each with each a branch of laurel held presented in his hand as a token of amity and peace then followed the men of several districts in fives then the band of music an excellent one 
then the colours a blue one of silk with inscriptions in golden letters unity and strength liberty and fraternity a green one of silk with golden letters parliament's annual suffrage universal and betwixt them on a staff a handsome cap of crimson velvet with a tuft of laurel and the cap tastefully braided with the word libertas in front next were placed the remainder of the men of the districts in fives every hundred men had a leader who was distinguished by a sprig of laurel in his hat others similarly distinguished were appointed over these and the whole were to obey the directions of a principal conductor who took his place at the head of the column with a bugleman to sound his orders such were our dispositions on the ground at barrowfields at the sight of the bugle not less than three thousand men formed a hollow square with probably as many people around them and an impressive silence having been obtained i reminded them that they were going to attend the most important meeting that had ever been held for parliamentary reform and i hoped their conduct would be marked by a steadiness and seriousness befitting the occasion and such as would cast shame upon their enemies who had always represented the reformers as a mob-like rabble but they would see that they were not so that day i requested they would not leave their ranks nor show carelessness nor inattention to the order of their leaders but that they would walk comfortably and agreeably together not to offer any insult or provocation by word or deed nor to notice any persons who might do the same by them but to keep such persons as quiet as possible for if they began to retaliate the least disturbance might serve as a pretext for dispersing the meeting if the peace officers should come to arrest myself or any other person they were not to offer any resistance but suffer them to execute their office peaceably when at the meeting they were to keep themselves as select as possible with their banners in the centre so that if individuals straggled or got away from the main body they would know where to find them again by seeing their banners and when the meeting was dissolved they were to get close around their banners and leave the town as soon as possible lest should they stay drinking or loitering about the streets their enemies should take advantage and send some of them to the new bailey i also said that in conformity with the rule of the committee no sticks nor weapons of any description would be allowed to be carried in the ranks and those who had such were requested to put them aside or leave them with some friend until their return in consequence of this order many sticks were left behind and a few only of the oldest and most infirm amongst us were allowed to carry their walking staves i may say with truth that we presented a most respectable assemblage of labouring men all were decently though humbly attired and i noticed not even one who did not exhibit a white sunday shirt a neckcloth and other apparel in the same clean though homely condition my address was received with cheers it was heartily and unanimously assented to we opened into column the music struck up the banners flashed in the sunlight other music was heard it was that of the rochdale party coming to join us we met and a shout from ten thousand startled the echoes of the woods and dingles then all was quiet save the breath of music and with intense seriousness we went on our whole column with the rochdale people would probably consist of six thousand men at our head were a hundred or two of women mostly young wives and mine own was amongst them a hundred or two of our handsomest girls sweethearts to the lads who were with us danced to the music or sung snatches of popular songs a score or two of children were sent back though some went forward whilst on each side of our line walked some thousands of stragglers and thus accompanied by our friends and our dearest and most tender connections we went slowly towards manchester at blakely the accession to our ranks and the crowd in the road had become much greater at harperhay we halted whilst the band and those who thought proper refreshed with a cup of prime ale from sam ogden's tap when the bugle sounded every man took his place and we advanced from all that i had heard of the disposition of the authorities i had scarcely expected that we should be allowed to enter manchester in a body 
i had thought it not improbable that they or some of them would meet us with a civil and military escort would read the riot act if they thought proper and warn us from proceeding and that we should then have nothing to do but turn back and hold a meeting in our town i had even fancied that they would most likely stop us at the then toll gate where the roads fork towards collyhurst and newtown but when i saw both those roads open with only a horseman or two prancing before us i began to think that i had overestimated the forethought of the authorities and i felt somewhat assured that we should be allowed to enter the town quietly when of course all probability of interruption would be at an end we had got a good length on the higher road towards collyhurst when a messenger arrived from mr hunt with a request that we would return and come the lower road and lead up his possession into manchester i at first determined not to comply i did not like to entangle ourselves and the great mass now with us in the long hollow road through newtown where whatever happened it would be difficult to advance or retreat or disperse and i kept moving on but a second messenger arrived and there was a cry of new town new town and so i gave the word left shoulders forward and running at the charge step we soon gained the other road and administered to the vanity of our great leader by heading his procession from smedley cottage a circumstance interesting to myself now occurred on the bank of an open field on our left i perceived a gentleman observing us attentively he beckoned me and i went to him he was one of my late employers he took my hand and rather concernedly but kindly said he hoped no harm was intended by all those people who were coming in i said i would pledge my life for their entire peaceableness i asked him to notice them did they look like persons wishing to outrage the law were they not on the contrary evidently heads of decent working families or members of such families no no i said my dear sir and old respected master if any wrong or violence take place they will be committed by men of a different stamp from these he said he was very glad to hear me say so he was happy he had seen me and gratified by the manner in which i had expressed myself i asked did he think we should be interrupted at the meeting he said he did not believe we should then i replied all will be well and shaking hands with mutual good wishes i left him and took my station as before at newtown we were welcomed with open arms by the poor irish weavers who came out in their best drapery and uttered blessings and words of endearment many of which were not understood by our rural patriots some of them danced and others stood with clasped hands and tearful eyes adoring almost that banner whose colour was their national one and the emblem of their green island home we thanked them by the band striking up st patrick's day in the morning they were electrified and we passed on leaving those warm-hearted suburbans capering and whooping like mad having squeezed ourselves through the gully of a road below st michael's church we traversed blakely street and miller's lane and went along swan street and oldham street frequently hailed in our progress by the cheers of the townspeople we learned that other parties were on the field before us and that the lees and saddleworth union had been led by dr healy walking before a pitch black flag with staring white letters forming the words equal representation or death love two hands joined and a heart all in white paint and presenting one of the most sepulchral looking objects that could be contrived the idea of my diminutive friend leading a funeral procession of his own patients such it appeared to me was calculated to force a smile even at that thoughtful moment we now perceived we had lost the tail of our train and understood we had come the wrong way and should have led down shewed hill and along hanging ditch the market-place and deansgate which route hunt and his party had taken i must own i was not displeased at this separation i was of opinion that we had tendered homage quite sufficient to the mere vanity of self-exhibition too much of which i now thought was apparent having crossed piccadilly we went down mosley street then almost entirely inhabited by wealthy families we took the left side of st peter's church and at this angle we wheeled quickly and steadily into peter street 
and soon approached a wide unbuilt space occupied by an immense multitude which opened and received us with loud cheers we walked into that chasm of human beings and took our station from the hustings across the causeway of peter street and so remained undistinguishable from without but still forming an almost unbroken line with our colours in the centre my wife i had not seen for some time but when last i caught a glimpse of her she was with some decent married females and thinking the party quite safe in their own discretion i felt not much uneasiness on their account and so had greater liberty in attending to the business of the meeting in about half an hour after our arrival the sounds of music and reiterated shouts proclaimed the near approach of mr hunt and his party and in a minute or two they were seen coming from deansgate preceded by a band of music and several flags on the driving seat of a barouche sat a neatly dressed female supporting a small flag on which were some emblematical drawings and an inscription within the carriage were mr hunt who stood up mr johnson of smedley cottage mr morehouse of stockport mr carlyle of london mr john knight of manchester and mr saxton a sub-editor of the manchester observer their approach was hailed by one universal shout from probably eighty thousand persons they threaded their way slowly past us and through the crowd which hunt eyed i thought with almost as much of astonishment as satisfaction this spectacle could not be otherwise in his view than solemnly impressive such a mass of human beings he had not beheld till then his responsibility must weigh on his mind their power for good or evil was irresistible and who should direct that power himself alone who had called it forth the task was great and not without its peril the meeting was indeed a tremendous one he mounted the hustings the music ceased mr johnson proposed that mr hunt should take the chair it was seconded and carried by acclamation and mr hunt stepping forward towards the front of the stage took off his white hat and addressed the people whilst he was doing so i proposed to an acquaintance that as the speeches and resolutions were not likely to contain anything new to us and as we could see them in the papers we should retire a while and get some refreshment of which i stood much in need being not in very robust health he assented and we had got to nearly the outside of the crowd when a noise and strange murmur arose towards the church some person said it was the blackburn people coming and i stood on tiptoe and looked in the direction whence the noise proceeded and saw a party of cavalry in blue and white uniform come trotting sword in hand round the corner of a garden wall and to the front of a row of new houses where they reined up in a line the soldiers are here i said we must go back and see what this means oh someone made reply they're only come to be ready if there should be any disturbance in the meeting well let us go back i said and we forced our way towards the colours on the cavalry drawing up they were received with a shout of goodwill as i understood it they shouted again waving their sabres over their heads and then slackening rein and striking spur into their steeds they dashed forward and began cutting the people stand fast i said they are riding upon us stand fast and there was a general cry in our quarter of stand fast the cavalry were in confusion they evidently could not with all the weight of man and horse penetrate that compact mass of human beings and their sabres were plied to hew away through naked held-up hands and defenceless heads and then chopped limbs and wound gaping skulls were seen and groans and cries were mingled with the din of that horrid confusion ah ah for shame for shame was shouted then break break they are killing them in front and they cannot get away and there was a general cry of break break for a moment the crowd held back as in a pause then there was a rush heavy and resistless as a headlong sea and a sound like low thunder with screams prayers and imprecations from the crowd moiled and sabre doomed who could not escape by this time hunt and his companions had disappeared from the hustings and some of the yeomanry perhaps less sanguinarily disposed than others 
were busied in cutting down the flagstaves and demolishing the flags at the hustings on the breaking of the crowd the yeomanry wheeled and dashing whenever there was an opening they followed pressing and wounding many females appeared as the crowd opened and striplings or mere youths also were found their cries were piteous and heart-rending and would one might have supposed have disarmed any human resentment but here their appeals were in vain women white-vested maids and tender youths were indiscriminately sabred or trampled and we have reason for believing that few were the instances in which that forbearance was vouchsafed which they so earnestly implored in ten minutes from the commencement of the havoc the field was an open and almost deserted space the sun looked down through a sultry and motionless air the curtains and blinds of the windows within view were all closed a gentleman or two might occasionally be seen looking out from one of the new houses before mentioned near the door of which a group of persons special constables were collected and apparently in conversation others were assisting the wounded or carrying off the dead the hustings remained with a few broken and hewed flagstaves erect and a torn and gashed banner or two dropping whilst over the whole field were strewed caps bonnets hats shawls and shoes and other parts of male and female dress trampled torn and bloody the yeomanry had dismounted some were easing their horses girths others adjusting their accoutrements and some were wiping their sabres several mounds of human beings still remained where they had fallen crushed down and smothered some of these still groaning others with staring eyes were gasping for breath and others would never breathe more all was silent save those low sounds and the occasional snorting and pawing of steeds persons might sometimes be noticed peeping from attics and over the tall ridgings of houses but they quickly withdrew as if fearful of being observed or unable to sustain the full gaze of a scene so hideous and abhorrent besides the manchester yeomanry who as i have already shown did the duty of the day there came upon the ground soon after the attack the fifteenth hussars and the cheshire yeomanry and the latter as if emulous of the manchester corps intercepted the flying masses and inflicted some severe sabre wounds the hussars we have reason for supposing gave but few wounds and i am not aware that it has been shown that one of those brave soldiers dishonoured his sword by using the edge of it in addition to the cavalry a strong body of the eighty-eighth foot was stationed at the lower corner of dickinson street with their bayonets at the charge they wounded several persons and greatly impeded the escape of the fugitives by that outlet almost simultaneously with the hussars four pieces of horse artillery appeared from deansgate and about two hundred special constables were also in attendance so that force for a thorough massacre was ready had it been wanted on the first rush of the crowd i called to our men to break their flagstaves and secure their banners but probably i was not heard or understood all being then inextricable confusion he with the blue banner saved it the cap of liberty was dropped and left behind indeed woe to him who stopped he would never have risen again and thomas redford who carried the green banner held it aloft until the staff was cut in his hand and his shoulder was divided by the sabre of one of the manchester yeomanry a number of our people were driven to some timber which lay at the foot of the wall of the quakers meeting-house being pressed by the yeomanry a number sprung over the balks and defended themselves with stones which they found there it was not without difficulty and after several were wounded that they were driven out a heroine a young married woman of our party with her face all bloody her hair streaming about her her bonnet hanging by the string and her apron weighed with stones kept her assailant at bay until she fell backwards and was near being taken but she got away covered with severe bruises it was near this place and about this time that one of the yeomanry was dangerously wounded and unhorsed by a blow from a fragment of a brick and it was supposed to have been flung by this woman on the first advance of the yeomanry 
one of the horses plunging at the crowd sent its forefeet into the head of our big drum which was left near the hustings and was irrecoverable thus booted on both legs at once the horse rolled over and the drum was kicked to pieces in the melee for my own part i had the good fortune to escape without injury though it was more than i expected i was carried i may say almost literally to the lower end of the quakers meeting-house the further wall of which screened us from observation and pursuit and afforded access to some open streets in my retreat from the field a well-dressed woman dropped on her knees a little on my left i put out my hand to pluck her up but she missed it and i left her i could not stop and god knows what became of her two of the yeomanry were next in our way and i expected a broken head having laurel in my hat but one was striking on one side and the other on the other and at that moment i stepped betwixt them and escaped after quitting the field i first found myself in king street and passing into market street and high street i more leisurely pursued my way taking care lest some official should notice me to remove the laurel from the outside to the inside of my hat i was now unhappy on account of my wife and i blamed myself greatly for consenting to her coming at all i learned however when in st george's road that she was well and was on the way towards home and that satisfied me for the time having met with an old neighbour we agreed to go round past smedley cottage to learn what intelligence had arrived there we descended the hill at collyhurst and on arriving at the bottom we espied a party of cavalry whom from their dress I took to be of the Manchester Yeomanry, riding along the road we had quitted towards Harper Hay. One of them wore a broad green band or sash across his shoulder and breast. I thought from its appearance it was a fragment of our green banner, and I was not mistaken. They were traversing the suburbs to reconnoitre and to pick up any person they could identify, myself, for instance, had I then been in their way and the inglorious exhibition of the torn banner was permitted for the gratification of the vanity of the captor this party rode forward a short distance and then returned without making any prisoners from our party at smedley cottage we found mrs johnson her two children i think two her maid-servant and mr hunt's groom who had just come from the town and had brought the information that mr hunt mr johnson knight morehouse and several others were prisoners in the new bailey i was touched by the lady's situation though she bore the trial better than i could have expected we gave her some particulars of the meeting to which she listened with a manner mournfully thoughtful occasionally shedding tears and her features pale and calm as marble she spoke not much she was evidently too full to hold discourse and so with good wishes and consoling hopes we took our departure we now called at harper hay and found at the public house and in the road there a great number of the middleton and rochdale people who had come from the meeting my first inquiry was for my wife on whose account i now began to be downright miserable i asked many about her but could not hear any tidings and i turned back toward manchester with a resolution to have vengeance if any harm had befallen her but i had not gone far ere i espied her at a distance hastening towards me we met and our first emotions were those of thankfulness to god for our preservation she had been in greater peril and distress of mind if possible than myself the former she escaped in a remarkable manner and through the intervention of special constables to whom let us award their due she afterwards heard first that i was killed next that i was wounded and in the infirmary then that i was a prisoner and lastly that she would find me on the road home her anxiety now being removed by the assurance of my safety she hastened forward to console our child i rejoined my comrades and forming about a thousand of them into file we set off to the sound of fife and drum with our only banner waving and in that form we re-entered the town of middleton the banner was exhibited from a window of the suffield arms public house the cap of liberty was restored to us by a young man from chadderton who had picked it up on the outskirts of the field 
and now we spent the evening in recapitulating the events of the day and in brooding over a spirit of vengeance towards the authors of our humiliation and our wrong end of part ten Part eleven of Travels in Lancashire Gorton Town Anonymous From Ballads and Songs of Lancashire, Ancient and Modern, Collected by John Harland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This song was communicated by Mr. John Higson who says it is translated from the vernacular it will be the more intelligible to the non-lancashire reader gorton is a chapelry in the parish of manchester and about three miles from that city this was sung in february eighteen sixty five at the naming of a dog ringwood at the hare and hounds inn abbey hay gorton by samuel bessick a nephew of the composer of the tune and author or compiler of the words the late john bessick alias parish jack a singer fluter and fiddler in great request at stirs and merry-makings where his vocal and instrumental services were often paid in kind in meat clothes or liquor he was also in the choir of gorton chapel now st james's church where he was buried a few years ago it has been printed as a broadside gosh dang it lads we come in again though many a mile i've been a gorton lad i'm bred and born and lots of sights i've seen but when i did come back again i nearly fell in fits for times and folk so altered looked i thought i'd lost me wits i turned me north i turned me south i turned me east and west and everything so altered looked and some were none for th best then even altered goose green pump then turned it upside down and well then choked with paving stones since i left gorton town when i left home some years ago the old folks had lots of trade some right good jobs came tumbling in and every one well paid we'd good roast beef and pudding and ale some decent swigs egad they lived like fighting cocks and got as fat as pigs but now egad there's none such things poor folks of empty tripes there's no roast beef to stuff their hides it's poor law soup and swipes an honest working man's no chance grim want does on him frown i ne'er thought things would come to this when i left gorton town in days gone by our fine young men ne'er told such dismal tales they'd ne'er a man transported then as far as new south wales we'd honest men in parliament both tories rads and whigs they were never known poor folk to rob but now they've turned to prigs our manufacturers worked full time their mills were seldom stopped no general turnouts were there then the wages never dropped those corn law folks and chartist lads might talk till all were brown without being sent to treading mills when i left gorton town in days gone by i never thought such days would come as these when lads were all as gay as larks and wenches bright as bees right merrily they jogged to th fairs in clogs and light shalloon and every one could sport a face just like a harvest moon but now the clogs and light shalloons each one has thrown aside and lasses now the faded moons they've grown too proud to stride the foolish frumps sport mutton pumps and yet their pride to crown they've bustles tied behind em half as large as gorton town but dang it lads us ne'er forget when first i came i'th town a pretty wench came up to me and says where art the bound but putting all these jokes aside we'll hope these times will mend there'll come a day yet when the rich will prove the poor man's friend when work and honest poverty will meet with due regard and plotting knaves and creeping slaves will get their just reward it's soon or late as sure as fate such things will come to pass and when we all get lots of work we'll soon get lots of brass with right good trade and fairly paid i dare bet thee a crown there'll not be such a place i'th world 
as Merry Gorton Town. End of part eleven. Part twelve of Travels in Lancashire. Whittle Springs, a reminiscence by John Critchley Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Whittle Springs, a reminiscence. Respectfully inscribed to Thomas Howard, Esquire, of Hyde, owner of the estate. It was a summer's gorgeous eventide, softly and sweetly silent, warm and bright, and all the breadth of glorious landscape wide was swathed in vesture of serenest light, when with a friend I took my pleasant way to an old shadowy sylvan nook that lay a league apart from any street and town in a romantic valley, hushed and brown, our winding pathway led through lonely lanes, now busy with the fragrant harvest wains, where banks of plume-like fern grew thick and green, where groups of foxgloves stood with stately mien, on grassy slopes and in the fragrant breeze shook all their wealth of crimson chalices. From shadowy brake and wavering bough was heard the frequent voice of some unsettled bird, the limber honeysuckle seemed to sigh onto the clustering wild rose lovingly, and both sent through the calm and verdant gloom the mingled breathings of their rich perfume. We entered by a low and gothic gate into a sweet retreat of fairy state, a lone and lovely spot that smiled at rest on the green valley's ever quiet breast, a refuge quaint of chequered light and shade all cunningly and beautifully made by art and nature's harmonising power into an intricate and magic bower embroidered everywhere with richest dyes and curtained o'er with soft and cloudless skies encircled with a zone of beauteous things a place of pleasure welcome whittle springs with loitering feet we traced the cultured grounds and calmly listened to the various sounds of childish gladsomeness and youthful glee and ballad strains of ancient melody we watched the athletic bowlers on the green as a great billiard table smooth and clean stopped to regard a troop of merry boys holding their pastime with obstreperous noise wound through the verdant mazes of the brake all richly redolent with rarest flowers bright forms of full perfume that sweetly spake of southern climates and their gorgeous bowers we paused a while beside the tranquil pool ample in breadth pellucid bright and cool scarce ruffled by the graceful moving pair of snowy swans that idly floated there and then with honour to the place we quaffed a doubly copious and refreshing draught from the twin springs whose ever healthful powers bring cheerful thousands to their pleasant bowers. But now the sinking sun-god paused to rest on the bright borders of the purpling west, while hill and vale and distant copse and glade began to gather into deeper shade, and we withdrew within, intent to spend a pleasant hour with stranger and with friend, in sweet and social converse, such as binds in peaceful union, true hearts and minds within the lofty and antique saloon with many coloured windows gaily dight we sat and watched the now ascending moon pour in the sweetness of her mellow light and we beheld with mute but glad surprise things which enchant the silent gazer's eyes a hundred shapes and hues of pictured grace the healthful bloom of many a lovely face and sculptured forms majestical and fair which give the whole a chaste and classic air beauties that make us half forget that we are near the murky realm of noisy trade and make us glad that we can quickly be where its rude sounds cannot our ears invade o oh, whittle springs thou art a pleasant spot where human sorrow may be half forgot a tranquil refuge of serene delight to those made weary in the world's rude fight 
a place of quiet or of stirring joy where harassed minds may find some sweet employ the thoughtful penman leaves his books and care to find some calm and cheerful solace there the weary worker coming from the town the wayward painter puts his pencil down and cometh here in quest of newer themes the poet cometh to refresh his dreams for song and dance and temperate feast and wine and forms of beauty which seem half divine and pleasant smiles and laughter beaming eyes make thee at times a social paradise and still my fond and faithful memory clings to thy serene delights famed whittle springs this secluded spot of resort and harmless recreation is becoming daily more popular in addition to its medicinal springs it possesses charms of a varied character art has combined with nature in rendering it a place pleasant to visit and remember the proprietor of the grounds has spared no pains and expense in providing for the pleasure and comfort of his visitors to the people of blackburn preston chorley and neighbourhoods there are cheap facilities of reaching it altogether whittle springs is worthy the patronage of any class and a most attractive and desirable place of resort for the toiling community of lancashire may it meet with that support it so highly deserves j c p end of part twelve part thirteen of travels in lancashire riverton from lancashire memories by louisa potter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org how often have i paused on every charm the sheltered cot the cultivated farm the never failing brook the busy mill the decent church that topped the neighbouring hill goldsmith i heard a friend say the other day that lancashire was a county without country that each large town sent forth such long straggling suburbs of houses and streets that they met the corresponding offshoots of the next town and so left no room for fields and trees she knew little of lancashire who said so it is a libel on the dear old county there were and are yet nooks and corners for those who may be at the trouble to seek them as rural and primitive as may be found in the remotest agricultural districts where trade is either a mystery to be wondered at or a vulgarity to be sneered at my memory clings lovingly to one sweet village where i was in the habit of passing pleasant holiday times with some of my young companions i may have since seen higher mountains or lovelier valleys finer trees or more magnificent waterfalls but riverton is the arcadia of my young life before railroads realized the fairy tale of fortunatus's wishing cap where you sat on a carpet and wished to be anywhere and there you were it was a matter of consideration how to reach out of the way places except by leaving the stage-coach at the nearest point of the high road or else taking a shares for the whole distance we were sometimes indulged with the shares for the eight miles from the large town to riverton but we often walked and sent the trunks by old charles moody the carrier who plied three days a week with butter fruit and vegetables on his outward bound journey and returned laden with groceries crockery ware and linen drapery for the whole district back again we rather liked the walking for time was no object and we could afford to be the whole day about it we kept steadily along the high road for six miles and then turned into riverton lane then for the first time we felt we were in the country we had left high roads and manufactories behind us and were in no particular hurry to see them again the middle of the lane was sandy and unpaved bordered by a broad margin of soft grass and a straggling unpruned edge where the bramble and the dog rose threw their long garlands abroad and the honeysuckle twined its supple stem round the thorn and scattered its pink and yellow waxen blossoms in wild profusion mingled and brightened with the glowing green and golden foliage of the young oak here and there 
a shining holly reared its head a little higher than its neighbours or an old tree with its trunk overgrown with ivy stood single at intervals like extreme old age surviving its contemporaries rising above the thorns and blossoms of life as it approached nearer and nearer to death the village of riverton stood at the end of the lane but the houses were all detached and placed at such distances it was not easy to tell where the village proper began and ended the first was a white cottage occupied on saturdays and sundays by a bachelor lawyer from the large town a tiny dwelling in front of a clump of trees precisely like the houses children draw on slates with a door in the middle a window on each side three windows above a railing a gate and a pump with a long curled handle all in a row the rooms were lower than the usual lowness of cottage rooms lest by their increased height the chimneys of the house might possibly be in winter time when the leaves were off be seen from the windows of the hall it was a wonderful little cottage in its capability of holding nephews and nieces upstairs in the holidays they were packed as close as potted shrimps and sometimes the bachelor himself being considerably taller than the average height of humanity would call out are you all in your rooms in order that he might open his bedroom door and sleep comfortably with his feet out on the landing the dwelling of most pretension in the village was the hall the seat of the squire an old house with a modern brick front a pediment and a flight of steps standing respectable and dignified embosomed in its own woods and such a rookery behind it as new gentry vainly sigh after the rook is an essentially aristocratic bird the country people say it will only settle in the neighbourhood of a good old family however this may be a neighbouring proprietor a very great man indeed lofty highway esquire of highmount but who never had any ancestors at least none it was worth while mentioning wished to increase the dignity of his domain by adding a rookery so in the early spring before the young ones were fledged nests and young were fetched in baskets from riverton and placed quite naturally in the trees of highmount but there is no deceiving sensible rooks they never could be induced to build and so far corroborated the popular opinion there was not much of outdoor decoration about the hall no flower beds no smooth lawn no evidence of a lady's taste or care for the squire was unmarried the hayfield came up to the gravel walk in front and the garden was a small square enclosed space with paved walks that produced gooseberries currants vegetables and a few old-fashioned flowers of which bachelor's buttons and sweet scabious predominated the dairy stood in the wood behind the house and the churning was carried on by means of the clear brook that rushed by turning the wheel communicating with the churn that was a pretty dairy so clean and cool overshadowed with trees and the sound of running water perpetually murmuring in the ear but as pretty as anything was the dairy woman and her children such chubby elves with complexions all cream and roses such round sweet eyes such clustering curly hair for which betty regularly apologised indeed ladies she would say i do what i can i brush and i comb i comb and i brush and do what i will i cannot get it straight across the paddock at the edge of the wood was a white weather-stained dwelling with a garden not very well cultivated that belonged to the two miss archers maiden sisters whose object in life had resolved into the one apprehension of taking cold such devices there were for keeping out the enemy such airing of clothing such stuffing of keyholes and averting draughts as if god's precious gift pure air was to be regarded suspiciously as rheumatism in disguise the linen for the night was put under the cushions of the parlour chairs and assiduously sat upon during the day whilst that for the day was safely and warmly accommodated at night under their own pillows the story went that miss martha who was something of an invalid sat up in bed in her bonnet and mantle kind and good they were withal and ever ready to lend a helping hand to their neighbours in sorrow or difficulty the tall red brick house on the village green was the abode of a widow lady 
with four or five grown-up daughters smart young ladies who did not care much for the country and took their daily walk along the high road or at least along the lane leading to the high road they lived there many years but at length as the mother significantly observed we stay and stay and nobody comes they departed for the town where it seems somebody did come for they married in course of time across the green and down in a little dell was the school not a charity school oh no but a free school founded by a pious lover of his kind for the benefit of this his native village some of the neighbouring farmers eked out their means of livelihood by boarding the boys who came from a distance to this grammar school for it had a certain reputation and once a bishop had been educated within its walls the church of grey stone with its little cupola stood on a small eminence primitive and simple almost to bareness and looked down with the least possible air of superiority on its opposite neighbour the little old chapel yet there was a kind of christian example here worthy the imitation of those zealous disciples of the meek and lowly jesus who manifest their faith in him by intolerance hatred and contempt at the annual charity sermon in the church for the benefit of the sunday schools the chapel was closed and the whole congregation trooped to church to contribute their might towards their neighbour's advantage and when the chapel in turn had its collection the church closed its doors and its people worshipped with their fellow christians the village inn with the squire's family crest for the sign stood at the foot of the church bank kept by tibbet row who played the violoncello on sundays at the chapel with a placid resigned air acquired under the fierce clashings and shrill tongue of his good wife hannah the inn is always near the church with a view to the accommodation of mourners or friends who attend the funerals or weddings after the ceremony either joyous or sad is concluded they adjourn to the public house and too often conclude the day in merry-making and riot i remember one exception when a funeral party from a distance unwilling to incur the expense of a dinner and entertainment at the black boy thriftily brought their provision baskets in the hearse with the departed and when all was over had a jovial picnic in the churchyard across the lane and over the stile that consists of two short ladders meeting at an acute angle was the footpath leading to tommy stone's pretty gabled cottage where lodgings might be obtained in summer for those who were content with a parlour opening into the house part and the room over it the well in the garden was one of the beauties of riverton so cool so deep so clear bordered with moss and the low blue campanula and the pretty white veronica called in the country spill milk and backed by a luxuriant growth of foxgloves and that most beautiful of all green leaves the fern oh it was a spot well worth visiting on weekdays tommy was a stonemason and thatcher on sundays he led the singing in the choir now and then carved an inscription on a gravestone and might be supposed to have occasionally indulged in the lighter labour of composing it to judge of one memento in the churchyard in time of need i sought to god by night no rest i took i spake but could not make an end my breath was stopped so sore one of old tommy's daughters had been brought up with a relation in london and at his death returned home but finding the habits of the family a little unsuited to her notion of polite life undertook to remodel the household on a genteel plan and who could know better how to do it hadn't she been all her life in cheapside and is not cheapside the very centre of london and is not london the very centre of civilization the sisters took to the learning readily enough and came out on sundays in white gowns and smart silk bonnets and parasols but old tommy was impracticable they would have remodelled his dress but he stuck religiously to his pepper and salt coat and corduroy breeches with grey worsted stockings which never can under pretence of eccentricity or anything else be made to look genteel they called him papa but that failed papa no more fitted on him than a new curly wavy brown wig would have fitted on his thin grey hair and at one o'clock when miss nanny looked out of the door and daintily lisped 
papa dinner is ready tommy persisted in answering ay ay i'll come when i ha done this bit of thatchin nothing could be done with old tommy in the way of gentility so after repeated and fruitless efforts they wisely let him alone in some parts the lanes are fenced with low stone walls cleverly built without mortar of flagstones about an inch thick the coping is a succession of these each with its edge resting on its neighbour like a pack of cards thrown down these walls might be thought rugged and unpromising features in a landscape but it is not so here the want of mortar is quickly supplied by the small white-veined ivy that grasps the whole fabric with its tiny feet the cranes bill unfolds its pencilled blossoms in the crevices and the yellow starwort hangs from the coping behind the village the land rises higher and higher until the rich meadow grass yields to the short greensward mingled with bracken and rushes and then comes wild bleak moorland not high enough or rugged enough to be called mountains but sufficiently so to ensure the pure free air so peculiar to a hilly country and what a view from these high moors hill and dale park and wood town and village in long succession till the eye rests at length on the white glistening waves of the far-off sea once we would see the sun rise from the summit of the highest hill we rose at two o'clock shivering and half repenting hurried on our clothes and hastened across the paddock our shoes wet through before we had gone a dozen yards the mist lay white and heavy on the lower ground every green leaf every blade of grass was laden and bent with dew the birds were just beginning to twitter and chirp the rooks gave now and then an awakening quaw as if it were time to get up nature seemed half awake in the higher ground the furze bushes were wrapped in the delicate web of the gossamer spider scarcely perceptible in the noonday sun but showing in the dewy morning air like that finest indian manufacture that the hindus so elegantly designate woven wind up and up we climbed over stone walls and through the wet grass till we reached the summit the sun rose but we were enveloped in a cloud and were not a little startled to see our own shadows wonderfully lengthened depicted upon nothing standing within a hundred yards of us the cloud rolled away and there we were damp and chilled in the bright sunshine and came home with a steady determination which i have adhered to ever since never again to meet the rising sun on distant hills being of the opinion of the charity boy when he arrived at z in the alphabet that it was going through a great deal for the sake of a very little the country around here is somewhat peculiar for this reason in parts that appear barest or bleakest you suddenly come upon a ravine or gully the sides clothed with trees and copse and a clear brook washing through the bottom in dry weather it is pleasant to walk up the bed of the brook now stepping carefully over the green slippery rock now springing on to a dark stone tottering and swaying before you recover your balance or trusting to a treacherous sod that lets you down ankle deep before you find a resting place for the other foot one of these ravines terminates in a waterfall not thundering or rushing or foaming or grand but falling gently and gracefully with a cool splashing murmuring sound the ferns that sprang up at the sides trembled under the soft showery spray or they might tremble from cold for it was always cold down there the sun never seemed to reach it a canopy of trees cast a deep flickering shadow on the water below and in the hot summer time when the leaves were thick and green the pretty picture stood in a perpetual twilight the path through the wood led to the solitary little farmhouse occupied by old peggy baines who lived there all alone toiling at outdoor work like any man for daily bread there is a quaint simplicity about the country people in lancashire that wants a name in our vocabulary of manners as far removed from the vulgarity of the lower orders in the town on the one hand as from the polished conventionalisms of the higher classes on the other a simplicity that asserts itself because of its simplicity and that never heard and if it did never understood 
who's who imagine the surprise of the new vicar of the adjoining parish fresh from emmanuel college cambridge in all the dignity of the shovel hat and garments of a rigidly clerical orthodoxy accustomed to an agricultural population that smoothed down its forelocks in deference to the vicar but never dreamed of bandying words with him imagine him losing his way in one of his distant parochial excursions and inquiring in a dainty south country accent from a lubberly boy weeding turnips in a field pray my boy can you tell me the way to bolton ay replied the boy you mun go across yon bleach croft and into th lone and you'll get to doffcocker and then you're i'th high road and you can go straight on thank you said the vicar perhaps i can find it and now my boy will you tell me what you do for a livelihood i clear up th shippen pills potatoes a does oddin and if i may be so bold when you tell me what you do oh i'm a minister of the gospel i preach the word of god but what don you do persisted the boy i teach you the way of salvation i show you the road to heaven nay nay said the lad dunnot you pretend to teach me th road to heaven and doesn't know th road to bowton peggy baines who by the way was an old maid took great pride in doing everything for herself and being independent of the whole world yes ain said she i an to look after th bee as to ten th pigs and do and thoddin because you seen i had no felly then in a confidential whisper and it's best i had nobody to please but myself and i reckon th squire thinks so too and he'd a get him wed afore this she would place a chair for her visitors on the most even space in the earthen floor and proceed to comment on their appearance and looks with a regardlessness of the usual courtesies of polite life that would be almost startling if the visitors were not fully aware that the highest possible compliment with the country people is my word but you look an ill you're non long for this world believe me implying a delicacy of complexion that can afford to stay at home and is not compelled either to weed potatoes or make hay and think eh miss jane said old peggy to a lady whose mother she had known in her youth and thinkin you're non like your mother no peggy replied miss jane i am not indeed i am not so good-looking as my mother was you're sayin true your mother had a vast pleasant look as you an it what a variety of lovely walks there were in riverton the hills and moors for the strong and enterprising the pike so carefully watched in haytime lest a passing cloud should rest upon it for then was remembered when riverton pike puts on its hood anderton ford may expect a flood the narrow grassy footpaths in the fields were a quieter and less fatiguing walk but then there was the two laddered stile at every hedge so if people were not active in crossing stiles and climbing stone walls they had better not come to riverton the names of the farms and homesteads how quaint and saxon the mill riding the grut the intac the no redolent of the soil with a sniff of the aromatic odour of peat and fir trees there was the robin field from which were seen the finest sunsets the rough where there was to be found the speckled cranberry that is almost disappearing before drainage and improvements the deserted lead mines that if they were turned to no other account afforded little mineralogists the excitement of finding and talking of barites feldspar and mica and there was old place the decaying mansion of a nobleman long since dead that stood alone in a gloomy sour kind of gentility occupied by farmers like a faded tarnished court train wearing out in the service of the descendants of its original proprietor's lady's maid years elapsed before i saw the dear old village again but i found it little altered no old houses pulled down no new ones built up no mills for the sake of the water power no manufactories for the increasing population for the population if it did increase went away john shaw the schoolmaster sat in the same brown wig and white cravat in the canopied pew of his baronial ancestor tommy stone slept with his fathers in a grave adorned with flowers 
and a tablet equally affectionate and genteel was erected to his memory a number of young faces of which i had no knowledge grey hairs that i left wavy brown or glossy black and thin silver locks where i only looked for grey with a few more grassy mounds in the churchyard were all that marked the lapse of twenty years in dear pleasant riverton End of part thirteen part fourteen of travels in lancashire come to blackpool and joe turtledove's visit to blackpool by samuel laycock this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. come to blackpool poem by samuel laycock first published in the manchester evening news february nineteenth nineteen hundred eight eh what are you rooting and tooting about i those dusty owd books shut em up and come out you'll be racking your brains till you're worried to death or surprised how the dickens you're getting your breath in a auction like this it would finish me soon what an you to leap this shop up wi a moon i'd have been out of this dismal prison long sin for there is isn't a morsel a son can get in there's no wonder at folk going out of the mind if they had to be pent up i cribs of this kind in fact it would never surprise me to know that they'd try to get out of the bodies and o don't you up and then come on to blackpool wi me o can tell you there's summat worth going to see now scarborough's a nice place for one to go see so are brighton and southport but blackpool for me you may stand up off cliffs on a fine clear day and see thile a man sixty miles o'er the sea on your left hand th welsh mountains are raising their heads to your right one's reminded o cumberland leads and behind to make th picture more grand and complete there's whitewashed farmhouses and churches i'th seat and then there's the star inn reet away at south shore weary winter huge billows so fearfully roar i've oft seen that house reet surrounded with spray when it seemed as if the waves were bound to wash it away but they only went round it to show they were fond o having a marlockin do up off lond they just went to embrace it and give it a smack to mak known their attachment and then they went back well what do you say do you think you'll go down if you do you'll be pleased or da bet you a crown no i've done shut them books and away wi you warm and get ready for coming and mind you do come clear out o that counting house lads and be sharp mary dunna thee wait till thou's finished that warp for those cheeks o' thine's lost o'er the colour o oh, see and they ain't look too heavy and downcast for me come and breathe some pure air some real blackpool ozone and we'll polish thee up till they'll hardly be known joe turtledove's visit to blackpool tune not for joseph my name is joseph turtledove i live in oldham town and as you'll see i'm very fond of sporting up and down last summer i to blackpool went and there i met miss scott she asked if i'd a sweetheart be but i said i'd rather not oh no no not for joe not for joseph if he knows it no 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 not for joe not for joseph oh dear no one day when walking on the beach again i met this maid she looked so shy i don't know why but thought she seemed afraid she did not condescend to look on her intended bow perhaps she thought i'd slighted her by saying not for joe not for joe not for joseph she passed right on without a word and walked along the shore i stayed at blackpool several days but never saw her more i little thought that charming girl would go and treat me so she never gave me another chance of saying not for joe not for joseph one day i went across the shore to watch the rolling tide a donkey boy came up and said sir will you take a ride well just to please the little man i mounted on the beach 
but balam roared and kicked and brayed i would not stir at least not for joe i tried to get the money back which i had paid the lad i said the donkey wouldn't move and thought it was too bad that any boy should be allowed to use a body so they needn't bother me again to have a ride oh no not for joe i went to mr brown's bazaar inside the market hall and looked at all the pretty things that lay upon the stall says mrs brown come buy this doll it's what you want i know i beg your pardon ma'am i said you're wrong it's not for joe oh dear no not for joe i went into an eating-house i think twas mrs clegg's i said a little dinner please they brought me ham and eggs i asked them what i had to pay for that delicious fry they said five shillings if you please and not too much says i oh no no not for joe well now i've done and told you all i mean to tell you now i'll finish up this verse and then politely make me bow next summer i may go again to stay a week or so and if i see miss scott about i'll sing her not for joe not for joseph not for joe End of part 14part 15 of travels in lancashire the lancashire witches by william harrison ainsworth book the third chapter four the gorge of cliviger this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the sun had already set for nicholas ashton of todmorden then a very small village indeed and alighting at a little inn near the church found the ale so good and so many boon companions assembled to discuss it that he would fain have tarried with them for an hour or so but prudence for once getting the better of inclination and suggesting that he had fifteen or sixteen miles still to ride over a rough and lonely road part of which lay through the gorge of cliviger a long and solitary pass among the english apennines and moreover had a large sum of money about him he tore himself away by a great effort on quitting the smiling valley of todmorden and drawing near the dangerous defile before mentioned some misgivings crossed him and he almost reproached himself with foolhardiness in venturing within it at such an hour and wholly unattended several recent cases of robbery some of them attended by murder had occurred within the pass and these now occurred so forcibly to the squire that he was half inclined to ride back to todmorden and engage two or three of the topers he had left at the inn to serve him as an escort as far as burnley but he dismissed the idea almost as soon as formed and casting one look at the green and woody slopes around him struck spurs into robin and dashed into the gorge on the right towered a precipice on the bare crest of which stood a heap of stones piled like a column the remains probably of a cairn on this commanding point nicholas perceived a female figure dilated to gigantic proportions against the sky who as far as he could distinguish seemed watching him and making signs to him apparently to go back but he paid little regard to them and soon afterwards lost sight of her precipitous and almost inaccessible rocks of every variety of form and hue some springing perpendicularly up like the spire of a church others running along in broken ridges or presenting the appearance of high embattled walls here riven into deep gullies there opening into wild savage glens fit spots for robber ambuscade now presenting a fair smooth surface now jagged shattered shelving roughened with brushwood sometimes bleached and hoary as in the case of the pinnacled crag called the white kirk sometimes green with moss or grey with lichen sometimes though but rarely shaded with timber as in the approach to the cavern named the earl's bower but generally bold and naked and sombre in tint as the colours employed by the savage rosa such were the distinguishing features of the gorge of cliviger when nicholas traversed it now the high embankments and mighty arches of a railway fill up its recesses and span its gullies the roar of the engine is heard 
where the cry of the bird of prey alone resounded and clouds of steam usurp the place of the mist wreaths on its crags formerly the high cliffs abounded with hawks the rocks echoed with their yells and screeches and the spots adjoining their nests resembled in the words of the historian of the district whitaker little charnel houses for the bones of game formerly also on some inaccessible point built the rock eagle and reared its brood from year to year the gaunt wolf had once ravaged the glens and the sly fox and fierce catter mountain still harboured within them nor were these the only objects of dread the superstitious declared the gorge was haunted by a frightful hirsute demon yclept hobthurst the general savage character of the ravine was relieved by some spots of exquisite beauty where the traveller might have lingered with delight if apprehension of assault from robber or visit from hobthurst had not urged him on numberless waterfalls gushing from fissures in the hills coursed down their seamy sides looking like threads of silver as they sprang from point to point one of the most beautiful of these cascades issuing from a gully in the rocks near the cavern called earl's bower fell in rainy seasons in one unbroken sheet of a hundred and fifty feet through the midst of the gorge ran a swift and brawling stream known by the appellation of the calder but it must not be confounded with the river flowing past wally abbey the course of this impetuous current was not always restrained within its rocky channel and when swollen by heavy rains it would frequently invade the narrow causeway running beside it and spreading over the whole width of the gorge render the road almost impassable through this rocky and sombre defile and by the side of the brawling calder which dashed swiftly past him nicholas took his way the hawks were yelling overhead the rooks were cawing on the topmost branches of some tall timber on which they built a raven was croaking lustily in the wood and a pair of eagles were soaring in the still glowing sky by and by the glen contracted and a wall of steep rocks on either side hemmed the shuddering traveller in instinctively he struck spurs into his horse and accelerated his pace the narrow glen expands the precipices fall further back and the traveller breathes more freely still he does not relax his speed for his imagination has been at work in the gloom peopling his path with lurking robbers or grinning boggarts he begins to fear he shall lose his gold and execrates his folly for incurring such a heedless risk but it is too late now to turn back it grows rapidly dusk and objects become less and less distinct assuming fantastical and fearful forms a blasted tree clinging to a rock and thrusting a bare branch across the road looks to the squire like a bandit and a white owl bursting from a bush scares him as if it had been hobthurst himself however in spite of these and other alarms for which he is indebted to excited fancy he hurries on and is proceeding at a thundering pace when all at once his horse comes to a stop arrested by a tall female figure resembling that scene near the mountain cairn at the entrance of the gorge nicholas's blood ran cold for though in this case he could not apprehend plunder he was fearful of personal injury for he believed the woman to be a witch mustering up courage however he forced robin to proceed if his progress was meant to be barred a better spot for the purpose could not have been selected a narrow road scarcely two feet in width ran round the ledge of a tremendous crag jutting so far into the glen that it almost met the steep barrier of rocks opposite it between these precipitous crags dashed the river in a foaming cascade nearly twelve feet in height and the steep narrow causeway winding beside it as above described was rendered excessively slippery and dangerous from the constant cloud of spray arising from the fall at the highest and narrowest point of the ledge and occupying nearly the whole of its space with an overhanging rock on one side of her and a roaring torrent on the other stood the tall woman determined apparently from her attitude and deportment to oppose the squire's further progress as nicholas advanced 
he became convinced that it was the same person he had seen near the cairn but when her features grew distinguishable he found to his surprise that it was nance redfern hello nance he cried what are you doing here lass eh come to warn ye squire she replied you once did me a sarvice and i hanna forgotten it that's why i watch ye fro the cairn cliffs and motion ye to give back but ye didna understand me signs i wouldna heed em so i be come dear to stay ye you're a danger i tell ye in danger of what my good woman demanded the squire uneasily a being robbed and plundered o your gowd replied nance there are five men waiting to set upon ye a mile further on at the bowder stones indeed exclaimed nicholas they will get little for their pains i have no money about me don't i think to deceive me squire rejoined nance i know ye borrowed three hundred pound ye gowd for young rutchart ashton and as surely as ye hae it o' under your jerkin so surely will ye lose it if ye dunna turn back a gee on without me keeping ye company i have no objection on earth to your company nance replied the squire quite the contrary but how the devil should these rascals expect me and above all how should they conjecture i should come so well provided for sooth to say such is not ordinarily the case with me i know it well squire replied nance with a laugh but they have received certain information of your movements there is only one person who could give them such information cried nicholas but i cannot will not suspect him if you think in a lawrence fog you know far wider th mark squire replied nance what fog leagued with robbers impossible exclaimed nicholas no it's na so impossible as all that returned nance you can stare when i tell you he has robbed your money a time without your being aware on it you were unwise enough to send him round to your friends to borrow money for you true so i was but luckily no one would lend me any said nicholas there you're wrong squire for unluckily they all did replied nance with a scarcely suppressed laugh roger knoll gied him one hundred thomas whittaker of home another rutchart parker of brown's home another and more the same way and the rascal pocketed it all and never brought me back one farthing cried nicholas in a transport of rage i'll have him hanged sure hanging's too good for him to deceive me his friend his benefactor his patron in such a manner to dwell in my house eat at my table drink my wine wear my habiliments ride my horses hunt with my hounds has the dog no conscience very little i'm afeard replied nance and the worst of it is continued the squire new lights breaking upon him i shall be liable for all the sums he's received he was my confidential agent and the lenders will come upon me it must be six or seven hundred pounds that he's obtained in this nefarious way zounds i shall go mad you were to blame for trusting him squire rejoined nance you ought to have made proper inquiries about him at first and then you'd have found out what sort of chap he were for now and tell thee laura's fog is cheaper a band of robbers and all the black and villainous deeds done o late in this place have been perpetrated by his men a poor gentleman were murdered by him in this very spot the week afore last and his body cast into the river fog of course had no want in the foul deed but he would not interfere to prevent it if he had been here for he never scrupled shedding blood and if he'd been content with robbing you squire they would not have betrayed him but when he proposed to cut your throttle because as he said dead men tell no tales i could hold out no longer and resolved to give you warning what a monstrous and unheard-of villain cried the squire but is he one of the ambuscade nance replied in the affirmative then by heaven i will confront him i will hew him down pursued nicholas gripping the hilt of his sword now you sir tell thee in view of a power and guilt said nance tap me wi ye and then carry ye safely through em more but gee alone and ye'll ne'er see down em again and now it's reet i should tell ye who lawrence fogg really is 
what new wonder is in store for me cried nicholas who is he maybe i hear tell that mother demdike had a son and a doubter replied nance the doubter being of course elizabeth device and the son christopher demdike being supposed to be dead howsomever this is not the case for lawrence fogg is he i guessed as much when you began cried nicholas he has a cursedly bad look about the eyes a damned demdike physiognomy what an infernal villain the fellow must be without a jot of natural feeling why he has this very day assisted at his nephew's capture and caused his own sister to be arrested oh i have been properly duped to lodge a son of that infernal hag in my house feed him clothe him make him my friend take him the viper to my bosom i have been rightly served but he shall hang he shall hang that is some consolation though slight but how do you know all this nance dunna ax me she replied whatever i ha been to christopher demdike i bear him now love now for as i ha told you he is a black-hearted murthering villain well let me get up behind you and then bring you through scatheless and to-morrow you may arrest the whole band at malkin tower malkin tower exclaimed the squire in fresh surprise this accounts for all the strange sights said to have been seen there of late and which i treated as mere fables but ah a terrible thought crosses me what have i done mistress nutter will be there to-night and i have sent her death and destruction she will fall into their hands i must go there at once i cannot take any assistance with me that would betray the poor lady if you trust me it help you through the difficulty replied nance get up then quickly lass since it must be so rejoined nicholas with this he moved forward and giving her his hand she was instantly seated behind him upon robin who seemed no way incommoded by his double burthen but dashed down the further side of the causeway in answer to a sharp application of the spur passing her arms round the squire's waist nance maintained her seat well and in this way they rattled along heedless of the increasing difficulties of the road or the fast-gathering gloom the mile was quickly passed and nance whispered in the squire's ear that they were approaching the boulder stones presently they came to a narrow glen half filled with huge rocky fragments detached from the toppling precipices on either side and forming an admirable place of ambuscade one rock larger than the rest completely commanded the pass and as the squire advanced a thundering voice from it called to him to stay and the injunction being disregarded the barrel of a gun was protruded from the bushes covering its brow and a shot fired at him though well aimed the ball struck the ground beneath his horse's feet and nicholas continued his way unmoved while the faulty marksman jumped down the crag at the same time four other men started from their places of concealment behind the stones and levelling their calivers at the fugitives fired the sharp discharges echoed along the gorge and the shots rattled against the rocks but none of them took effect and nicholas might have gone on without further hindrance but despite nancy's remonstrances who urged him to go on he pulled up to await the coming of the person who had first challenged him scarcely an instant elapsed before he was beside the squire and presented a petronel at his head notwithstanding the gloom nicholas recognised him ah is it thou accursed traitor cried nicholas i could scarcely believe in thy villainy but now i'm convinced the jade you've got behind you has told you who i am i see replied fogg i will settle with her and on but this will say further explanations with you and he discharged the petronel full at the squire but the ball rebounded as if his doublet had been quilted it was in fact lined with gold on seeing the squire unhurt the robber captain uttered an exclamation of rage and astonishment you are mistaken you see perfidious villain cried nicholas you have yet to render an account of all the wrongs you have done me but meantime you shall not pass unpunished and as he spoke he snatched the petronel from fogg and with the butt end 
dealt him a tremendous blow on the head felling to the ground by this time the other robbers had descended from the rocks and seeing the fall of their leader rushed forward to avenge him but nicholas did not tarry for any further encounter but fully satisfied with what he had done struck spurs into robin and galloped off for a few minutes he could hear the shouts of the men but they soon afterwards died away little more than half the ravine had been traversed when the rencontre above described took place and rendered doubly so by the obscurity no further hindrance occurred till just as nicholas was quitting the gloomy intricacies of the gorge and approaching the more open country beyond it at this point robin fell throwing both him and nance and when the animal rose again he was found to be so much injured that it was impossible to mount him there was no resource but to proceed to burnley which was still three or four miles distant on foot in this dilemma nance volunteered to provide the squire with another steed but he resolutely refused the offer no no none of your broomsticks for me he cried no devil's horses i don't know where they may carry me my own legs must serve me now i'll just take poor robin out of the road and then trudge off for burnley as fast as i can with this he led the horse to a small green mead skirting the stream and taking off his saddle and bridle and depositing them carefully under a tree he patted the animal on the neck promising to return for him on the morrow and then set off at a brisk pace with nance walking beside him they had not got far however when the clattering of hoofs was heard behind them and it was evident that several horsemen were rapidly approaching nance stopped listened for a moment and then declaring it was demdike and his band in pursuit seized the squire's arm and drew him out of the road and under the shelter of some bushes of hazel the robber captain could only have been stunned it appeared and as soon as he had recovered from the effects of the blow had mounted his horse which was concealed with those of his men behind the rocks and started after the fugitives such was the construction put upon the matter by nance and the event proved it correct a loud shout from the horsemen and a sudden halt proclaimed that poor robin had been discovered and this circumstance seemed to give great satisfaction to demdike who loudly declared that they were now sure of overtaking the runaways they cannot be far off he cried but they will most likely attempt to hide themselves so look well about you so saying he rode on and it was evident from the noise that the men implicitly obeyed his injunctions nothing however was found and ere many minutes demdike came up and glancing at the hazels behind which the fugitives were hidden he discharged a petronel into the largest tree but as no movement followed the report he said i thought i saw something move here but i suppose i was mistaken no doubt they've got further than we expected or have retired into some of the cloughs in which case it will be useless to search for them however we will make sure of them in this way two of you shall form an ambuscade near home and two further on within half a mile of burnley and shall remain on the watch till dawn so that you will be sure to capture them and when taken make away with them without hesitation unless my skull had been of the strongest that butcherly squire would have cracked it so he shall have no grace from me and as to that treacherous witch nance redfern she deserves death at our hands and she shall have her deserts i have long suspected her and indeed was a fool to trust one of the vile chattox brood who are all my natural enemies but no matter i shall have my revenge the men having promised compliance with their captain's command he went on as to myself he said i shall go forthwith and as fast as my horse can carry me to malkin tower and i will tell you why it's not that i dislike the game we're upon but i have better to play just now tom shaw the cockmaster at downham who's in my pay rode over to wally this afternoon to bring me word that a certain lady who's been long concealed in the manor house will be taken to malkin tower to-night the intelligence is certain for he had obtained it from old crouch the huntsman who is to escort her thus mistress nutter for you all know who i mean will fall naturally into our hands and we can wring any sums of money we like out of her 
for though she's abandoned her property to her daughter alison she can no doubt have as much as she wants and i will take care she asks for plenty or I will try the effect of some of those instruments of torture which I was lucky enough to find in the dungeons of Malkin Tower, and which were used for a like purpose by my predecessor, Blackburn the Freebooter. Are you content, me lads? Aye, aye, Captain Demdike, they replied. Upon this the whole party set forward, and were speedily out of hearing. As soon as they thought it prudent to come forth, the squire and Nance emerged from their place of shelter. "'What is to be done?' exclaimed the former, who was almost in a state of distraction. "'The villain has announced his intention of going to Malkin Tower, and Mistress Nutter will assuredly fall into his hands. Oh, that I could stop him or get there before him!' "'Yes, Jan, if you like to ride with me,' said Nance. "'But how? In what way?' asked Nicholas. "'Leave that to me.' replied nance breaking off a long branch of hazel tak hold o' this she cried the squire obeyed and was instantly carried off his legs and whisked through the air at a prodigious rate he felt giddy and confused but did not dare to leave go lest he should be dashed to pieces while nance's wild laughter rang in his ears over the bleached and perpendicular crag startling the eagle from his eyrie over the yawning gully with the torrent roaring beneath him over the sharp ridges of the hill over townley park over burnley steeple over the wide valley beyond he went until at last bewildered out of breath and like one in a dream he alighted on a brown bare healthy expanse and within a hundred yards of a tall circular stone structure which he knew to be malkin tower End of part 15Price Threepence, Blackburn, The Times Steam Printing Works, Corporation Street, 1876. Pendle Hill, Great Pendle Hill and Penny Ghent and Lofty Ingleborough. Ye will not find three grander hills and trace Old England thorough. Old Rhyme. The sun arose in mist, which soon gave way to his bright beams that gild the mountain heather. The sky was clear betokening a day of heat excessive and twas doubtful whether the utmost breath of wind could waft a feather or shake the poplar's many twinkling leaves so calm the morn was when we met together beneath blackburn station's humble eaves wrapped in that mystic robe which faithful friendship weaves the train arrived we in with whistle shrill with hollow snort and plunge the engine started while echo answered loud from audley hill with speed accelerated we departed from bridge to bridge we flew like lightning darted from cloud to cloud and while upon the road our converse was most sweet and open-hearted for every single soul threw down its load of cares and flew upon the wings of mirth abroad till nab's hill's northern side which calder's waters with deep dark winding swill do proudly lave where oaks and elms the mountain's giant daughters bend their broad branches o'er the dashing wave and blithe kingfishers dip their plumage brave disclosing hues of glossy green and gold unto our eager eyes in prospect gave the ruins drear of wally abbey old which spoke to us of deeds that must remain untold for if the poet should turn antiquary and bring such deeds of darkness forth to light stale history would make my muse miscarry and that would be a pitiable plight for me as well as those for whom i write hence we with such dead subjects will dispense and seize on matter more pure and bright the meaning eye the eye the speaking countenance and all the social flow of female eloquence yes reader let us leave off moralising and with the rod of reason crack the crown of visions 
on the wings of fancy rising those pictures of the past that grimly frown athwart the stream of ages which would drown our modest mirth and dull our golden glee now on the vale of ribblesdale look down where grove and mansion you may see with lordly mitten bounded by her rivers three but clitheroe's ancient castle now appears which well deserves the tribute of a verse its feudal form tells tales of other years so sad and long the muse may none rehearse of aunt let pomp and pageantry dispense by fancy formed bright reason's eye to blear hark hope whose eye the future's veil doth pierce bid patience smile and deem fair freedom near and cries behold the past hath left a footprint here and now the rattling engine has arrived the ancient town of far-famed clitheroe where passengers like swarms of bees unhived with noise and hustle bounding to and fro make jarring music some prepare to go a journey whilst the rest returning home so elevated by the sights they saw scarce condescend their dearest friends to go thus spreads the railway rage which makes the masses roam so we amongst the rest all hail and well and arm in arm went marching through the town in quest of some convenient hotel where we might quench our thirst and sitting down before a good substantial breakfast crown our teasing appetites and then prepare with firmness to withstand the fiery frown of solar beams which pierce the forehead bare as if apollo shot red arrows through the air eftsoons we sought and found a trusty friend whose means though small did everything he could prepared as food and drink such as both lend the palate pleasure and supply the blood with health and vigour and we understood full well the value of his services when our parched lips bathed in a snowy flood of rich new milk which far superior is to juice of tuscan grape or china's beverage our homely meal dispatched we made a grave and buried lazy sluggishness therein then for our leader took god speed that brave and nimble racer that doth always win thus did our tour pedestrian begin from clitheroe castle up to pendle hill for distance cared we not one single pin when linked like juno's swans or better still like milton's thunderbolts or ancient jack and jill the first thing that attracted curiosity and put our scientific powers in play the first too that arrested the velocity of our quick moving footsteps by the way was nature's ample book which open lay within the fossil rocks of coplo delf where shellfish zoophyte and the solid spray of stony waves stiff piled up shelf on shelf looked like a sea turned marble by medusa's self we climbed those wave-like rocks to get some fossils and found full many some with forms complete which well repaid us for the falls and jostles with which we in obtaining them did meet and noble was the thought the feeling sweet and pleasant which our raptured spirits felt in truth it was a philosophic treat on which the mind of tyndall might have dwelt and seen the waxen gods of orthodoxy melt before the sun of science whose full blaze beamed through the darkness of ten thousand years while reason's convex mirror caught its rays and burned the robe which superstition wears her lamb's wool vesture too whose loss unbears her bloody bosom and her sable heart let no fanatic full of holy fears nor any pious pastor shrug and start lest faith should thus be slain by truth's creed piercing dart emerging from the delf an exhalation seemed from the hollow earth's hot wound to rise whose quivering glitter spread such a sensation of wonder we could scarcely believe our eyes twas smokeless noiseless colourless likewise paler than moonbeams dazzling as the sun more thin than air more clear than summer skies comparison on earth cannot be won for that most wondrous strange and weird phenomenon like the red-throated gape of an hyena whose marble teeth are stained with human blood or like the crater of the red volcano when bubbling up its burning lava flood 
the lime kiln did appear to those who stood half breathless gazing down the dazzling brink where solid rocks are molten down to mud which no good man beholds but he must think about the bigot's hell which fools to faith do link and so did we but busy recollection aroused us from our reverie and full soon bade us to be moving in the right direction for pendle if we would enjoy the boon that she grants to the eye before the moon shot from the flaming axle of the sun where old hyperion in meridian's swoon reels round the dome of heaven and doth run his chariot to the west where night sits robed in dun a road that reached up to the constellations a pile of earth that propped the firmament a landmark for the sea traversing nations a universal looking battlement a fragment which from heaven had been rent in god's strife or the germ of some new world which in almighty anger had been sent on titans bold with flags against the skies unfurled did pendle seem to us a few miles from it but when arrived at the gigantic base of that dread mount from what had seemed the summit a loftier hill its dome-like head did raise through the blue heavens then with blank amaze with speechless wonder we beheld the scene e'en cattle stood contemplative to gaze as though endowed with reason they had been where height had chanted the hill to blue from brightest green we breasted her steep brow close by the side of one huge wall which to the hilltop led we followed in the footsteps of our guide and by a well sat down to share our bread the cows for coolness to the rivers fled and with their tails lashed off the angry flies the sheep lay panting on their grassy bed half roasted and complained with bleating cries while liquid lightning rained down from the molten skies and as we sat upon that skyey mountain though we few dainties had we ate our fill and drank fresh water from as pure a fountain as ever was the parent of a rill while fancy formed a bridge from hill to hill and thought of the tremendous depths below whose awful image haunts my memory still and still my mind itself itself doth overawe by brooding o'er such thoughts as none but poets know then gathering up the fragments of our feast where maps and scraps lay scattered on the ground like giants with new wine our strength increased broad swamps and dykes were covered at a bound we ranged the heights of lofty pendle round where gleaming through the dim blue atmosphere we saw a cirque of hills whose heads were crowned with cloudy diadems and some did peer above the clouds and bask in sunbeams pure and clear with blackstone edge and cribden and the pike of rivington before us full in view huge hambledon heaved his broad back which like some titan's form its giant shadow threw on village and on valley but the blue of heaven through the white clouds of the north was glinting glory down where well we knew old skiddaw and helvellyn glooming forth with scawfell pike appeared the boundary of the earth the ribble like a silver serpent wound her gleaming course down to the estuary by rock and scar her devious way she found through home and dingle clough and rugged quarry among the meads mid cornfields seemed to tarry as loath to leave their fair and flowery nooks and lingering long as though she meant to marry those offspring of the hills the bounding brooks in such romantic wise as rhymed in poets books we stood tiptoe on pendle's highest point and gazed around until the scanty breast could scarce contain the heart that fluttered buoyant and bounding seemed to fly as though it would nest in heaven then converging toward the west and quite fatigued bathed in a hot deluge of sunbeams soon the rest sat down to rest i laid me down and gave my face refuge beneath my hat and slept and lo broad black and huge i dreaming saw a pyramid arise spontaneous from the earth its spire did make a rent in the heavens blue and through the skies the top gleamed like a tower through a lake 
its weight did make the mighty hill to shake and trembling rattle all her rocky bones then falling with the sound of an earthquake or like the rumbling of jove's thunderstones drew from the stars harsh echoes loud as titan's groans with that i started up in haste and heat and saw ye gods not pendle hill crushed flat nor yet an earthquake gaping at my feet but horror seized my soul my sunday hat was running down the hill with swiftness that outsped the winds yet i stood still and staunch my luckless look the rest were laughing at like some tall tree robbed of its topmost branch and saw my brand new hat turn to an avalanche as soon as i'd recalled my wandering senses that is to say when i came to myself despairing i said to myself ah whence is this calamity some mountain elf whose bower i've profaned perhaps that delf was haunted by the ghost of ancient ocean that guards it as a miser guards his pelf and since i of its rights had got no notion as thus endowed my hat with powers of locomotion however tis a marvellous affair my hat is gone unless my head go next i'll follow altogether say some prayer or mutter to my god some holy text to keep at bay the spirit i have vexed the queen of pendle's witches old and grim by whose dread power i may be unsexed or like a traitor vile torn from limb to limb except through supplication i protected am by him i called to my companions one by one besought their aid for ills come on me thick i told them how my wretched tile had gone my hat bewitched had fairly cut its stick some ran but i crept cautious down the nick of pendle and when meeting at the foot two things were there that touched mirth to the quick and shook the tree of laughter to its root my locomotive hat and hindle's rock-rent boot and many other things we need not mention contributed to swell the tide of fun the wit the tact the talent the invention displayed by all in jest catch rhyme or pun made each soul seem a ray of satire's sun and oft on me the joke severely ran it sometimes made me silent as a nun yet ever and anon my tongue began to hanker after speech in spite of blame or ban not butler byron burns pope swift and pinder all put together could have caused more mirth than walker did when pride sought not to hinder or strangle native humour in its birth of repartee with him there was no dearth he found a hole in everybody's sleeve the females feared his wit would fire the earth it sparkled so his lightnings did bereave solemnity of life and made dull envy grieve strange tales were told of witches long ago old mother demdike whose unholy power caused inky floods from pendle's breast to flow and filched the blush from many a human a flower whose midnight orgies held in malkin tower through blight on harvest blanched the bloom of spring made summer clouds withhold the fruitful shower while withered at her will each living thing all ale turned sour cows dry and cuckoos ceased to sing of demdike's wrinkled rival mother chattox the abbot paslew the dool upon dun the pig bewitched enchanted spades and mattocks the dog familiar and the magic gun such webs were woven and such yarns were spun of many a monk transformed into a tyke and nymphs allured to fates they could not shun of fairies banshees boggarts and the like all wound up with a song the devil and little mike we took the road to clitheroe once more and just arrived in time to take our tea and visit the old castle when twas o'er and well the same did with my soul agree for often had my spirit yearned to see and minutely inspect its ruins too to tread the prison yard with footsteps free to scale the battlements as now i do and view those splintered gaps where cromwell's balls swept through for even now in thought i tread the height of those time-smitten battlements which crown that gothic pile those relics ruin bright 
those huge moss-mantled walls whose sullen frown hangs like a thunder-cloud above the town as when some alpine rock reared to the sky upon the petty hills looks proudly down tall forests dwarfed to firs beneath it lie so from this height the farmstead dwindles to a sty what form upon the bosom of the wind do i behold with sable tresses streaming and frowning brows that indicate a mind of pride and valour whilst revenge is gleaming from his red eyeballs and the bright sun beaming on his brass shield he shakes his gory lance in the fair face of science then loud screaming falls back smit by the lightning of her glance she treads him down to death but bids his slaves advance exclaiming lo behold the tyrant slain the haughty king through whom your sires have bled through whom yourselves still clank the galling chain through whom your mother's tears have long been shed through whom an age of slavery hath sped o'er your ancestors fallen at your feet lies vulture-hearted feudalism dead fell obloquy shall weave his winding sheet whilst freedom son of science fills his vacant seat and now the vision vanishes from sight harsh reason rudely rings fair fancy's knell as vanish all the pleasant dreams of night at the hoarse clanging of the factory bell so flit those fairy forms whose mystic spell hath held my heart in bondage while my tongue spoke of things past as present but farewell once more stern reason bids me end my song to tell how we returned would mar and make it long yet independent of the potent aid of fiction-loving fancy let me say a more delightful tour could not be made within the lapse of one bright summer's day let all whose english hearts would homage pay to nature in her naked majesty repair to pendle and make no delay but like the bard proceed extempore and prove his rustic wine no strained hyperbole End of part sixteen part seventeen of travels in lancashire chapel island or an adventure on ulverston sands by edwin waugh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The wills above be done, but I would fain die a dry death. The Tempest. I have spent many a pleasant day at the village of Bardsey, three miles south of Ulverston. It stands close to Conishead Park, high upon a fertile elbow of land, the base of which is washed on two sides by the waters of Morecambe Bay. It is an old hamlet of about fifty houses, nearly all in one wandering street which begins at the bottom of a knoll on the Ulverston side, and then climbs to a point near the summit where three roads meet, and where the houses on one side stand back a few yards, leaving an open ground like a little market-place. Upon the top of the knoll, a few yards east of this open space, the church stands, overlooking sea and land all round. From the centre of the village, the street winds on towards the beach, at this end a row of neat houses stands at a right angle upon an eastward incline facing the sea the tide washes up within fifty yards of these houses at high water at the centre of the village too half a dozen pleasant cottages leave the street like the fin of a fish in a quiet lane which leads down into a little shady glen at the foot of burr Crig. the same lane leads by another route over the top of that wild hill into the beautiful vale of Urswick. Bardsey is a pretty, out-of-the-way place, and the country about it is very picturesque and varied. It is close to the sea, and commands a fine view of the bay, and of its opposite shores for nearly forty miles. About a mile west of the village, Birkrig rises high above green pastures and leafy dells that lap his feet in beauty northward the road to ulverston leads through the finest part of conishead park which begins near the end of the village 
the park is one of the most charming pieces of undulant woodland scenery i ever beheld an old writer calls it the paradise of furness on the way to ulverston from bardsea the leven estuary shows itself in many a beautiful gleam through the trees of the park and the fells of cartmel are in full view beyond it is one of the pleasantest one of the quietest walks in the kingdom the last time i saw bardsea it was about the middle of july i had gone there to spend a day or two with a friend there had not been a cloud in the heavens for a week and the smell of new hay came on every sigh that stirred the leaves the village looked like an island of sleepy life with a sea of greenery around it surging up to the very doors of its white houses and flinging the spray of nature's summer harmonies all over the place the songs of birds the rustle of trees the ripple of the brook at the foot of the meadows and the murmur of the sea all seemed to float together through that nest of man making it drowsy with pleasure it was fairly lapped in soothing melody every breath of air brought music on its wings and every song was laden with sweet smells nature loved the little spot for she caressed it and croodled about it like a mother singing lullabies to a tired child and bardsey was pleased and still as if it knew it all it seemed the enchanted ear of the landscape for everywhere else the world was alive with the jocund restlessness of the season my friend and i wandered about from morning to night in the heat of the day the white roads glared in the sun and in some places the air seemed to tremble at about a man's height from the ground as i have seen it tremble above a burning kiln sometimes but for broad day we had the velvet glades and shady woods of conishead to ramble in and many a rich old lane and some green dells where little brooks ran wimpling their tiny undersongs in liquid trebles between banks of nodding wild flowers our evening walks were more delightful still for when soft twilight came melting the distinctions of the landscape in her dreamy loveliness she had hardly time to draw a thin veil o'er the day before sea and land began to shine again under the radiance of the moon wandering among such scenes at such a time was enough to touch any man's heart with gratitude for the privilege of existence in this world of ours my friend's house stands upon a buttress shelf of land halfway up the slope which leads from the shore into bardsea it is the most seaward dwelling of the place and it is bowered about on three sides with little plots of garden one of them kept as a playground for the children it commands a glorious view of the bay from hampsfell all round by arnside and lancaster down to fleetwood sometimes at night i have watched the revolutions of the fleetwood light from the front of the house whilst listening to the surge of the tide along the shore at the foot of the hill one day when dinner was over we sat down to smoke at an open window which looked out upon the bay it was about the turning of the tide for a fisherman's cart was coming slowly over the sands from the nets at low water the day was unusually hot but before we had smoked long i felt as if i couldn't rest any longer indoors where shall we go this afternoon said i knocking the ashes out of my pipe upon the outside sill well replied my friend i have been thinking that we couldn't do better than stroll into the park a while what do you say agreed said i it's a bonny piece of woodland i dare say many a roman soldier has been pleased with the place as he marched through it sixteen centuries ago perhaps so said he smiling and taking his stick from the corner but the scene must have been very different then come along at the garden gate we found three of his flaxen-headed children romping with a short-legged scotch terrier called trusty the dog's wild eyes shone in little slits of dusky fire through the rusty thicket of grey hair which overhung them trusty was beside himself with joy when we came into the road and he worried our shoes and shook our trousers slops in a sham fury as if they were imaginary rats and he bounced about and barked till the quiet scene from bardsea to burke rig rang with his noisy glee 
some of the birds about us seemed to stop singing for a few seconds and after they had taken an admiring look sideways at the little fellow they burst out again louder than ever and in more rollicking strains heartily infected with the frisky riot of that little four-legged marlocker both the dog and the children clamoured to go with us my friend hesitated as first one then another tugged at him and said pa let me go turning to me he scratched his head and said i've a good mind to take willie the lad instantly gave a twirl round on one heel and clapped his hands and then laid hold of his father's coat lap by way of clenching the bargain at once but just then his mother appeared at the gate and said eh no willie you'd better not go you'll be so tired come stay with me that's a good boy willie let go his hold slowly and fell back with a disappointed look trusty seemed to know that there was a hitch in the matter for he suddenly became quieter and going up to willie he licked his hands consolingly and then sitting down beside him he looked round from one to another to see how the thing was to end don't keep tea waiting for us said my friend we'll be back in time for an early supper very well replied his good wife we'll have something nice don't be late the dog was now whining and wrestling in the arms of willie who was holding him back we made our bows and bade good-bye to the children and to their mother and then turned up the road before we had gone many yards she called out i say chris if you go as far as ulverston call at mrs seatle's and at Tower and fells for some things which i ordered bella rig can bring them down in a cart these children want a new skipping rope too and you might bring something for willie the little girls began to dance about shaking their sunny locks and singing hey a new skipping rope a new skipping rope then the youngest seized her father's hand and cocking up her rosy buttonhole of her mouth she said pa pa lift me up i want to tell you something well what is it pet said he taking her in his arms clipping his neck as far as she could she said dip me a tiss first and then she whispered in his ear if you buy me a big doll i'll sing down in a low and drassy bed four times when you come home now then trusty eated my udder doll when we was playing shop in the garden and then he had to kiss them again and promise i know not what once more we said good-bye and walked up towards the white village the chime of sweet voices sinking into a silvery hum as we got farther off everything in bardsey was unusually still most of the doors and windows were open and now and then somebody peeped out as we passed by and said it was a fine day turning round to look at the sands we saw the dumpy figure of owd manuel the fisherman limping up from the foot of the slope with his coat slung upon his arm the old man stopped and wiped his forehead and gave his crutch a flourish by way of salutation we waved our hats in reply and went on at the centre of the village stands the comfortable inn kept by old gilly the quaint veteran who after spending the prime of manhood in hard service among the border smugglers has settled down to close the evening of his life in this retired nest here too all was still except the measured sound of a shoemaker's hammer ringing out from the open door of a cottage where capel sat at his bench beating time upon a leather sole to the tune of a country song and on the shady side next door to the yard wall which partly encloses the front of the old inn the ruddy snow-capped face and burly figure of old tweedler was visible as still as a statue he was in his shirt-sleeves leaning against the door-cheek of his little grocery shop smoking a long pipe and looking dreamily at the sunny road tweedler needs a good deal of wakening at any time but when he is once fairly wakened he is a tolerable player on the clarionet and not a very bad fiddler and he likes to talk about his curious wanderings up and down the kingdom with show folk when the old man had found us out and had partly succeeded in getting his heavy limbs into a mild disposition to move he sidled forth from his little threshold 
and came towards us gurgling something from his throat that was not unlike the low growl of an old hoarse dog his gruff slow-motioned voice sounded clear all round waking the echoes of the sleepy houses as he said well gentlemen what where are you for to-day we told him that we were going down to the priory for a stroll but we should like to call at gillies first for a few minutes if he would go in with us well said he it's a very hot day i don't mind having an odd jill in with you and i'll follow in a minute and then he sidled back to his nest there was not a sound of life in old gillies house but the trim cap of his kind dame was visible inside bobbing to and fro by the window of the little bar gilly in his kind-hearted way always calls her mammy we looked in at the bar and the old lady gave us a cordial welcome my good man has just gone to lie down said she but i'll go and tell him we begged that she would let him rest and bring us three glasses of her best ale the sun shone in strongly at the open back door at the rear of the house there is a shady veranda and a garden in front of it there we sat down looking at the bright bay the city of lancaster was very distinct on the opposite side of the water more than twenty miles off in a few minutes we heard tweedler's cart horse tread as he came through the lobby with two books in his hand there said he handing one of them to me i've turned that up a mangalot a lummerit house i warned it's just the thing for ye what the devil is think ye for it's past my skill it was an old well-thumbed latin delectus with one back off and several leaves gone it was not of much use to me but when the old man said now that's a fine book i'll award and i'll make ye a present on it i felt bound to receive it thankfully and i did so and this said he holding up the other this is a book of sangs gummelin sangs it was a thin volume in papered boards a cheap edition of anderson's ballads printed in double column royal octavo ay replied my friend i should like to look at that very well said tweedler put it in your pocket i'll land it ye and then as if half repenting he continued but i set a deal of store of that book i don't think as i could get another for ony money you shall have it back in a day or two said my friend oh replied tweedler it's all right wi ye but i wouldn't a lant it onybody mind ye my friend put the book in his pocket promising to take a special care of it and then we drank up and came away and tweedler sauntered back to lean against the door cheek and smoke it was about half past one when we walked out at the landward end of the village the only person we met was a horseman riding hastily up from the skirt of the park as he sped by i recognised the tall figure and benevolent face of dr anderson of ulverston near bardsey hall an old lane leads off at the right hand of the road down to the sea beach from whence there is a pleasant walk along the shore of the leven estuary to a little fishing village called sandside and thence a good road between meadowlands up into ulverston after a minute's conversation at the end of this lane we agreed to go that way when we came out upon the shore my friend stopped and looked across the sands was you ever on chapel island said he pointing towards it no replied i but i should like to see that spot are there any remains of the old chantry left a few said he mostly incorporated with the house of a fisherman who lives on the island but we'll go over to it there's nice time to get across before the tide comes in it's not much more than a mile i was pleased with the idea of seeing this little historic island of which i had read and heard so much so we strode out towards it at once the sands between looked as level as a bowling green and perfectly dry and it did not seem to me more than half the distance my friend had said before we had gone many yards he began a story the last time i was on the island there were several friends but old we had better take something to eat and drink they'll have next to nothing there and we shall have to stop till the next ebb wait here i'll run back i shan't be many minutes 
and away he went to the green lane there was an old black boat on the sands close to where he had left me i got into it and pulling my hat over my eyes to shade the sun away i lay down on my back and listened to the birds in conishead park it was something more than a quarter of an hour before he appeared at the end of the lane again with a brown bottle in one hand and with pockets well stored without stopping an instant he walked right out upon the sands wiping the perspiration from his brow as he went staring straight at the island he said come on we've no time to lose now but we can manage it i remember fancying that there was an unusual earnestness in the tone of his voice but i did not think much more about it at the time for the sand still seemed quite dry between us and the island so i followed him in silence looking round at the beautiful scene with my mind at ease my friend was a tall lithe man in the prime of life and a very good walker i had not been well for some days previous and i began to feel that the rate he was going at was rather too much for me besides i had a pair of heavy double-soled boots on and my thick coat was loaded with books and papers but i laboured on perspiring freely i thought that i could manage well enough to keep up with him for the distance we had to go in a few minutes we began to come to patches of wet sand where the feet sank at every step and our progress was slower though a good deal more difficult we did not seem to get much nearer the island though we were walking so hard this tried me still more and not seeing any need for such a desperate hurry i said don't go so fast but he kept up the pace and pointing to where a white sail was gliding up the other side of the island towards ulverston he said come along the main channel's filling we've a channel to cross on this side yet do you see yon white line it's the tide rushing in come on we can't turn back now it was only then that i began to see how we were situated and i tramped on at his heels through the soft wet sand perspiring and panting and still without seeming to get over much ground in a few minutes we came to a shallow channel about eight or ten yards across we splashed through without speaking it only took us a little above the knee but i perceived that the water was rising rapidly thinking that the danger was over i stammered out stop slacken a bit we're all right now but the tone as well as the words of his reply startled me as he shot ahead crying this is not it this is nothing come on i was getting exhausted and when he cried out double and broke into a run i had not breath to spare for an answer but i struggled on desperately the least false step would have brought me down and if i had fallen i think that even that delay would have been more than we had to spare three or four minutes brought us up to the channel he had spoken of it was an old bed of the river leven it must have been from fifteen to twenty yards wide at that moment and the tide was increasing it at a terrible rate when we got to the edge of the water i was so done up that i panted out stop i can't go so fast but my friend turned half round with a wild look and almost screamed but you must it's death then we went into the water without any more words i was a little on one side of him and about two yards in the rear it's a wonder to me now how i got through that deep strong tidal current the water must have revived me a little unconsciously to myself at the time before we had got to the middle i saw the book of ballads in the side pocket of my friend's shooting coat disappearing in the water as he went deeper into the channel my clothes began to grow heavy and the powerful action of the tide swayed me about so much that i could hardly keep my feet and i expected every moment being whelmed over but somehow i strove on the water deepening at every step a thousand thoughts crowded into my mind whilst wading that channel i remember distinctly the terrible stillness of the scene the frightful calm of the blue sea the rocky island with its little grove of trees waving gracefully in the sunshine all so beautiful yet all looking down with such a majestic indifference upon us as we wrestled for life with the rising tide about mid-channel when the water was high up my breast 
my friend gave a wild shout for help and i instantly did the same the island was not much more than forty yards off as my friend turned his head i caught a glimpse of his haggard look and i thought all was over the rocks re-echoed our cries but everything was still as death except the little grove of trees waving in the sunshine there was not a living soul in sight my heart sank and i remember feeling for an instant as if it was hardly worth while struggling any longer and here let me bear testimony to a brave act on the part of my friend in the deepest part of the channel when the water was near the top of my shoulders he put out his stick sideway and said get old i laid only a feeble grasp upon it for i had enough to do to keep my feet when we had waded about three yards in this way we began to see that we were ascending the opposite bank rapidly for it was steeper than the other one in two minutes more we were out upon the dry sands with our clothes clinging heavily about us and our hearts beating wild with mingled emotions now said i panting for breath let's sit down for a minute no no replied he in a resolute tone pushing on come farther off a walk of about thirty yards brought us to the foot of the rocks we clambered painfully up from stone to stone till we came upon a little footpath which led through the grove and along the garden to the old fisherman's cottage on the north side of the island as we entered the grove i found that my friend had kept hold of the brown bottle all the way i did not notice this till we came to the first patch of grassy ground where he flung the bottle down and walked on he told me afterwards that he believed it had helped to steady him whilst coming through the channel the fisherman's cottage is the only dwelling on the little island we found the door open and the birds were singing merrily among the green bushes about the entrance there was nobody in but the old fisherman's wife and she was deaf we might have shouted long enough before she could have heard us and if she had heard the poor old body could hardly have helped us when we got to the door she was busy with something at the fire and she did not hear our approach but turning round and seeing us standing there she gazed a few seconds with a frightened look and then lifting up both hands she cried out eh dear o me good folk what ever's to do wherever an you come fra eh how ever an you get an o we told our tale in a few words and then she began again good lord just dears childer what brought you through channel at sich an ill time as this it's a marcy at she weren't tryin mony a time over it mud a been me own lads and what trouble there'd a been for somebody what you'll have mothers living lightly happen wives and childer eh dear o me but come in wi ye whatever are ye standin there for come in and get your clays off do and get into bed this minute said she pointing to a little low-roofed room in the oldest part of the house the water from our clothes was running over the floor but when we spoke about it in the way of apology the old woman said never ye mind to atter you've had water enough for your hands i should think get in there i tell ye and tack ye weak clays off i don't stand gabbling but creep into bed like good lads and i'll bring ye some het tea to drink eh but ye ought to be thankful at ye are where ye are you'd better go into that inside room it'll be quieter leave your clays in this nar room and i'll ing em up to dry and put some of those and shirts on they're poor but they're comfortable now in wi ye ye can talk at efter the old woman had four grown-up sons labourers and fishermen and there was plenty of working clothes belonging to them lying about the two bedrooms after we had stripped our wet things and flung them down one after another with a splash we put on a rough shirt apiece and crept into bed in a few minutes she kept in with a quart pitcher full of hot tea and a cup to drink it from and setting it down upon a chair at the bedside she said now get that into ye and have a bit of a sleep we lay still talking and looking about us but we could not sleep 
the excitement we had gone through had left a band of intense pain across the lower part of my forehead as if a hot wire was burning into it the walls of the room we lay in were partly those of the ancient chapel which gives name to the island in fact the little ragged weed-grown belfry still stood above our heads almost the only relic of the ruined chantry except the foundations and some pieces of the old walls built up into the cottage this chapel was founded above five centuries ago by the monks of Furness. Here they prayed daily for the safety of the souls of such as crossed the sands with the morning tide. The Priory of Conishead was charged with the maintenance of guides across this estuary, which is perhaps the most dangerous part of the Morecambe Sands. Bain says of the route across these sands, The tract is from Holker Hill to Plumpton Hall, keeping Chapel Island a little to the left, and the mind of a visitor is filled with a mixture of awe and gratitude, when, in a short time after he has traversed this estuary, almost dry shod, he beholds the waters advancing into the bay, and bearing stately vessels towards the harbour of Ulverston, over the very path which he has so recently trodden. I can imagine how solemn the pealing of that little island's chapel's bell must have sounded upon the shores of the estuary, floating over those dangerous waters its daily warning of the uncertainty of human life perhaps the bodies of drowned men might have lain where we were lying or travellers rescued from the tide by those ancient ministers of religion might have listened with grateful hearts to the prayers and thanksgivings offered up in that venerable chantry the chastening interest of old pious usage clings to the little island still and it stands in the midst of the waters, preaching in mute eloquence to every thoughtful mind. There was something in the sacred associations of the place, there was something in the mouldering remnant of the little chapel, which helped to deepen the interest of our eventful visit that day. We could not sleep. The sun shone in a slant at the one tiny window of our bedroom, and the birds were singing merrily outside. As we lay there, thinking and talking about these things my friend said i feel thankful now that i did not bring willie with me if i'd done so nothing could have saved us the tide had come in behind and a minute more at the channel would have been too much after resting about three hours we got up and put on some of the cast-off clothes which had been worn by the old woman's sons whilst working in the land my trousers were a good deal too long and they were so stiff with dried sludge that they almost stood up of themselves when they were on i felt as if i was dressed in sheet iron i never saw two stranger figures than we cut that day as we entered the kitchen again each amusing himself with the other's comical appearance never ye mind said the old woman there's nobody to see you but myself you may think very well at you're alive to wear out at all but certainly you're looking too bonny bagels. I doubt very much whether your own folk would know you. It quite alters your features. I shouldn't take you to be a boon ninepence to shilling at far most. As for ye, said she, addressing myself, you're no occasion to talk, for you're as complete a flakro as ever I set een on. The kitchen was cleaned up, and the things emptied from our pockets lay about. Here books and papers were opened out to dry. There stockings hung upon a line, and our boots were reared against the fender with their soles turned to the fire. On the dresser two little piles of money stood, and on a round table were the sandwiches and hard-boiled eggs which my friend had brought in his pockets. "'What are you for with this?' said the old woman, pointing to the eatables. "'One or two at eggs are crushed a bit.' but tam's now worse as i can see let us taste what it's like said my friend that's right replied she and you'll have a cup of het tea to it i have it ready here the tea was very refreshing but we couldn't eat much for we had not quite recovered from the late excitement after a little meal we went out to walk upon the island our damp clothes were fluttering upon the green bushes about the cottage they were drying fast, for though the sun was hot, a cool breeze swept over the bay from the southwest. We wandered through the grove and about the garden, 
or rather the gale yard for the chief things grown in it were potatoes cabbages broccoli pot herbs and such like things useful at dinner time there were very few flowers in it and they were chiefly such as had to take care of themselves in the grove there were little bowery nooks and meandering footpaths mostly worn by visitors from the neighbouring shores the island has been much larger than it is now great quantities of limestone rock have been sold and carried away to the mainland and it seems as if this little interesting leaf of local history was fated to ultimate destruction in that way we walked all round it and then we settled down upon a grassy spot at the south-western edge overlooking the channel we had waded through there was something solemn in the thought that instead of gazing upon the beautiful bay we might have been lying at that moment in the bed of the channel there with the sunny waters rippling above us or drifting out with the retiring tide to an uncrowded grave in the western sea the thick woods of conishead looked beautiful on the opposite shore with the white turrets of the priory rising out of their embowering shades a little south of that the spire of bardsea church pointed heavenward from the summit of a green hill marking the spot where the village stood hidden from our view white sails were gliding to and fro upon the broad bay like great swans with sunlit wings it was a beautiful scene we sat looking at it till we began to feel chill and then we went back to the cottage about six o'clock the old fisherman returned home from ulverston and soon after two of his sons arrived from conishead park where they had been working at a deep drain they were tall hardy-looking men about middle age the old fisherman who knows the soundings of the sands all round seemed to think we had picked our way to the island as foolishly as it was possible to do he talked about the matter as if we had as good a knowledge of the sands as himself and had set out with the express intention of doing a dangerous exploit now said he pointing a good way north of the way we had crossed if you'd a come o'er by there you mud a done it easy but what the devil you took the varra worst nook at channel i wonder as you weren't drowned i've helped to get money in out o that hole baith deed and alive i ens pulled the captain out by the oar at head as had sailed all our to world nearly and with summat to do to bring him round and all he was that far gain now if you'd a getten upon yon bank continued he you would a managed to a stood until help had come to ye what ye wadn't a been very mitch aboon to middle but it's getten near low water i mun be off to the nets will you go down wi me there were two sets of stake nets belonging to the island one on the north end and the other on the western side in our own memorable channel the sons went to those on the north and the old man took a stick in his hand and a large basket on his arm and we followed him down the rocks to the other nets they are great cages of strong network supported by lofty poles or stakes from which they take their name they are so contrived that the fish can get into them at high water but cannot escape with the retiring tide there was rather more than a foot of water at the bottom of the nets but there was not a fish visible till the old man stepped in and then i saw that flukes lay thick about the bottom half hidden in the sand we waded in and helped to pick them up till the great basket was about half full he then closed the net and came away complaining that it was no but a poor catch when we got to the cottage we put on our own clothes which were quite dry and after we had picked out two dozen of the finest flukes which the old man strung upon a stout cord for ease of carriage we bade adieu to the fisherman and his family and we walked away over the sands nearly by the way we had come to the island the sun had gone down behind old burke rig but his westering splendour still empurpled the rugged tops of the cartmel hills the woods of conishead were darkening into shade and the low of cattle came mellowed by distance from the rich pastures of furness it was a lovely evening instead of going up the green lane which leads to the landward end of bardsea we turned southward along the shore 
and took a grass-grown shady path which winds round the sea-washed base of the hill upon which the church stands and so up into the village by a good road from the beach the midges were dancing their airy rounds the throstle song began to ring clearer in the stilling woods and the lone ousel in her leafy covert chanted little fits of complaining melody as if she had lost something there were other feathered lingerers here and there in those twilight woods not willing yet to go to rest through unwearied joyfulness of heart and still singing on like children late at play who have to be called in by their mothers as night comes on when we drew near my friend's house he said now we had better not mention this little affair to our people but as we sat at supper that night i could not help feeling thankful that we were eating fish instead of being eaten by them End of part 17「18. Of Travels in Lancashire. From Lancaster to Kendal. By Anne Ward Radcliffe. From a journey made in the summer of 1794 through Holland and the western frontier of Germany, with a return down the Rhine, to which are added observations during a tour to the lakes of Lancashire, Westmoreland and Cumberland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Lancaster to Kendal Leaving Lancaster, we wound along the southern brow of the Vale of the Loon, which there serpentizes among meadows, and is soon after shut up between steep shrubby banks. From the heights we had some fine retrospects of Lancaster and the distant sea, but about three miles from the town, the hills open forward to a view as much distinguished by the notice of Mr. Gray as by its own charms. We here look down over a woody and finely broken foreground upon the Loon and the Vale of Lonsdale, undulating in richly cultivated slopes, with Ingleborough for the background, bearing its bold promontory on high, the very crown and paragon of the landscape. To the west the Vale winds from sight among smoother hills and the gracefully falling line of a mountain on the left forms with the wooded heights on the right a kind of frame for the distant picture the road now turned into the sweetly retired vale of caton and by the village churchyard in which there is not a single gravestone to hornby a small straggling town delightfully seated near the entrance of the vale of lonsdale its thin toppling castle is seen among wood at a considerable distance with a dark hill rising over it what remains of the old edifice is a square grey building with a slender watch-tower rising in one corner like a feather in a hat which joins the modern mansion of white stone and gives it a singular appearance by seeming to start from the centre of its roof in front a steep lawn descends between avenues of old wood and the park extends along the skirts of the craggy hill that towers above at its foot is a good stone bridge over the wenning now shrunk in its pebbly bed and further on near the castle the church showing a handsome octagonal tower crowned with battlements the road then becomes extremely interesting and at melling a village on a brow some miles further the view opens up over the whole vale of lonsdale the eye now passes beneath the arching foliage of some trees in the foreground to the sweeping valley where meadows of the most vivid green and dark woods with white cottages and villages peeping from among them mingle with surprising richness and undulate from either bank of the loon to the feet of hills ingleborough rising from elegantly swelling ground overlooked this enchanting vale on the right clouds rolling along its broken top like smoke from a cauldron, and its hoary tint forming a boundary to the soft verdure and rich woodlands of the slopes at its feet. The perspective was terminated by the tall peeping heads of the Westmoreland fells, the nearer ones tinged with faintest purple, the more distant with light Asia, and this is the general boundary to a scene 
in the midst of which enclosed between nearer and lower hills lies the vale of lonsdale of a character mild delicate and reposing like the countenance of a madonna descending melling brow and winding among the perpetually changing scenery of the valley we approached ingleborough and it was interesting to observe the lines of its bolder features gradually strengthening and the shadowy markings of its minuter ones becoming more distinct as we advanced rock and grey crags looked out from the heath on every side but its form on each was very different towards lonsdale the mountain is bold and majestic rising in abrupt and broken precipices and often impending till at the summit it suddenly becomes flat and is level for nearly a mile whence it descends in a long gradual ridge to craven in yorkshire in summer some festivities are annually celebrated on this top and the country people as they drink the freshness of the mountain breeze look over the wild moorlands of yorkshire the rich vales of lancashire and the sublime mountains of westmoreland crossing a small bridge we turned from ingleborough and passed very near the ancient walls of thurlham castle little of which is now remaining the ruin is on a green broken knoll one side of which is darkened with brushwood and dwarf oak cattle were reposing in the shade on the bank of a rivulet that rippled through what was formerly the cattle ditch a few old trees waved over what was once a tower now covered with ivy some miles further we crossed the lek a shrunk and desolate stream nearly choked with pebbles winding in a deep rocky glen where trees and shrubs marked the winter boundary of the waters our road mounting a green eminence of the opposite bank on which stands overborough the handsome modern mansion of mr fenwick wound between plantations and meadows painted with yellow and purple flowers like those of spring as we passed through their gentle slopes we had now and then sweet views between the foliage on the left into the vale of lonsdale and now contracting in its course and winding into ruder scenery among these catches the best picture was perhaps where the white town of kirby lonsdale shelves along the opposite bank having rough healthy hills immediately above it and below a venerable gothic bridge over the loon rising in tall arches like an ancient aqueduct its grey tint agreeing well with the silvery lightness of the water and the green shades that flourished from the steep margin over the abutments the view from this bridge too was beautiful the river foaming below among masses of dark rock variegated with light tints of grey as if touched by the painter's pencil withdrew towards the south in a straight channel with the woods of overborough on the left the vale dilating opened a long perspective to ingleborough and many blue mountains more distant with all the little villages we had passed glittering on the intervening eminences the colouring of some low hills on the right was particularly beautiful long shades of wood being overtopped with brown heath while below meadows of soft verdure fell gently towards the river bank kirby lonsdale a neat little town commanding the whole vale is on the western steep we stayed two hours at it gratified by witnessing at the first inn we reached the abundance of the country and the good will of the people in times when prices of necessary articles are increasing with the taste for all unnecessary display instances of cheapness may be to persons of small incomes something more than mere physical treasures they have a moral value in contributing to independence of mind here we had an early and as it afterwards appeared a very exaggerated specimen of the dialect of the country a woman talked for five minutes against our window of whose conversation we could understand scarcely a word soon after a boy replied to a question i done again and gang was presently the common word for go symptoms of nearness to a country which we did not approach without delighting to enumerate the instances of genius and worth that adorn it leaving kirby lonsdale by the kendall road we mounted a steep hill and looking back from its summit upon the whole vale of lonsdale 
perceived ourselves to be in the midway between beauty and desolation so enchanting was the retrospect and so wild and dreary the prospect from the neighbourhood of caton to kirby the ride was superior for elegant beauty to any we had passed this from kirby to kendall is of a character distinctly opposite after losing sight of the vale the road lies for nearly the whole distance over moors and perpetually succeeding hills thinly covered with dark purple heath flowers of which the most distant seem black the dreariness of the scene was increased by a heavy rain and by the slowness of our progress jostling amongst coal carts for ten miles of rugged ground the views over the westmoreland mountains were however not entirely obscured their vast ridges were visible in the horizon to the north and west line over line frequently in five or six ranges sometimes the intersecting mountains opened to others beyond that fell in deep and abrupt precipices their profiles drawing towards a point below and seeming to sink in a bottomless abyss on our way over these wilds parts of which are called endmore and cowbrows we overtook only long trains of coal carts and after ten miles of bleak mountain road began to desire a temporary home somewhat sooner than we perceived kendall white smoking in the dark vale as we approached the outlines of its ruinous castle were just distinguishable through the gloom scattered in masses over the top of a small round hill on the right at the entrance of the town the river kent dashed in foam down a weir beyond it on a green slope the gothic tower of the church was half hid by a cluster of dark trees grey fells glimmered in the distance we were lodged at another excellent inn and the next morning walked over the town which has an air of trade mingled with that of antiquity its history has been given in other places and we are not able to discuss the doubt whether it was the roman broken on accio or not the manufacture of cloth which our statute books testify to have existed as early as the reign in which falstaff is made to allude to it appears to be still in vigour for the town is surrounded towards the river with dying grounds we saw however no shades of kendall green or indeed any but bright scarlet the church is remarkable for three chapels memorials of the ancient dignity of three neighbouring families the bellinghams stricklands and pars these are enclosures on each side of the altar differing from pews chiefly in being large enough to contain tombs mr gray noticed them minutely in the year seventeen sixty nine they were then probably entire but the wainscot or railing which divided the chapel of the pars from the aisle is now gone of two stone tombs in it one is enclosed with modern railing and there are many remnants of painted arms on the adjoining windows the chapel of the stricklands which is between this and the altar is separated from the church aisle by a solid wainscot to the height of four feet and after that by a wooden railing with broken filigree ornaments that of the bellinghams contains an ancient tomb of which the brass plates that bore inscriptions and arms are now gone but some traces of the latter remain in plastered stone at the side over it are the fragments of an helmet and in the roof those of armorial bearings carved in wood on a pillar near this is an inscription almost obliterated in which the following words may yet be traced dame thomasim thornborough wife of sir william thornborough knight daughter of sir robert bellingham gentle knight the eleventh of august one thousand five hundred eighty two the saxon has been so strongly engrafted on our language that in reading old inscriptions especially those which are likely to have been spelt according to the pronunciation one is frequently reminded by ancient english words of the modern german synonyms a german of the present day would say for eleven elf pronounced long like elf and for five fumf pronounced like fumf over the chief seat in the old pew of the bellinghams is a brass plate engraved with the figure of a man in armour and on each side of it a brass escutcheon 
of which that on the right has a motto thus spelled a i n s dot y l apostrophe e l s t under the figure is the following inscription also cut in brass here lieth the body of alan bellingham esq who married catherine daughter of anthony ducket esq by whom he had no children after whose decease he married dorothy daughter of thomas samford esq of whom he had sons and eight daughters of which five sons and seven daughters with the said dorothy are yet living he was three score and one years of age and died the seventh of may anno domini 1577 the correctness of inserting the unpronounced consonants in the words eight and daughters notwithstanding the varieties of the other orthography in this inscription is a proof of the universality of the saxon mode of spelling with great abundance and even waste of letters a mode which is so incorporated with our language that those who are for dispensing with it in some instances as in the final k in public and other words should consider what a general change they have to effect or what partial incongruities they must submit to kendal is built on the lower steeps of a hill that towers over the principal street and bears on one of its brows a testimony to the independence of the inhabitants an obelisk dedicated to liberty and to the memory of the revolution in sixteen eighty eight at a time when the memory of that revolution is reviled and the praises of liberty itself endeavoured to be suppressed by the artifice of imputing to it the crimes of anarchy it was impossible to omit any act of veneration to the blessings of this event being thus led to ascend the hill we had a view of the country over which it presides a scene simple great and free as the spirit revered amidst it End of part eighteen. Part nineteen of Travels in Lancashire. The Duddon from Rambles by Rivers by James Thorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org there are few objects in nature more beautiful or more refreshing to eye and ear than a mountain stream to a healthy mind it almost seems to impart something of its own lively flow and bold buoyant energy itself a happy emblem of the purity and vigour of poetic genius it has ever been an especial favourite with all poets our own noble band from spencer to wordsworth have celebrated it in snatches of description or brief allusions or fuller and more prolonged notes murmuring near the running brooks a music sweeter than their own southey in speaking of one of them says i could sit for hours to watch the motions of a brook and he must be dull indeed who could wander without emotion along one that has been sung of by a great poet or not have the feeling its natural beauty may arouse deepened by association with the genius it has inspired in the autumn of eighteen forty two we spent some time near the duddon the stream which forms the subject of wordsworth's fine poem of that title and it has occurred to us that we may be able to impart a little information to the admirer of his poetry perhaps even to lead some of our readers who may be about to travel in the lake district to vary the usual route by devoting two or three days to exploring a stream so beautifully described by our great philosophic poet the duddon rises on rhinos fell and divides the counties of cumberland and lancashire for about twenty-five miles from its source till it enters the irish sea near the isle of walney it is navigable only near its termination and then but at high tide and by small craft indeed throughout its course it is scarcely at all serviceable to man hardly a mill being worked by it nor does it like many other of the mountain streams anywhere expand into a lake or even a tarn yet even in this region of rivers it is perhaps unequalled it runs through a remarkably wild and picturesque country and presents aspects singularly varied considering the shortness of its course 
wordsworth in his scenery of the lakes says it may be compared such and so varied are its beauties with any river of equal length in any country however that may be it is surpassed by none in the northern counties green indeed and he is no mean judge places the Croglin and eden first while southey puts in a word for his keswick greta and every one remembers scott's description of its yorkshire namesake it is however to none of these we are disposed to think duddon must yield but we are not so certain as to the wharf be that as it may our stream is very beautiful and it is surprising that so few visit it hardly one visitor of the thousands who annually resort to the lakes does more than cross it the country on either side of it is thinly peopled and the guides at keswick and ambleside will talk loudly of the badness of the accommodation the rudeness of the inhabitants and the roughness of the way it can indeed only be explored on foot and it must be confessed that there is neither an hotel nor a gentleman's house throughout but though the way be somewhat rough and the people unpolished the traveller who is willing to be pleased will find accommodation civility and plenty and in these days it should be anything but an objection to a genuine lover of rural sights and sounds that the place and the people are so little changed by the march of modern refinements we are quite sure if any of our readers will try the course we point out they will thank us for suggesting it we purpose to follow our stream from its source to its termination in the sea taking wordsworth's poem as our guide the source of the duddon is on the top or nearly the top of rhinos fell the best way of approach to it is from langdale you ascend rhinos at fellfoot by the old whitehaven road which is carried over nearly the highest part of rhinos when only pack horses were used for the conveyance of goods in these parts this was the main road from kendal to whitehaven a fact the stranger who sees it finds some difficulty in crediting so rough and acclivitous is it when the top of rhinos is gained a small circle of stones three of them somewhat larger than the others will be seen on the right of the road these are the three shire stones marking the junction of the counties of westmoreland cumberland and lancashire they are one of the local wonders and will be readily pointed out to the visitor passing these the traveller must almost directly turn out of the road leaving it on his left and he will soon come upon the source of the duddon the water oozes up through a bed of moss and unless care be taken the real source may be overlooked and a wrong spot selected there being several other moss beds a little lower down the fell wordsworth says of it sonnet three how shall i paint thee nature hath lent to thy beginning nought that doth present peculiar ground for hope to build upon it is however no ordinary spot on such a morning as that on which we visited it cold grey and misty the huge masses of crag which protrude from the ground bare of everything but the grey lichen and a few straggling tufts of grass on their highest points the dull russet clothing of the thin soil the many mingled and brilliant colours of the west mosses the perfect quiet of the air broken only for a moment by the motion of a sheep or two that have straggled here hardly it should seem for pasture produced together so deep an impression of desolate solitude as not to be soon forgotten from this spot a slender thread of water finds its way down a narrow channel it is however soon joined by one and another little streamlet and begins very quickly to toss along its stony bed in that seemingly joyous mood so characteristic of mountain streams long before it reaches the bottom of the fell it has acquired a tolerable volume of water and formed two or three pretty little water breaks its course down the fell is very tortuous but if you have some time to spare by all means follow its loosely scattered curves nor forget sometimes to look back wordsworth has devoted a sonnet to these retrospective glances and it is pleasing to observe how a simple and hitherto unnoticed object will start into beauty at the touch of a true poet as in nature we often see when a sudden gleam of sunshine illumines some obscure feature of the landscape 
when it reaches the fell foot the broad rocky channel tells that though ordinarily but a trifling stream it must sometimes present a grand appearance the mountains here form a sort of coombe and in stormy wintry weather or on the melting of the snow upon them large quantities of water pour down on every side bringing with them great masses of stone which as they are driven against the projecting crags on the mountain sides or against each other as they roll along the bed of the stream make we are told a strange turmoil and may often be heard at a considerable distance here our stream is joined by a small one that rises by scar fell and now it takes the name of cockley beck beck is the name for a mountain stream throughout the north of england the traveller will here pause to admire the magnificent array of mountains on either hand especially on the west where they appear in their full majesty the rugged outline of the pikes of scar fell forming a background of a grander kind than any other perhaps in the whole district so grand is their appearance in this place that the lover of nature will be tempted to leave our stream for a while and wander up the dale towards them and he will do well at almost every step some new feature of greatness will present itself and as the vale winds they will be seen in many various and striking combinations they who would ascend scarfell may do so without much difficulty from this vale but we must return to our stream where it takes the name of cockley beck it is crossed by a bridge called by the dalesman cockelty brig as the stream is called cockelty beck which leads to a small farmhouse the cottage rude and grey of which wordsworth speaks in his fifth sonnet but the ruddy children will be looked for in vain three and twenty years have not passed away without doing their work with them as the way has been rather long and toilsome the tourist will do well to enter the cottage he may be sure of a welcome and some plain refreshment and may gain what is always worth acquiring a little insight into the manners of the people through whose neighbourhood he is journeying it is indeed worth a stranger's while to take some such opportunity to observe the natives of donnerdale as the district through which the duddon flows is called our dalesmen are reserved and must be watched to have their real character caught but the observer will not go unrewarded they are a fine intelligent race of men and worth observing hardly so intelligent perhaps as the genuine mountaineer and not near so hearty their reserve is sometimes too near akin to sullenness and they have not the same sly quiet humour the mountain shepherd too is not only keener but more thoughtful indeed if you can lead him to throw off somewhat of his reserve you will find often a depth and extent of thought little anticipated often too a genuine appreciation of the grand and beautiful in nature with something of a poetic feeling mingled it must be confessed with not a little superstition but that some say is a chief element in the poetic character the dalesman has not so much elevation of character and it will require but little observation to see that a rigid economy verging on parsimony is practised by him but it is chiefly in the matter of money a rare article and carefully husbanded he abounds in social virtues and we were told many little circumstances that showed his genuine sympathy with the trouble and his disregard of self in his attempts to relieve it he is neighbourly to a degree only understood in a thinly peopled district his hospitality simple but hearty we often tested and always found ready and though in other matters even more parsimonious than the men in this the women are by far the most liberal to be a stranger is always claim enough and readily acknowledged they seldom go far from their homes and seem to have a feeling almost of pity for those who are distant from theirs here at cockley brig farmhouse for instance we were served with milk and oaten cake and while partaking of it we tried to gossip a little with the old dame but she was as the dalesmen say very short till her own curiosity began to be excited as to our home and even then it was amusing to see how cautiously she tried to worm out the desired information you know much use to these crags 
she began but determined to be for a while as brief as she had been we replied not much why do you gang for wide of this said we you come for a cockermouth perhaps no we are from the south for liverpool no from london nay said she in a tone of mingled surprise and sympathy but so art a lang way for aim then setting before us all the good things the house could afford she pressed us again and again to eat repeating every moment dinner to stint to sell and we had some difficulty in convincing her that as we had fixed our quarters at seathwaite we were in no great danger of starvation the phraseology of the dalesmen is very singular they apply words almost as strangely as americans are said to do we heard two shepherds as they were sitting by the public-house fire at seathwaite talk about some sheep they had seen at market that day twas a terrible girt sheep that said one ay replied his companion twas a may serious grand sheep indeed and this is by no means an extreme specimen the old whitehaven road crosses the river at cockley brig and here leaves it passing over the side of the mountain called hardknot into eskdale somewhat more than half way down the hill a little on the right of the road are the remains of a roman fortress hardknot castle as it is called which is well worth a visit there is a fine and very extensive view from it scarfell in particular is seen to great advantage from cockley brig the scenery for a mile or so is rather tame along the beck but if there is little in the vicinity there is much in the stream itself to delight us now it has assumed something of the port and strength of a river the water too which like cotton's favourite dove was black at its source because it springs from the mosses has like it become so clarified by the addition of several clear springs bigger than itself which gush out of the limestone rocks that in a few miles you will find it one of the purest crystalline springs you have seen wordsworth notices this the water he says is perfectly pellucid through which in many places is seen to a great depth its bed of rock or pure gravel which gives to the water itself an exquisitely cerulean colour this is very observable hereabouts and here too are these stepping stones every reader of wordsworth will remember them and most will have a vision of his own about them he need not fear that the reality will fall short of his conception we have seen many but none so graceful they might seem a zone chosen for ornament stone matched with stone in studied symmetry with interspace for clear waters to pursue their race without restraint sonnet nine and they are as harmonious in colour as symmetrical in form of a delicate white with the slightest admixture of blue they present as they are reflected in the crystal stream an image the eye dwells on with a continuous pleasure they are a something to remember hitherto our stream has wound quietly among the masses of crag that have at various times been brought down by it from its parent fells but soon after we have passed the stepping stones it boldly forces its way through the solid rock which it has wrought into many strange fantastic forms objects immense portrayed in miniature wild shapes for many a strange comparison niagaras alpine passes and anon abodes of naiads calm abysses pure bright liquid mansions sonnet twelve the traveller should not leave the bed of the river here while he can make his way along it every step brings out some new or quaint device of our fairy-like guide not far from the place above referred to is a chasm where the sublime and the fanciful seem striving for the mastery a strange spot as ever was pitched upon well might wordsworth call it the fairy chasm its steep rocky sides are of a bright blue-grey tint deepening under the water almost into asia and riven into such strange shapes as that tricksy spirit ariel might have delighted to fashion the scenery too about this spot is very fine on one hand a hard knot and its associate mountains on the other 
various crags backed by the majestic mass of coniston old man directly in front are wheelbarrow crag and the pen with several mountains of moderate elevation and graceful form in the distance here we must leave our stream a while we have now reached seathwaite where for the present we stay wordsworth indeed makes his poem a summer day's journey but he admits this to be a poetic license it is quite impossible to explore the scenery of the duddon in that time the hasty visitor may indeed see it all at least as well as he usually sees anything in two days but the man who has learned to look on nature with a truer feeling will not if he have leisure think as many weeks too much to devote to this lovely region seathwaite is a good resting place it is in the midst of the finest portion of the scenery and has connected with it some interesting associations upon which we shall now touch it contains too a little inn in which the accommodation is rude but the parties who keep it are civil and desirous to oblige and the genuine traveller will be content with these he need not however fare amiss fell mutton and ham and mutton ham he may always obtain and trout too if he will as mrs glass directs catch them first for duddon is what honest isaac calls a trouty stream with these and the usual addenda procurable in a north country farm a moderate man may have as cowley says not so many choice dishes at every meal but at several meals all of them which makes them both the more healthy and the more pleasant seathwaite is remarkable as the place in which wonderful robert walker dwelt so many years wordsworth has given a very full and interesting account of him in his notes to the duddon to which or to the second volume of the pursuit of knowledge under difficulties the reader may refer it may here suffice to say that he was born in seventeen hundred and nine at undercrag in seathwaite and was the youngest of twelve children being sickly in youth he was bred up a scholar and after acting for some time as a schoolmaster he was ordained and about seventeen thirty five became curate of seathwaite in which he remained till his death sixty six years afterwards the value of his curacy when he entered upon it was five pound per annum with a cottage about the same time he married and his wife brought him as he says to the value of forty pound for her fortune he had a family of twelve children of whom however only eight lived these he educated respectably one at least became a clergyman was even munificent in his hospitality as a parish priest and generous to the needy and yet although the income of his curacy never exceeded fifty pound per annum at his decease he left behind him no less a sum than two thousand pound and such a sense of his various excellences was prevalent in the country that the epithet of wonderful is to this day attached to his name as wordsworth says there is in this something so extraordinary as to require further explanatory details but for these we refer to the works before named merely remarking that he spun the wool needed for the family clothing himself which was made up into the various garments by the female portion of the family while he spun he taught the children of his parishioners then he assisted his neighbours in haymaking sheep shearing etc besides serving as a scrivener and in various ways rendering them assistance had an acre or two of land which he tilled himself and also possessed and attended to a few sheep and a couple of cows many of these employments and others in which his biographer relates him to have been engaged are sufficiently unclerical but we were told by some of the older inhabitants of one still more so and which wordsworth either did not hear of or thought too unpoetical to repeat at that time there was no public house in the place and walker was accustomed they said to supply any who required such refreshment with ale of his own brewing charging for it a certain price and twopence per quart extra if drunk in his house the usual place for drinking it being the adjacent field the circumstance would hardly be worth recording did it not serve to illustrate the singular simplicity of manners that prevailed such a thing can hardly be conceived of elsewhere at that period 
as a clergyman making his house in some sort a tavern southey indeed tells that up to the middle of the reign of george the second such cures were held in these northern counties by unordained persons who commonly added to their scanty income by the pursuit of some manual occupation the person for instance who held the curacy in the vale of newlands near keswick at that period exercised the various trades of tailor clogger and butter print maker we ought not to omit either that amid all his various laborious occupations walker is said to have preserved his affections unimpaired to have carefully and successfully cultivated his intellect and to have been tenderly alive to the duties of his pastoral office truly as wordsworth remarks in this extraordinary man things in their nature adverse were reconciled very many of the simple homely customs ascribed to walker are yet far from obsolete in the neighbourhood in the farmhouses the master of the house may still be seen at the head of a long table with his farm servants sitting down to their meals as part of the family rush candles are yet employed in common white or tallow candles being reserved as with walker for important occasions and we imagine tea is even now very little used except by the more wealthy farmers at whose houses indeed we have seen it neither walker nor his wife ever partook of it though they kept it in the house for visitors or such of their own family as had been accustomed to this refreshment elsewhere porridge was their substitute and it is still employed at the meals answering to breakfast and tea at the public house at seathwaite the landlord of which is also a farmer this is the case and we were somewhat amused after we had finished our tea to see the teapot very quietly taken to the landlord and tea made for him alone from the tea leaves which had just served us when the master of the house happened at such times to be from home his mother he had no wife an old but vigorous dame appropriated the luxury to her own use there are few places in our country perhaps that have changed so little as has seathwaite since walker's time there have been no new buildings nor has anything altered the external look of the place unless it be the addition of the public house and that is an old farmhouse walker's own house has been enlarged since his death but only so much as to render it somewhat more convenient to his successor nor have the inhabitants greatly changed they are still the same frugal industrious quiet church-going race there is indeed a slight change in the last item walker congratulates himself that there is not one dissenter of any denomination in the parish and now there are several methodists and two or three baptists who have occasional meetings at private houses for there is still no dissenting meeting-house in seathwaite but the chief part of the inhabitants are still steady churchmen the chapel in which walker so long officiated is a simple structure a low oblong building with a plain porch and one bell hung visibly in a most primitive looking belfry with the bell rope hanging down on the outside it differs little in its appearance from many other chapels scattered through the more retired parts of the locality it is not however so small as many of them that at wasdale head for instance which has seven pews one being for each of the six families in the chapelry and the remaining one for strangers seathwaite churchyard contains a fine old yew and near it a sundial by which is walker's gravestone a plain blue slab shown in the engraving upon it is the following inscription in memory of the rev robert walker who died the twenty fifth day of june eighteen hundred and two in the ninety third year of his age and sixty seventh of his curacy at seathwaite also of anne his wife who died the twenty eighth of january eighteen hundred and two in the ninety-third year of her age the only noticeable thing in the interior of the chapel is walker's pew which is still lined with cloth woven by his own hand it is the only pew in the chapel so distinguished there is about seathwaite chapel an air of antique rudeness that at once carries the mind back to a bygone age it speaks as strongly of other times as the noblest minster but how differently few sights would be more interesting to one not thoroughly sophisticated than the old kirkyard on a sabbath morning 
then the old kirk the noble yew older still than the kirk with the sundial by it the few gravestones scattered about and the everlasting hills which form so noble a background to the whole all seemed to wear an air of deeper repose and more silent grandeur than ever but presently the bell tolls and its first sounds have hardly passed away when one and another of the dalesmen come quietly in giving and receiving a simple greeting and then separating into little groups or loitering singly about the graves apparently recalling many of them at least the memory of those who sleep below while others collect under the shade of the old yew the fairer portion of the congregation meantime resting on the benches within the porch but none at least in fine weather enter the chapel soon however as the bell's last stroke has sounded the clergyman a happy-looking old man apparently no unworthy successor of walker may be seen making his way towards the kirk exchanging with all a smile a word or a bow of genuine old-fashioned courtesy and the stranger will be sure to receive one more marked than the others and after a little longer talk with his fair parishioners in the porch he enters the chapel followed by his charge we saw them thus gathering one calm sunny sabbath morn from the dales and the fells and it recurs to our memory as the most beautiful sight of the kind we ever beheld upon the seathwaite brook says wordsworth at a small distance from the parsonage has been erected a mill for spinning yarn it is a mean and disagreeable object though not important to the spectator as calling to mind the momentous changes wrought by such inventions in the frame of society we went to look at the mill and found it with its roof partly fallen in its wheel broken and on trying the door its hinges rusted from long disuse gave way the machinery too though in appearance undisturbed since it was last used was decayed the web crumbling at the slightest touch our poet were he to visit it now might find new matter for reflection on the changes wrought by the progress of invention which has rendered this as obsolete as it made unaided hand labour before leaving seathwaite the tourist should not fail to visit the station wordsworth has pointed out in his notes for the sake of the view he so beautifully describes the reader who may not have his work at hand will thank us for quoting the whole passage hardly equalled we think by any descriptive piece in modern prose he is speaking of the way of approach to the duddon after all the traveller would be most gratified who should approach this beautiful stream neither at its source as is done in the sonnets nor from its termination but from coniston over walna scar first descending into a little circular valley a collateral compartment of the long winding vale through which flows the duddon this recess towards the close of september when the aftergrass of the meadows is still of a fresh green with the leaves of many of the trees faded but perhaps none fallen is truly enchanting at a point elevated enough to show the various objects in the valley and not so high as to diminish their importance the stranger will instinctively halt on the foreground a little below the most favourable station a rude footbridge is thrown over the bed of the noisy brook foaming by the wayside russet and craggy hills of bold and varied outline surround the level valley which is besprinkled with grey rocks plumed with birch trees a few homesteads are interspersed in some places peeping out from among the rocks like hermitages whose site has been chosen for the benefit of sunshine as well as shelter in other instances the dwelling-house barn and byre compose together a cruciform structure which with its embowering trees and the ivy clothing part of its walls and roof like a fleece call to mind the remains of an ancient abbey time in most cases and nature everywhere have given a sanctity to the humble works of man that are scattered over this peaceful retirement hence a harmony of tone and colour a consummation and perfection of beauty which would have been marred had aim or purpose interfered with the course of convenience utility or necessity this unviciated region stands in no need of the veil of twilight to soften or disguise its features as it glistens in the morning sunshine 
it would fill the spectator's heart with gladsomeness looking from our chosen station he would feel an impatience to rove among its pathways to be greeted by the milkmaid to wander from house to house exchanging good morrows as he passed the open doors but at evening when the sun is set and a pearly light gleams from the western quarter of the sky with an answering light from the smooth surface of the meadows when the trees are dusky but each kind still distinguishable when the cool air has condensed the blue smoke rising from the chimneys when the dark mossy stones seem to sleep in the bed of the foaming brook then he would be unwilling to move forward not less from a reluctance to relinquish what he beholds than from an apprehension of disturbing by his approach the quietness beneath him this station will be found without difficulty by those who have descended from the source of the duddon you cross the vale from seathwaite by seathwaite brook having undercrag on your left and ascending walner scar the proper position will readily be found by the preceding description which is as accurate as it is beautiful in returning we may follow the streamlet here spoken of which dashes in a sparkling current past the churchyard of seathwaite till it joins the river in the midst of the wild and beautiful scenery which gave occasion to the sonnets from the fourteenth to the twentieth inclusive this is unquestionably the grandest part of the scenery of the duddon the river here makes its way between steep and lofty crags of bold and imposing aspect and as the course of the stream is very tortuous strange and striking combinations of forms with wild and varied effects of light and shade occur at every step the rock is a friable kind and shattered in every direction large masses have fallen from the heights on either hand and others impend in a threatening manner the chaotic aspect of the scene is well marked out by the expression of a stranger who strolled out while dinner was preparing and on his return being asked what way he had been wandering replied as far as it is finished wordsworth the best way to explore the scenery here if the traveller does not mind a little rough climbing is to get into the bed of the river by the brook and proceed along it under wallabarra crag and as far as he can towards the source he must make his way over huge fragments of rock that in some places appear to entirely block up the bed of the river the water forcing itself under and between them in such a manner as to be unseen at a little distance and in others are so disposed as to produce the singular variety of sparkling water breaks that occur here in little more than half a mile it is rather a rough way and the visitor may perchance get wet feet but if he confine himself to what he can see from the crags above he will miss his only chance of seeing some scenery seldom to be matched for a grandeur nearly allied to sublimity a great beauty in these mountain streams is that a few yards will present you with an almost entire change of landscape here it is remarkably the case one moment bare rude rock towers up against the deep blue sky the water dashes along in a shallow brawling stream while the broken outline of a mountain pile bounds the distance the next we are shut in by light and graceful trees the varying hues of the birch ash and hazel blending in exquisite harmony and imaging themselves in a still pool over whose surface a crowd of merry insects ceaselessly gamble their gentle hum but adding to the deep feeling of quietude here in this little space of some half a mile perhaps might the painter find almost a month's employment in making studies of rock and foliage mingling their various tints with the underwood and ever-changing water but we have lingered too long retracing our steps we again proceed towards our journey's end though our river after we have passed the seathwaite brook flows along a more level country and is unmarked by any of the grander or more striking features on which we have hitherto dwelt the way is very beautiful through delicious meads the murmuring stream its winding water leads light foliage with flowers of every hue grace its banks the rugged features of the crags have become softened by distance the fields are alive with cattle and grey cottages chequer every spot of rising ground 
we have exchanged our Salvatore-like scenery for such as our own Hoffland most delighted in. The next place of any consequence after leaving Seathwaite is Ulfa, pronounced Ufa by the Dalesman. Before reaching it we come upon a singular assemblage of rocks that might have suggested the idea of Wordsworth's twelfth sonnet, though we believe it is intended to describe those by Seathwaite of which we have already spoken. These are very singular. They project but little above the surface of the water, but are riven into the most fanciful forms, over and through and between which the river makes its way in a number of sparkling water breaks of varied sizes and height. We point the visitor's attention to this spot, not only for its singularity, but that he may also notice the rock itself. A fine porphyritic dyke here crosses the channel of the river, contrasting finely with the light limestone with which it is in conjunction. It is, of course, owing to the greater hardness of this dyke that it projects so much above the level of the neighbouring rock, and that the irregular appearance here spoken of is produced. Footnote. We may mention that, though we have not referred to the geological features of our route, there is much in it to interest the geologist, nor need the botanist fear that he will lack employment. The whole course of the river from Seathwaite to Ulfa is exceedingly picturesque. The views are more open and extended than heretofore, and the distant mountains are of pleasing, often graceful forms, both alone and in combination. Broughton Tower, too, as seen in many places, is a pleasing addition to the landscape. As we approach Ulfa, its chapel forms an interesting landmark. Wordsworth says, the kirk of Ulfa to the pilgrim's eye, is welcome as a star that doth present its sinning forehead through the peaceful rent of a black cloud diffused through half the sky. Sonnet 31 It is situated on a high bank and commands a fine view. We might well wander a while in the churchyard, soothed by the unseen river's gentle roar from pastoral graves extracting thoughts divine. Walker was offered the curacy of Ulfa, but declined, but declined holding it along with his own, lest it should be attributed to covetousness in him, his own living at that time, 1755, being worth fifteen pound per annum. At Ulfa there is a public house, known as Ulfa Kirk House, in which the traveller will meet with better accommodation than at Seathwaite, but the scenery is not so fine, nor does it divide the distance so well. From Ulfa the river widens, but becomes tamer and less romantic. It will, indeed, hardly repay the trouble of following its windings, especially as the ground on each side is enclosed. It must, however, be joined again by Broughton or sooner, for now expands majestic Duddon over smooth, flat sands, gliding in silence with unfettered sweep. Beneath an ampler sky, a region wide is opened round him, Hamlets, towers and towns, and blue-topped hills behold him from afar. Sonnet 32 Our great guide here likens him to Sovereign Thames, spreading his bosom under Kentish Downs. But it must be confessed, it requires all fancy's help to sustain the resemblance. Still, it is a noble sight when the full tide has laid the whole stretch of sand a mile and a half across, under water, to gaze from some elevated spot over it as it mingles its waters with the mighty ocean, the setting sun meantime blending all into a glow of golden splendour, while thousands of waterfowl, darting in every direction with the swiftness almost of the lightning, and baffling the keenest eye to follow their rapid evolutions, impart an air of liveliness to a scene that might else, perhaps, be too sombre from its uniformity. End of part 19。Part 20 of Travels in Lancashire Written with a slate pencil on a stone on the side of the mountain of Black Coombe, and view from the top of Black Coombe, by William Wordsworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Written with a slate pencil on a stone on the side of the mountain of Black Coombe. The circumstance alluded to at the conclusion of these verses was told me by Dr. Satterthwaite, who was incumbent of Bootle, a small town at the foot of Black Coombe. He had the particulars from one of the engineers who was employed in making trigonometrical surveys of that region. Stay, bold adventurer, rest awhile thy limbs on this commodious seat, for much remains of hard ascent before thou reach the top of this huge eminence. From blackness named, and to far travelled storms of sea and land, a favourite spot of tournament and war, but thee may no such boisterous visitants molest. May gentle breezes fan thy brow, and neither cloud conceal, nor misty air be dim, the grand terraqueous spectacle, from centre to circumference, unveiled. No, if thou grudge not to prolong thy rest, that on the summit whither thou art bound, a geographic labourer pitched his tent, with books supplied and instruments of art, to measure height and distance, lonely task, week after week pursued, to him was given full many a glimpse, but sparingly bestowed on timid man, of nature's processes upon the exalted hills. He made report that once, while there he plied his studious work within that canvas dwelling, colours, lines, and the whole surface of the outspread map became invisible, for all around had darkness fallen, unthreatened, unproclaimed, as if the golden day itself had been extinguished in a moment. Total gloom, in which he sate alone, with unclosed eyes, upon the blinded mountain's silent top. View from the Top of Black Coombe Mrs. Wordsworth and I, as mentioned in the epistle to Sir G. Beaumont, lived some time under its shadow. This height a ministering angel might select, for from the summit of Black Coombe, dread name, derived from clouds and storms, the amplest range of unobstructed prospect may be seen that British ground commands. Low dusky tracts, where Trent is nursed far southward, Cambrian hills to the southwest, a multitudinous show, and in a line of eyesight linked with these, the hoary peaks of Scotland that give birth to Tiviot's stream, to Annan, Tweed, and Clyde, crowding the quarter whence the sun comes forth, gigantic mountains rough with crags, beneath, right at the imperial station's western base, main ocean breaking audibly, and stretched far into silent regions blue and pale, and visibly engirding Mona's Isle, that as we left the plain, before our sight stood like a lofty mount, uplifting slowly, above the convex of the watery globe, into clear view the cultured fields that streak her habitable shores, but now appears a dwindled object, and submits to lie at the spectator's feet. Yon Asia ridge, is it a perishable cloud, or there do we behold the line of Erin's coast, land sometimes by the roving shepherd swain, like the bright confines of another world, not doubtfully perceived. Look homeward now, in depth, in height, in circuit, how serene the spectacle, how pure, of nature's works, in earth and air, and earth-embracing sea, a revelation infinite, it seems, display august of man's inheritance, of Britain's calm felicity and power. End of part 20 End of Travels in Lancashire